Chapter 151 Finally. This black dragon was simply too huge, far beyond the size of average dragons. Furthermore, his strength also exceeded Roy's understanding of dragons. Roy was actually a little stunned. He remembered that this black dragon, known as the Destroyer, seemed to be transformed from a Baton, a leader of the angels, but Roy did not know what actually happened in the middle. While Roy was thinking about if this was the Destroyer's first appearance, he suddenly heard Gasrick's excited voice. Those angels were killed. That black dragon seems to be on our side. What Gasrick said was the group of angels that Roy had encountered earlier, the ones who had gone out to sea to search for traces of human ships. After hearing this, Roy looked in the direction the angels had gone. As expected, he could no longer see the angels in that direction, only some bloodstained feathers floating on the sea along with the waves. The pure white color was very conspicuous in the blue sea water. The other high ranked demons also noticed this and became excited. As expected. Seems like that black dragon belongs to our side. No wonder he has the aura of a demon. This is a fallen black dragon. With an additional demon king level combat force, those white winged pigeons are dead meat. Let's follow and take a look. The high rank demons forgot about the scene when the destroyer appeared, and they hid in the sea in a sorry state. Their worship of strength immediately gave them a good impression of the destroyer. One by one, they broke out of the sea and chased after the destroyer. Only Roy did not move. After seeing him, Gasrick called out to him and asked, Aren't you going to take a look? No. Roy shook his head. I advise you not to go as well. Why? Gasrick asked in doubt. It's still unclear whether the black dragon is friend or foe. Roy said. It's better to be cautious. Gasrick hesitated but still said, Then, I'll leave first. Seeing that he did not listen to his advice, Roy stopped talking and watched the high rank demons leave one after another. Roy was not at all surprised by the reaction of these high rank demons. It could not be helped. Existences at the Demon King level were too rare. Even in the Abyss, there were not many of them, and with the demons' worship of strength, it was very easy for them to have fanatical impulses. Although Demon King Samael led the end war in this world, Roy knew that Samael had not truly participated in the war through his observations during this period. He was only remotely controlling from behind the scenes or simply letting the demons do whatever they wanted. Let alone him, even the few demon lords had rarely taken action. These high-level combat forces generally dealt with the high-level combat forces of the angels. It was like a game of chess, if the enemy did not move, then I would not move. The ones who truly led the demons to fight were actually high-ranked demons. Therefore, when the destroyer appeared in the human world, his vast and surging power was like a natural beacon, naturally attracting demons to follow him like moths to a flame. It was a good thing to have an additional powerful force on his side, but it was actually not a good thing after calming down and thinking about it carefully. Among other things, if Demon King Samael appeared at this time, who should the demons listen to? Roy instinctively felt that it was not good, so he chose not to follow. Even though the Black Dragon, the Destroyer, exuded the evil aura of deprivation and a demon all over, Roy felt that this fellow might not really be on the demon's side. After solving the nuclear submarine at the bottom of the sea, Roy returned to the city and planned to continue harvesting souls. The number of souls he currently possessed was not far from 100,000. Now that he was a high-ranked demon, he had to have the style of a high-ranked demon, and he had to hurry up and get the cold winter armor. When Roy returned to the city, he found an unexpected joy. This unexpected joy was that the high-ranked demons and angel army that were occupying the city had all disappeared. Needless to say, they were chasing after the destroyer. The thoughts of the demons did not need explaining, and the angel army must have run to fight the destroyer boss. The direction the destroyer had left in was toward the main battlefield that Roy had stayed away from, the capital of the strongest human nation. Not only had it received the care of the armies of the angels and the demons from the beginning of the end war, but it now also had a great demon king like the destroyer. It was indeed extremely unfortunate. The main battle zone was about 2,000 kilometers away from the seaside city where Roy was. It was a very long distance, so Roy was not worried. Now that the high rank demons and the angel army were gone, it meant that he was the only remaining high rank demon in the city. How could Roy miss such a good opportunity? He immediately summoned all the low level demons in the city and got them to gather souls for him. After not having to worry about other high rank demons, Roy's efficiency in obtaining souls skyrocketed. In just three days, these low rank demons collected more than 22,000 souls for Roy finally allowing him to accumulate a hundred thousand souls. What was worth mentioning was that as time went by, 
it became more and more difficult to collect souls because most of these souls came from the surviving humans, and there were fewer and fewer of them. Even if they had survived earlier, they would gradually die one by one due to the lack of food and water or because of the strong radiation. The large city with millions of people had part of its population escape in the early stages of the war. And during the war, many human souls naturally disappeared because no one had collected them. They re-entered the energy cycle and reincarnation of heaven and earth. The rest, the part that could be truly obtained, had been divided up a lot because of the large number of demons. After all, low-level demons also needed to eat. Even the angels had taken away many souls they needed in the war. Due to the above reasons, the output of souls in the entire city was not that much. It could be said that it had been quite lucky and not very easy for Roy to be able to gather a hundred thousand souls in this city. The other high-ranked demons would have probably only been able to obtain 10 to 20,000 souls, even if they had low-level demons paying tribute. Roy already counted as one of the richest high-ranked demons in the city. With enough souls, Roy could not wait to materialize the cold winter armor. Fortunately, his judgment had been fairly accurate. After the system used up all the ordinary souls on him, it happened to just exchange for all the attributes of the armor. And because Roy set this armor to be equipped as a skill, after he used the Haradric cube to transmute high-quality souls and exchanged for it, there was an additional skill named Summon Armor in his skill column. Summon Armor, fixed consumption of half of the dark cold magic power. Summon the cold winter armor and equip it until the user takes the initiative to remove it. Cold winter armor attributes. Indestructible, can withstand powerful physical attacks. Even if the damage exceeds the limit, it will not be completely destroyed, only shattered. Self-repairing. When the armor breaks or is damaged, it will automatically absorb magic power to repair. The repair speed depends on the magic power supply speed. Super Recovery, provides 11 times the activity recovery speed and magic power recovery speed. Elemental Resistance, can resist at least 52% of the damage of all known elements. The number of souls Roy had possessed was more than 100,000, nearly 110,000. After the system consumed all his souls, the final attributes of the cold winter armor were slightly higher than what Roy had initially said. The magic power recovery speed increased by one time, and the elemental resistance increased by 2%. This was the advantage of giving attributes to the system for adaptive matching. Roy himself could not calculate the consumption of souls too accurately, but the system could achieve this adaptive matching without waste. After materializing it, Roy could not wait to use the summon armor skill. The massive amount of magic power in his body was immediately drained by half the moment he used the skill. The next moment, black ice rapidly spread over Roy's body and formed a domineering and mysterious armor. This armor had a black metallic texture and shined with a deep, dark light. From the arm guards and leg guards to the armor, it had a layered structure. The armor perfectly fit Roy's body, tightly wrapping around his muscles, revealing the lines of his muscles. At his feet, ice crystals condensed into long boots that covered his nails making Roy finally get out of the awkward situation where he did not have shoes to wear. On both sides of his legs, black ice condensed into wing-like protrusions similar to demon horns, and on each of his knees was a fierce demon face pattern. At his waist was the skirt armor, and it was made of diamond-shaped ice blades that resembled the tail of a phoenix, but at the end was the shape of demon claws. The arm guards were similar to the leg guards, and the elbows had wing-like protrusions that looked like demon horns. The fingerless gloves allowed Roy to reveal his claws and easily grab objects. His upper body was tightly wrapped in armor, reflecting Roy's muscular chest and abdomen muscles. The shoulder guards were skull-shaped and curved up from the skull's mouth. The helmet also had the same demon style. The helmet fully covered Roy's face, revealing only a T-shaped gap. In the dark helmet, Roy's scarlet demon pupils with the pentagrams were visible. This was a domineering demon-style armor. The moment he equipped it, an uncontrollable strong cold aura emitted from the armor, and in this biting cold aura, fatal radiation was constantly emitting. The ground beneath his feet was freezing, and the remaining green grass quickly turned yellow and withered. It could be said that Roy was simply a walking high danger item at this moment, and this entire body was proclaiming death. Roy spread his frost wings and dark wings, flew into the sky, and wantonly burst his magic power. Under the high-speed magic power recovery speed, Roy only felt that he could not use up the power all over his body. The thick gray clouds in the sky above the city were rolling rapidly under his magic power. The water molecules in the air quickly condensed into small, sharp ice blades that then fell from the sky like rain. The entire city welcomed a black ice blade storm on this day. 
Countless low-level demons on the ground were bleeding from the ice blade storm. They hugged their heads and hid, only daring to look at the sky through the gaps, looking at the fierce and terrifying figure with incomparable fear. This was Roy, the Lord of Darkness and Winter. Chapter 152 Cataclysm Sure enough, clothes make it the man. The amplification effects of armor aside, Roy felt that his essence, energy, and spirit were different. After wearing the armor, Roy finally looked like a high-ranked demon, and at this moment, he undoubtedly became the ruler of this city. The low-level demon spontaneously gathered under his command, destroying and killing in this city, intending to wreck it completely. Sometimes, these low-level demons would also hand over some strange spoils of war to Roy, but after looking at them, Roy found that most of them were useless. As the number of souls in this city dwindled, Roy began to consider whether he should go to other cities to collect souls. In this end war, humans died on a large scale, but these casualties were mainly concentrated in densely populated large cities because these large cities were the main strategic areas for angels and demons. On the contrary, in remote places, there might still be humans who had escaped, and these places could all become very good sources of souls. The appearance of the destroyer had made Roy very vigilant. Although he knew that after the destroyer appeared, he would definitely cause a fierce conflict with the angels, he did not intend to participate in the battles between these big shots. His goal had always been very clear use this super war to gather as many souls as possible. After all, it was very difficult to encounter an Armageddon war. Although the human legends of every world mention such words as Armageddon and Doomsday, there were not many cases of where a true Armageddon war occurred. After promoting to high rank demon, Roy could continue to increase the total amount of his magic power. Now that the nature of his magic power had changed and became condensed pure magic power, correspondingly, every increase in magic power required more souls than before. Without the support of a large number of souls, it was easier said than done. Perhaps, when Roy went to other worlds in the future, he would need to start a war to harvest souls like other high-ranked demons. After finding a world map again, Roy began to study where he should collect souls next. However, before he could figure out where to go, a huge change happened. On the fifth night he returned to the city from the sea, around dawn, in the distant night sky, a group of strong sun-like rays of light suddenly shone, illuminating the entire night sky. Almost half of Earth saw this strong flash. Roy also saw the flash and raised his hand to cover his eyes in astonishment. At first, he thought that humans had launched another large-scale nuclear attack, but then he realized that this was not the case. Roy could feel that the flash of light contained extremely powerful magic power. This immediately reminded Roy of the Black Dragon, the Destroyer. As soon as he recognized the direction, as expected, it was where the Destroyer had gone. This strong magic power flash only lasted for a bit before quickly disappearing. But before Roy could put down the arm covering his eyes, another equally powerful magic power flash lit up again. These flashes appeared in the high altitude clouds. They were at least thousands of kilometers away, which was the most shocking thing. Not long after the flash, an overwhelmingly loud sound wave came. It was an extremely powerful explosion that rumbled through the thick clouds like deafening thunder. This phenomenon that happened in the sky and the abnormal movements on the ground that came afterward caused a major earthquake of at least magnitude 10. When the vibrations of the earthquake reached the city where Roy was, the entire ground shook violently. The concrete ground began to collapse under these violent tremors, revealing the dark rock layer below. Deep, bottomless fissures formed, causing some demons who could not escape in time to fall in and disappear. The wreckages of the automobiles and buildings left behind by humans also toppled over and fell in. Hovering in the air, Roy could see huge spiderweb-like fissures appearing on the ground all over the city, which were caused by the earthquake. The center of the city had disappeared, as though someone had smashed the tectonic plates of the earth with a hammer. The massive tremors quickly reached the sea, and a shocking low tide appeared on the coast of the sea, revealing the seabed hundreds of meters deep. It was foreseeable that an unprecedented, enormous tsunami would assault the city before long. Of course, the tsunami would not affect Roy since he could fly. He only looked in the direction of the magic power flashes in bewilderment and doubt. He was very clear that such powerful magic power collisions should have been caused by the destroyer fighting someone. Moreover, his opponent was likely also a Demon King level figure. Only the collisions between two Demon King level powerhouses would cause such immense impacts. Demon King level power could easily destroy a world. This was definitely not a joke. Even the tectonic plates of the entire land moved. Roy's city was by the beach, 
so it encountered a tsunami. Perhaps in other places, there would be apocalyptic disasters such as volcanic eruptions and mountain collapses. Then here comes the question. Is it dry trash or wet trash? Wait, no. The question is, who is the destroyer's opponent? Is it Demon King Samael? Or a leader of the angels? Roy guessed that the chances of it being Demon King Samael were higher because the angels did not seem to have such a powerful leader. Their original leader, Abaddon, had already become the Black Dragon. Has my previous misgiving really become reality? One mountain cannot accommodate two tigers. Did Samael really clash with the destroyer? But there seemed to be many questionable points. Roy swayed his tail while thinking. Logically speaking, the destroyer had a demonic aura, so it was obvious at a glance that he had fallen because a demon had tempted him. It could be said that a demon had created him. And the problem was that since a demon had created the destroyer, it must have something to do with Demon King Samael because only he had the power to create a Demon King level fallen. But why did Samael do this? If he needed the power of the destroyer to help the demons defeat the angels, then he should not have appeared in the human world but should have let the destroyer do whatever he wanted. He only needed to hide behind the scenes and watch the show. However, he had not appeared in the earlier stages of the end war, but after the appearance of the destroyer, he suddenly appeared. Wasn't it obvious that he would have a conflict with the destroyer? Or was it that Samael had originally planned to gather two Demon King level powers and complete the task in one fell swoop? However, he had underestimated the thoughts of the destroyer and instead had a conflict with him? Roy thought for a long time and felt that there was nothing logically reasonable about it, so he felt confused. The fierce battle at the Demon King level was still going on. From time to time, the flashes of powerful magic power collisions would appear in the sky causing the ground to shake. Roy had no choice but to hover in the air and wait for this battle to pass. However, what he did not expect was that the fierce battle lasted for three full days. During these three days, Roy was about to go crazy. He did not expect Demon King level powerhouses to be so terrifying. Their magic power seemed inexhaustible, and they had been fighting for more than 70 hours without stopping. The entire earth, the sky, and the ocean were devastated. The seaside city below Roy had long disappeared. It had been destroyed by tsunamis and earthquakes, sinking deep into the seabed. There were numerous mountains missing and countless bottomless canyons. What is this? This is AF King Cataclysm. After the sky no longer had flashes and the battle finally stopped, the drastic changes finally calmed down. But at this moment, the world map in Roy's hand was useless because he knew that the territories of Earth had long changed. Roy waited quietly for another day confirming that the battle had truly stopped, before landing. The low-level demons who had gathered under Roy had suffered heavy casualties, and only the few that could fly had survived this cataclysm. Most of them had been sent to the resurrection point, and not even a tenth of them was left. The place Roy was now standing had become a vast ocean, and he could only use his magic power to form a big ice island to rest. This situation made Roy speechless. He knew that the countless souls that he could have collected on this earth had definitely disappeared after being tossed about by that huge battle. While Roy was still at a loss, he saw a figure flying crookedly in the distance. The radiation light rays from this figure did not look good, constantly fluctuating intermittently. Roy could tell at a glance that this figure was seriously injured. After the figure continued flying crookedly and came closer, Roy saw the figure clearly and could not help but reach out and rub his demon horns. He recognized at a glance that this figure was the fallen angel Julia he had encountered before. At this moment, Julia's situation was very bad. The armor on her body was even more damaged than last time, and when she flew over, her golden black blood kept flowing out of her body. She looked like she was in grave danger. After thinking about it, Roy spread his wings and went forward. Chapter 153 Julia's Request When she saw Roy again, Julia was shocked. Because during the time after she left, Roy had not only completed his promotion but also his armor. He was totally different from when she saw him before. As for Julia, she was currently heavily injured. She had just experienced a battle with a powerful enemy, and she was still jumpy and oversensitive. When she saw a domineering four-winged high-ranked demon flying toward her, she immediately clenched her sword and looked at Roy with great vigilance. Seeing her attitude, Roy immediately reacted and said, Julia, it's me. While speaking. Roy took off his helmet and held it in his hand. Although Roy's demon horns had changed a lot during his promotion, his appearance was still roughly the same, so after looking closely at him, Julia immediately recognized him. Osiris. It's you? Julia was in disbelief. 
she did not expect that Roy would change so much after promoting to high-ranked demon. After recognizing Roy, she could not help but relax and say weakly, I, I finally found you. Before she could finish speaking, Julia fell headlong from the air to the ground. Roy reacted quickly. As soon as he saw her falling, he hurriedly flew over to catch her halfway and grabbed her ankle. Why does Julia fall every time I see her? And every time I hold her, it seems to be in the same position. Roy looked around and flew toward a section of a building exposed above the sea. In his impression, this building originally had over a hundred floors, and it had been the tallest building in this coastal city. Unfortunately, the nuclear strike caused it to collapse in half, and now more than half of it was submerged because of the tsunamis. Now, only a section was left standing alone on the sea. After flying to the building, Roy placed Julia down and waited for her to wake up, mainly because Roy did not have any souls on hand now. Otherwise, he could think of some ways to make some healing items for her to use. While waiting, Roy was a little puzzled. What Julia said earlier sounded like she was specially looking for him. Roy understood why she was injured. After all, Julia was a personal guard following Demon King Samael. Since Samael fought the destroyer, his personal guards would definitely have to participate in the battle. But judging from her miserable condition, she must have been beaten badly, and Samael seems to have lost. Otherwise, how could Julia, a personal guard, leave the battlefield alone and come here? So, what did Julia come to find me for? With these doubts in his mind, Roy waited quietly, and about an hour later, Julia finally woke up. After waking, although she was still a little confused, she immediately reached out to grab her sword. It was not until she saw Roy sitting by the side that she remembered what happened before she passed out. She breathed a sigh of relief, loosened her hand, and the sword fell to the ground with a clang. Do you need to use another dark ritual? Roy asked. And no. Julia shook her head. Unlike the previous time, I am now being corroded by powerful magic power, and I can only slowly eliminate this power. The dark ritual won't be able to heal my wounds. What happened? Roy asked. How did you get beaten so miserably? Hearing Roy mention this, Julia's face darkened. You were right to choose to stay away. If you were in that city, you might have also. At this point, Julia did not continue speaking about this but instead changed the topic and began to talk about what had happened to her. With a solemn expression, she said, a traitor has appeared. The destroyer, he used the power of the abyss to fall and become a demon king, but he is not the leader of the demons. He has extraordinary ambitions. When His Majesty Samael descended, he actually attacked His Majesty. What's ridiculous is that some demons chose to follow him. Osiris, I need your help. Julia looked up at Roy and enunciated each word, during the battle with the destroyer, His Majesty Samael was unfortunately sealed by him. Although the destroyer couldn't kill His Majesty, for some reason, he actually has endless magic power. With the help of this magic power, he sealed His Majesty in this world, completely isolating his connection with the abyss. Osiris, I request you to help me. Think of a way to remove the seal on His Majesty Samael with me. Me? Roy was stunned when he heard this. He could not help but stand up and walk to Julia's side. While looking down at her, he poked her forehead with his finger. Are you sure you weren't beaten silly by the destroyer? How can you come to me for help with this kind of thing? Can't. Can I? Julia asked in a daze as her mind shook from Roy's poke. Nonsense. Remove the seal? A demon king placed a seal on another demon king, and you're actually asking a high-ranked demon like me to help? Roy spat. Even with you, it's just two high-ranked demons. The destroyer could stab us to death with a single finger. Did you really get beaten brainless? Then. Then what should I do? After hearing this, Julia was at a loss for what to do. Should I let His Majesty Samael stay sealed like this? Without his connection with the abyss, he'll become weaker and weaker. How should I know? Roy said impatiently. How is it the turn of us high-ranked demons to worry about the affairs of demon kings? You'd better give up such unrealistic thoughts. Julia no longer spoke. In fact, when Samael was defeated and sealed, Julia, who had been lucky enough to escape from the battlefield, had been stuck in a dazed state. She was a fallen angel created by Samael, so there was no doubt about her loyalty to him. She could not defeat the destroyer and the demons under him. The only way she could think of was to rescue Samael from the seal. She was weak and needed help, so she first thought of Roy. Demons did not have friends, and fallen angels were no exception. But Roy had protected her and allowed her to complete the dark ritual, so subconsciously, Julia felt that she could only trust Roy. 
She still remembered the direction Roy had left in, so she dragged her severely injured body all the way here. Fortunately, she had really met him. Otherwise, she would not have been able to go too far in her current state. However, after seeing Roy, she was stunned by Roy's words. Yes, facing the powerful destroyer, even Samael was defeated. Even if they, two high-ranked demons, worked together, what could they do? All right. Leave after you recuperate. Roy waved his hand impatiently. Find a chance to return to the Abyss. Samael is a demon king, so he might have other subordinates in the Abyss. You can seek their help, but don't come to me. Unexpectedly, his words reminded Julia. She suddenly perked up and said, That's right. Mother Lilith. Osiris, go with me to find Mother Lilith. If she helps, His Majesty Samael can definitely be saved. Who? Lilith? Roy was a little confused. In fact, he had only played the first Darksiders game. After so long, he could not remember too much, so how could he know who Lilith was? Mother Lilith is the ancestor and matriarch of all the succubus demons in the Abyss. Julia said. Legend has it that she is the first succubus of the Abyss. Like other demon kings, she has incarnations in several worlds. And in this world, she is His Majesty Samael's partner and has always accompanied His Majesty in his battles against heaven. But when the end war began, Mother Lilith stayed in another alternate space and did not participate in the war. If we can find her, she definitely has a way to remove the seal on His Majesty Samael. Chapter 154 Chaos Power Lilith? The first succubus? Roy pondered and asked, apart from her, are there any other demon kings in this world? No. Julia shook her head. In this world, only His Majesty Samael and Mother Lilith are leading. Then, let me reject your proposal. Roy said expressionlessly. I won't go with you to find Lilith to rescue Samael. W.Y.? Julia immediately became anxious. After finding Mother Lilith, she can handle it. We only need to tell her the news, and we won't need to do anything. Why are you unwilling? That's not what I mean. Roy shook his head. Julia, think about it carefully. The destroyer's aura of deprivation means that a demon must have tempted and transformed him. Is an ordinary demon capable of doing that to such a powerful force like the destroyer? Julia was stunned. You. You mean? It can only be another demon king who can create that kind of demon king level power. Roy said. You said it yourself that only Samael and Lilith have the power of demon kings in this world. And if Samael didn't create the destroyer, then who was it? Julia did not dare to say a word. It's understandable that you want to save Samael. Roy was not much concerned as he continued, but it's not a good method to rashly ask for help everywhere like this. Have you thought about it? If Lilith had tempted the destroyer into falling, thereby creating him, wouldn't you be just like a fool if you went to find Lilith so recklessly? What Roy said to Julia all came from his intuition. His intuition told him that Samael's defeat was too strange. One of the most ancient demons in the abyss, an incarnation of a deadly sin demon king, could not defeat the destroyer, a newly born demon king, but was instead sealed. How could anyone not find this unbelievable? Therefore, Roy had reason to believe that this was probably a play directed by Samael and Lilith. They were just playing a game of chess. The more ancient a demon, the higher the intelligence, and you definitely could not simply perceive them from the surface. And Samael was such an ancient demon. His true goal was probably not on the side of heaven, so who was he plotting against in this game of chess? In this world, besides the third party charred council, was there something else worth him scheming against? In Roy's opinion, the charred council, which could force heaven and the abyss to stop fighting and sign a contract, was like a fishbone stuck in the throat to demons. They absolutely wanted to get rid of it quickly. This might be the case for heaven as well. No one wanted to have another mother-in-law managing them. In order to destroy the charred council, he had to remove the most powerful force of the council, and the most powerful force of the council was nothing other than the four horsemen of apocalypse, right? Recalling the inexplicable appearance of war, one of the horsemen, in the end war, Roy felt that this might have been Samael's scheme. His goal was to turn the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the charred council against each other in order to dissolve the power of the council. Of course, the latter part was just Roy's vague guess for now, and he did not tell Julia. But he had already made up his mind not to participate in it. Julia loyally wanted to remove Samael's seal, but what if Samael being sealed was part of his plan? If she acted rashly like this, it might instead destroy Samael's plan. At that time, it was very likely that she would not be rewarded but punished instead. In fact, 
Julia was not stupid. She was just shocked by Samael's defeat and could not think straight. After Roy analyzed it for her from the perspective of a bystander, she immediately reacted. Seeing that she was silent, Roy said, So, you should recuperate first. Of course, with that said, Roy was still a little regretful. He felt that it was just a pity for his merit. Julia had said that she would apply for merit from Samael to reward him. But now that Samael was sealed, he probably had no hope for this merit for the time being. Roy had used up all his souls to exchange for the cold winter armor. It would have been better if he could use the merit to make up for some souls, but he could only continue collecting them himself now. Over the next few days, Roy did not go anywhere. He stayed on top of the building and waited for Julia to recuperate. And during this time, Roy learned a lot from his conversations with Julia. Before Julia was transformed into a fallen angel, she should have been an original angel, which was an angel born naturally and not a product of those artificial creations of heaven. Her memories as an angel had indeed disappeared, but from what Samael had once told her, she learned that after her defeat, Samael had brought her soul and body back to the abyss. Therefore, Julia was actually a fallen angel with relatively high potential. Even if she was transformed, she could still improve her strength in the future, unlike artificial angels or fallen angels whose badly damaged bodies were created again and had almost fixed abilities after transformation. However, because fallen angels were not like demons, who were innately obsessed with hunting souls, the increase in Julia's strength had always been relatively slow. She had been by Samael's side for more than 80 years, but she was only slightly stronger than when she had just transformed. Moreover, she was better at skill-based combat and was not that good at increasing her absolute strength. She told Roy that she had been by Samael's side for more than 80 years, and she could feel that Samael had always been faintly anxious. As for what Samael was anxious about, Julia felt that it might be related to deprivation. The deprivation she mentioned referred to a very special phenomenon, and it should be a kind of power. She told Roy that there were many alternate space bubbles in this world, surrounding the center human world, such as the alternate spaces where the Abyss Outpost and the White City of Heaven were. There were many different alternate spaces. Demon King Samael had such an alternate space, which was called the Black Stone. In this space, there was a Demon King City, which was Samael's true residence. However, many years ago, a huge black hole fissure had appeared in this alternate space. This black hole fissure hung high in the sky of the black stone, continuously spinning slowly and attracting the matter on the ground bit by bit. This black hole could devour all power. Even a demon king like Samael could do nothing about this black hole. Julia had followed Samael for more than 80 years, and the devouring of the black hole had already spread to the black stone. The black stone was now slowly disappearing, and nearly half of the demon king city had already turned into countless fragments that were devoured by the black hole. Moreover, According to Samael, this black hole had not only appeared on the black stone but also in some other spaces. In other words, as time passed, this black hole would not only devour all the alternate spaces, but even the human world would not be spared. In the end, the entire world here would be devoured and turn into nothingness. And Samael's anxiety might have come from this. As Julia was chattering about these things, Roy did not pay much attention at first, but when he heard the latter part, he suddenly felt that something was wrong. A black hole that devours everything? Turning into nothingness? Why does this scene sound so familiar? Fuck. Isn't this the void? Sardir is of the Pantheon, don't tell me he's here? Roy's eyelids kept twitching. He had thought that since he was a demon of the abyss, he might really be able to find the Warcraft world one day, but he never thought that he would discover the same void power that had swallowed thousands of worlds from the Warcraft world in this Darksiders world. Although Julia and Samael called this power deprivation here, judging from the nature of the power described by Julia, it was probably the power of the void. Is this thing really impossible to stop? Roy could not help asking. I don't know. Julia said. But I heard from His Majesty Samael that Mother Lilith seems to be working on a plan. If she can succeed, there may be a way to resist the power of deprivation. Did he say what the plan was? Roy asked. Julia frowned and thought for a while before replying with uncertainty, it seems. His Majesty once mentioned the term Chaos Demon. Chaos Demon? Roy chewed on the term. He suddenly thought of something, and a word suddenly popped out. Nephilim? He finally remembered. It seemed like the four horsemen of the apocalypse were Nephilim, a special race created by combining angel and demon. And the one who created this race seemed to be the mother Lilith that Julia had mentioned. Lilith who was known as the Mad Queen of Hell. 
In the past, when he was serving as an execution demon and hunting down the illusion demon Caesar, Roy knew that the bloodlines of demon and human could be combined, and the products of the combination were half-human half-demon bodies. In addition to being able to remain in a world forever, half-human half-demon bodies could also obtain incomparably powerful strength. And now, through what Julia had said, Roy found that there was something even crazier than creating a demon human. That was to combine the angel and demon bloodlines to create half-angel half-demons. And such a race also had incomparably powerful strength. The four horsemen of the apocalypse were proof. Hmm. Right, there's also the Diablo world. Those so-called Nephilim are also said to have the half-angel half-demon bloodline. Are they also the same race as the Nephilim? Can the light power of angels and the dark power of demons really merge? Looks like there's no need to ask further about this. The Mad Queen Lilith has already succeeded, and that was the Nephilim race. Be it the Nephilim or fallen angels like Julia, all of them were vaguely alluding to the fact that even completely opposite powers could be combined. This made Roy think of himself. When he was awakening his bloodline, this kind of mutation happened. The power of darkness and the power of frost completely fused, but the system had warned him to pay attention to his bloodline power and not to mess around. Roy was only now gradually recalling this reminder. The system only told him that it was risky, but it did not tell him that it was impossible. In other words, as long as Roy dared to take this risk, it was actually possible for him to fuse with other powers, not just purely the powers of darkness and frost. If that was the case, then was a demon that fused all the elemental powers the chaos demon that Lilith was researching? Chapter 155 Breakthrough Point Roy felt that the information he learned from Julia was very precious. In fact, although Roy had promoted to high rank demon, he was a little confused about his future path. He knew that above high rank demon was demon lord and demon king, but he did not know how to improve further. He knew that he needed more cannon fodder if he wanted to become stronger, but the frost demon bloodline only gave him a single elemental power. Perhaps if he continued to focus on this path, he would also be able to attain great achievements, but who knew how long it would take. Thinking about how he might need thousands of years, turning into a very old demon, before he became a demon lord and demon king made Roy feel unbearable. This was not because he was short-sighted and eager for quick success, but because there were too many things that could happen in these thousands of years. Even Samael's demon king incarnation could be sealed, so who could guarantee that he would not die midway? Although his body had become a long-lived race like demons, Roy still retained human thoughts, and his ideas were naturally in line with the thinking of the short-lived species. He was used to achieving his ideas as soon as possible. The term chaos demon mentioned by Julia allowed Roy to see a new promotion path and possibility, which naturally aroused his thoughts. If he remembered correctly, the four horsemen of the apocalypse had a chaos form power. Although this form lasted only for a very short time, once they used this power, the four horsemen of the apocalypse could be said to be invincible. This chaos form should be brought about by the Nephilim bloodline, the combination of angel and demon bloodlines. If the Nephilim were really created by the Mad Queen Lilith, then they were very likely the products born when Lilith experimented with creating chaos demons. What was certain was that the Nephilim should not be what Lilith wanted because they were not demons, and they even left Lilith's control in the end. Chaos, what kind of power was it? Roy did not know, but since even a demon king like Lilith was sparing no effort in pursuing this chaos power, it was definitely unique. Roy did not know how Lilith had merged the two opposing bloodlines of angel and demon. But he felt that if he truly wanted to obtain other powers, Lilith's experimental data would certainly be of help to him. Of course, Roy had the system, and he could use the system's power to help him complete a similar bloodline power fusion. But the price he would need to pay was too great. Roy needed a lot of souls in many ways, and he was now feeling that he was a little short in supply. It was like manufacturing a car. If Roy produced all the parts of the car himself, it would be too complicated. However, if he could obtain the required parts from other sources and only needed to complete the final assembly, it would be much simpler to produce. If Lilith's experimental data could help him reduce some of his soul consumption, then it would be best to get it. When Julia had mentioned seeking help from Lilith earlier, Roy was thousands of times unwilling. But now that he heard that Lilith might have experimental data on merging opposite bloodlines, Roy began to waver. Maybe I can really go? However, to deal with big shots like Demon Kings, he required a perfect breakthrough point. Otherwise, if he accidentally messed up the plans of the big shots, good things would turn into bad things. Roy needed some time to get a clear picture of the situation, so he had been protecting Julia and allowing her to recuperate quietly. To Roy, Julia was a key figure. 
She was a personal guard of Samael, and since she knew about the existence of Lilith, it meant that she had seen Lilith. If Roy wanted to deal with a big shot like the Mad Queen Lilith, then Julia was indispensable. She would become Roy's important connection to win Lilith's trust. If he wanted to learn about how Lilith had fused the angel and demon bloodlines, it was absolutely impossible to snatch it forcibly, and stealing had no success rate. Therefore, the best way was to obtain it through rewards. It was best to obtain huge merit and then ask Lilith for these materials as a reward when he met her. The possibility of this working was still there, but the chances were relatively low. Regardless, Roy still wanted to try. During his free time, Roy was pondering about how to get involved in this matter. He could go with Julia to report to Lilith about Samael being sealed. Although he could seal Lilith this way, he absolutely could not do so. If the matter about Samael being sealed was really a part of the scheme planned by these two demon kings, then not only would Julia not be rewarded for her loyalty, but she might instead end up unlucky. Either Lilith would imprison her on account of her loyalty to prevent her from causing trouble, or she would be ruthless enough to kill Julia directly to prevent her from doing any possible reckless actions in the future. Therefore, Roy was in a slightly difficult position at the moment. He naturally knew that if there was nothing unexpected, Samael and Lilith's plan was definitely targeting the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and the Charred Council. However, the plan was certainly quite secretive, and perhaps only the two demon kings knew. Roy and Julia were only high-ranked demons, and they could only see through it but not expose it, having to pretend that they did not know. Since he could not report this, what excuse should he use to get close to Lilith? Perhaps it was a good idea to use the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Since they were Nephilim, the race Lilith created, maybe Lilith would be interested in their affairs? But what should he do? Putting aside whether Roy could find the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Huh? Wait. Roy suddenly realized that he did not need to persist in looking for a Lilith. If he wanted to know how she merged the two bloodlines of Angel and Demon, why not just ask the Nephilim directly? As the parties involved, would they not even know the origin of their race? The Nephilim were also long-lived creatures, and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse had lived almost since the birth of the Nephilim. Perhaps they had even witnessed how the other members of their race were born. Moreover, even if they did not know how Lilith had created the Nephilim, Roy could first get some of their cells to study. For example, he could extract a tube of their blood and then think of a way to use the system to create an analytical instrument to analyze their bloodline. Even if it did not work, he could come back to think of another way to conquer Lilith. After weighing the options for a while, Roy thought that this idea was quite reliable. A Demon King level big shot like Lilith was really difficult to deal with because you could not fathom the thoughts of a demon. The more ancient a demon was, the more cunning they were. Instead, it was the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. They might have fought against angels and demons, but that was when angels and demons were hostile to them. This made Roy immediately think about the demon merchant, Volgrim. Without showing any hostility and being able to help the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, this cunning demon merchant had made deals with almost all the Horsemen of the Apocalypse and obtained their trust. Perhaps I can imitate Volgrim and try to come into contact with the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? Hmm. As to what kind of help I can give to the Four Horsemen, don't I have the system? The Four Horsemen have a large number of souls. As long as I can trade with them, the system can create things that they can use, right? It seemed like he really had to become a fake merchant and compete with Volgrim for business. Seriously, when I first came to this world, I tried all means to avoid War of the Four Horsemen. I didn't expect that it would turn the other way around, and I now have to find a way to get into contact with them. Even Roy felt a little caught off guard by this change. Chapter 156 Fighting the Dominion Angel Julia's injuries finally healed. In the battle between Samael and the Destroyer, a more powerful force had affected her. Now, after relying on time to expel this residual force from her body, she activated a dark ritual to repair her magic power and body. After seeing that she had recovered, Roy should start moving. However, Julia had nowhere to go, so she planned to follow him. Not to mention in the abyss, even in this world, it was difficult for demons to trust each other. As a fallen angel, Julia was no different from other demons. Now that she had rarely encountered someone like Roy, whom she could trust and communicate with, she could only follow him temporarily. Otherwise, she did not know what she should do. Roy did not decline. Julia still had combat strength, and fallen angels did not seem to crave souls like demons, so Roy just had her help collect souls. The city had already been submerged by the tsunamis, leaving only the vast ocean. The low-level demons had long escaped, so it was meaningless to stay here anymore. 
However, because of the terrifying battle between the two demon kings, the Earth's crust had changed tremendously, and the original maps were no longer useful. Roy could only choose a random direction to fly in with Julia. According to what Julia said, the battle between Samael and the Destroyer could be seen as a power struggle. After Samael was sealed, most of the demons in the human world had now surrendered to the Destroyer and recognized his rule. After all, following the strong was the nature of demons. However, there were also some demons loyal to Samael that might fight against those demons who changed sides. The current demon army inevitably had some infighting. Due to this, Julia reminded Roy that it was best for him to be cautious when encountering other demons. After all, Roy, who was far away from the main battlefield, was not yet incorporated into the Destroyer's troops. The high-ranked demons who followed the Destroyer after switching sides might very well treat him as a remaining demon of Samael's side and attack him. Roy did not say anything and just nodded to indicate that he understood. However, what the two did not expect was that while they were moving, they did not encounter the demons following the Destroyer but instead a group of angels. What was even more surprising was that the leader of this team of angels was actually Uriel, the angel who had followed Abaddon back then. This angel with Dan's skin, Uriel, had always been following her leader, Abaddon, to participate in the war with demons. However, due to war's arrival, Abaddon was crushed to death by demon Lord Striga. Nowadays, in the war with demons, the side of heaven was inevitably at a disadvantage. Uriel had asked for reinforcements from the headquarters in heaven, hoping that another leader would lead the angel army to fight, but she had not received any response. The heaven army had strict discipline, and without permission, Uriel could not return to the headquarters. Without choice, Uriel could only continue to lead the remaining angel army to fight. Fortunately, Uriel had always had prestige among angels. After Abaddon disappeared, the angels were very obedient to her leadership. Under Uriel's command, the side of heaven continued to slaughter the demons in the human world according to plan, fighting blood-soaked battles with the demons, becoming locked in fighting. But all of this changed after the appearance of the Destroyer. After the Destroyer, who was transformed from the fallen Abaddon, appeared in the human world, he led the demons to deal a devastating blow to the angel army. Abaddon, who was once a leader of heaven, was unrelenting in dealing with angels and slaughtered many of them. Uriel led the heaven army and attempted to resist the destroyer, but with the huge disparity in strength, she failed. After losing, Uriel had no choice but to retreat with the remaining angel troops, and under the destroyer's command, many demon troops were chasing them down. However, the battle between Samael and the destroyer a few days ago could be regarded as saving them. The demons chasing them down were summoned back to join the battle, and they could not attend to chasing down and killing Uriel. However, Uriel's situation was not much better. When Roy and Julia encountered her, she was in a defeated state. This angel team had about 30 people, but almost everyone was injured. Their golden armor was full of traces of blood, from demons and themselves. There were also a few large golden griffins in this team. These originally majestic angelic mounts were also in a miserable state. The feathers on their wings were scorched black and uneven, and they looked crooked when flying. However, these griffins were quite sensitive to demons or dark forces, and the angels had trained them to be like hounds. When the two sides met in the sky, Roy had noticed the angels earlier through his radiation perception, but he could not avoid them because the griffins had also discovered him. The angel army was indeed well trained. When the griffins noticed the presence of demons, the angels immediately reacted and entered a state of combat. They spread out, caught up to Roy and Julia, and surrounded them. Originally, the angels would not say anything once they discovered a demon like Roy and would directly attack him. However, after seeing Julia, the angels reacted differently. The angel soldiers surrounding the two immediately shouted to Uriel, who was in the rear, Your Excellency Uriel. We've found a fallen angel. Seems. Like an original angel. Uriel saw only two enemies and felt that the angel soldiers under her should be able to deal with them, so she brought up the rear. But after hearing the shout, she immediately flew over. After seeing Julia, Uriel's eyes widened. Really? Capture her immediately. Julia held her sword in front of her, ready to fight. Seeing this, Uriel said to Julia, Give up resisting, fallen. You should also understand that you are an angel. Let me bring you back and purify the depraved power in you so that you can regain yourself. By the side, Roy immediately understood after hearing Uriel's words. No wonder fallen angels rarely participated in battles against heaven. 
it seemed that the demons who created them also knew that fallen angels could still be purified and regain their identities as angels, so they tried their best not to let fallen angels and angels face each other directly. However, how could Julia, who had lost her memories of the past, listen to her? Ever since she became a fallen angel, she had always been instilled with the idea that she was an enemy of angels. Moreover, the dark power in her body was incompatible with the holy power of angels. Both sides would feel natural hatred toward each other. Therefore, when the angel soldiers rushed at Julia, she did not hesitate to fight back. Roy, this demon, seemed to have been forgotten. Roy rubbed his demon horns. He finally experienced the arrogance of angels. It's nothing more than you having more people, and you're just a defeated army, so how dare you not take a high-ranked demon seriously? Black ice spread over Roy, and he summoned the cold winter armor. After he equipped the armor, Roy fully unleashed his magic power. He spread his frost wings and dark wings, announcing his existence without restraint. At this moment, Uriel finally turned her head. She stared at Roy coldly, gripped her angelic sword quietly, and a pair of angel wings extended out behind her. Clearly, she had mobilized all her strength to guard against Roy. Roy smiled in satisfaction. He flapped his wings violently and flew at the speed of sound in the blink of an eye toward Uriel. Uriel was definitely the best test stone for Roy now. Moreover, looking at the golden wings behind Uriel, it meant that she was climbing toward the power of a six-winged angel. An enemy at the peak of the Dominion level might be stronger than Roy, but she was definitely worth fighting. Once Uriel became a six-winged angel, he could only rely on demon lords to deal with her. The moment he charged, Roy stretched out his hand, and Frostmourne appeared in it. Using his powerful speed and impact, Roy swung his sword at Uriel. Clang! The loud humming of metal clashing rang out. Uriel held her sword in both hands and blocked Roy's slash. Sparks sputtered from both swords as they immediately entered a battle of strength. After promoting to high rank demon, Roy's strength had increased a lot, but Uriel was not weak either. After a while, both sides found that they could not overwhelm the other in strength, so they suddenly mustered their strength to knock each other away. Report your name, demon. Uriel pointed the tip of her sword at Roy solemnly. Osiris. Roy said proudly while raising his chin slightly. Very good. Uriel said. I promise that I will personally cleanse your soul. With that, Uriel flapped her wings and slashed at Roy. But this time, Roy did not use his sword to block. Instead, he raised his wrist and blocked Uriel's sword with the wrist guard of the cold winter armor. Uriel's attack could be considered heavy, but when her sword struck Roy's wrist guard, it did not cause any damage to Roy. The physical defense ability of the cold winter armor far exceeded Roy's imagination. Roy took a look and found that only a tiny crack had appeared on the wrist guard where Uriel had struck. He injected a little magic power and immediately repaired it. When Uriel saw this, her eyes were full of surprise. She found that this high rank demon named Osiris had armor with stronger defense than that of angelic armor. His left arm blocked Uriel's attack, and Roy swung his sword at her with his right. She quickly dodged the attack and brandished her sword again to attack a gap in Roy's armor. In order to facilitate movement, it could be said that no armor could completely cover the entire body, and Roy's cold winter armor was no exception. But how could Roy let her pierce through the gap so easily? He turned around, flicked his tail, and slammed it against Uriel's sword, knocking her sword crooked. Holy lightning! Help me eliminate evil! Realizing that physical attacks were not very useful, Uriel immediately changed her battle plan. With a wave of her hand, several bolts of golden lightning descended from the sky. Roy flew back, but the lightning continuously followed him. Seeing that he could not avoid them, Roy opened his hand, and a huge black ice shield appeared above his head to block the lightning. The bolts of lightning crashed onto the ice shield, and the golden light within immediately flowed through the ice before being refracted and emitting dazzling light. Afterward, the lightning disappeared. At the same time, Roy's ice shield disintegrated. The golden holy lightning had a strong restraining effect on the dark power in the ice shield. Under the collision of the two magic powers, Roy's ice shield did not last long. The ice shield broke, but Uriel summoned another bolt of lightning, and this bolt of lightning immediately struck Roy. In an instant, the black armor on Roy burst out with dazzling light. Chapter 157 Uriel's Death Due to the armor being made of ice, the moment the lightning struck Roy, his entire body immediately sparkled like a ball of lightning. Roy's first feeling was an extremely intense burning sensation all over his body. His skin seemed to be melting, and the pain made him roar. Frankly, 
This was the first time that such a powerful holy power had hit Roy. In the past, he had only come into contact with a little bit of holy water. The lightning released by Uriel was not only very fast, but the holy power contained within had too great of a restraining effect against demons. The conflict between holy light and Roy's dark power naturally brought him immense pain. Originally, this powerful holy lightning would be enough to severely injure a high-ranked demon like Roy. Fortunately, Roy had spent a hundred thousand souls to create the cold winter armor, and he had defined it to have resistance against all elemental powers. This resistance also covered holy light and lightning, which caused the damage of Uriel's attack to be reduced in half directly. Therefore, despite the pain, the damage Roy truly suffered was not as much as expected. With the roar, Roy frantically outputted his magic power and forcefully expelled the continuously destructive holy power from his body. Under the immense magic power, a huge black ice ball appeared and firmly enveloped Roy's entire body. Roy used ice block. What? Uriel, who had wanted to seize the opportunity to press home the attack after seeing Roy being hit, had just rushed in front of Roy and slashed down with her sword when this incomparably thick ice ball blocked her. Her sword hit the hard layer of ice, and sparks flew but it failed to break the defense of the ice. The next moment, the huge ice ball shattered, and Roy rushed out of the black ice into the sky. Taking advantage of the opportunity of Uriel's line of sight being interfered with by light reflecting off the ice, he stretched out his demon claws, grabbed her neck with his left hand, and stabbed Frostmourne with his right hand at her chest. Roy had never thought about holding back when it came to Uriel. Angels and demons all fought with their lives on the line. Roy's sword was fast and agile. It was about to pierce through Uriel's body, but at this crucial moment, she twisted her body with all her might and barely managed to avoid the fatal blow. As blood splattered, Roy's Frostmourne did not pierce through Uriel's chest but instead stabbed into the angel wings behind her. Uriel screamed as golden red blood oozed out of her wings, and stained feathers flew everywhere. Roy did not withdraw his sword but seized the chance to slash viciously, immediately cutting off Uriel's pierced wing. Enduring the pain. Uriel used her light body to slam against Roy's chest and free herself from Roy's control. Then she swung her sword, and golden lightning erupted with her body as the center. The lightning swiftly spread toward Roy. Roy did not want to be touched by the lightning containing holy power, so he could only hurriedly flap his wings and fly up. The angel soldiers, who were besieging Julia, were shocked when they saw this. They had never thought that Uriel would have a wing cut off while fighting that high-ranked demon. Your Excellency Uriel. After a few angels regained their senses, they immediately left Julia and rushed at Roy. Roy raised his hand suddenly, and an even larger ice tornado than the one he used to kill the illusion demon Caesar immediately formed in the air. These angel soldiers were rushing too quickly, so they plunged into the ice tornado and were instantly frozen into black ice sculptures. Then they fell from the sky and shattered into countless crystal fragments when they impacted the ground. However, the courage of the angel soldiers was beyond doubt. The tragedy of these angel soldiers did not make the other angel soldiers shrink back. They left only two people entangled with Julia, and the rest charged at Roy. With the support of the cold winter armor, Roy had extraordinary magic power recovery speed. His magic power was still very abundant, so he was not afraid of these angels taking turns to fight him. Especially because of the influence of Roy's magic power, the sky was already full of countless black snowflakes, and it was completely Roy's home ground so Roy did not hesitate to face the siege of the angels. Uriel, who had lost a wing, was currently using her magic power to expel the dark power that Roy had left in her. Just like how holy power dealt strong damage to Roy, the damage Roy's attack caused to Uriel was equally terrifying. The dark cold magic power on Frostmourne, the bleeding curse, the strength absorption curse, the power of the expulsion curse, and the heavy curse all erupted through the ruptured wound on Uriel's wing. Unlike Roy, she did not have the cold winter armor to reduce damage, so she used almost all of her magic power to resist the collective erosion of these curses, causing her to be unable to participate in the battle for a while. She could only look on helplessly as her angel soldiers rushed at Roy one after another. These angel soldiers were besieging Roy, but not long later, they found that they were rapidly losing magic power. Their bodies and breathing were becoming heavier, and their bodies were becoming more and more exhausted. After the black snowflakes fell on them, Instead of melting, they were continuously piling up. It was precisely these snowflakes that were continuously sucking away their power and freezing their bodies. It could be said that as long as the snow did not dissipate, this sky was Roy's domain. He did not need to do much, and these angel soldiers besieging him would turn into ice sculptures and fall under the extreme cold temperature. 
This was the power of frost demons. Although Roy could not deal fatal damage with a single blow now, the longer a battle dragged on, the more advantageous he would be. In Roy's radiation perception vision, the radiation emanating from these angel soldiers surrounding him became weaker and weaker. Black frost permeated their bodies, making their movements sluggish and their bodies extremely stiff. With a crack, an angel soldier actually broke his wrist when he swung his weapon. This phenomenon meant that these angels had reached their limit. As expected, their wings no longer had the strength to flap, and they stopped moving and fell to the ground. Knock. Knock. After a few consecutive noises, the stiff bodies of angel soldiers hit the ground and shattered into countless fragments. The blood in their bodies did not even flow out as it was all frozen as well. However, even though they had died, these angel soldiers had indeed bought time for Uriel to finally expel the curses on her. She now only had three wings left, looking very disheveled, but it did not affect her flying. She floated in the air, and her golden eyes stared intently at Roy with hatred. Without a word, both Roy and Uriel knew that they could only fight to the death. Roy knew that Uriel was an important figure in this world, but a person's will could not change the situation. Regardless of whether it was demons or angels, the moment they encountered each other, it meant that only one of them could live. Even if Roy did not kill the angel soldiers under Uriel, she would not let him go. She would kill Roy with the angel soldiers while taking Julia away. A figure appeared beside Roy. It was Julia. After killing the two angel soldiers, she turned around to support Roy. Now, the current situation had reversed, and it was Roy and Julia besieging Uriel. Uriel did not retreat and brazenly fought the two of them. The battle began once again. Both sides fought for more than an hour. As time passed, both Julia and Uriel gradually ran out of magic power and became exhausted. Only Roy had abundant magic power under the support of the magic power recovery of the cold winter armor. Finally, with Julia's help, Roy stabbed his sword into Uriel's chest. This time, Uriel could no longer dodge. She was already too exhausted. She lowered her head, looked at the frost morn inserted into her chest, slowly closed her eyes, and murmured, Your Excellency Abaddon, I did my best. At this moment, Uriel did not know that Abaddon had already chosen to fall under Lilith's temptation and become the Black Dragon, the Destroyer. She only thought that Abaddon had been killed by the demons, and the person she respected and worshipped had died. Uriel's heart was already much more exhausted than her body, and she had led the angel army to resist the demons just to fulfill her final duty. Perhaps if she had not encountered Roy, Uriel would have continued leading the angels to fight. But when she encountered Roy and Julia, and the last soldier beside her died in battle, she could no longer hold on. She knew that maybe her soul would be taken away by this demon named Osiris, possibly devoured or possibly turned into a fallen angel. But no matter what, she might be free of her worries for the first time. Uriel's body slowly fell. A golden holy soul emerged from her body, and Roy grabbed it. Looking at the soul in his hand, Roy knew that he might have inadvertently changed the history or future that should have been. But he had no regrets because if Uriel did not die, then it might have been him who died. When he experienced the Van Helsing world, Roy knew that these parallel worlds were merely revolving according to their own laws, and they would not stop because of the death of a certain character, even if this character was the so-called main character. However, how should I deal with Uriel's soul? While Roy was thinking, he suddenly felt a radiation source appear behind him in his radiation perception. He turned around and found that the demon merchant, Volgram, had appeared. Aha! What a beautiful and seductive soul! After Volgram appeared, he did not greet Roy but instead looked at Uriel's soul in Roy's hand with an intoxicated expression. Your nose is even more sensitive than hellhounds. Roy could not help but mock him. I just got the soul, and you already appeared. I'll take it that you're complimenting me. Vulgrim said thick-skinnedly as he rubbed his hands. Demon Osiris, it hasn't been long since we last met, but I didn't expect you to change so much. Now, you're brimming with the radiance of power. A demon with infinite potential like you might be willing to become my big customer? With a flattering expression on his face, he seemed to have completely forgotten the experience of being tricked in his first encounter with Roy. However, before Roy could answer, a sword was placed on Vulgrim's neck. It was Julia. She held her sword and said coldly, Volgrim, you despicable and shameless fellow. Who gave you the courage to appear here? A fallen angel actually scolded a demon for being despicable and shameless? This is really. Roy looked at this scene and was dumbfounded. What the hell is going on? Chapter 158 Another Horseman of the Apocalypse
Seeing that Julia's attitude toward Vulgrim was extremely bad, Roy asked and finally understood what was going on. How should he put it? Vulgrim could be considered an anomaly among demons. He was completely different from the belligerent and bloodthirsty ordinary ones. Vulgrim could be called cowardly. Almost all the souls he acquired was from trading with others, and he had never fought and plundered souls personally. Among the demons in this world, Vulgrim's name was synonymous with timidness. If that was all, then it would be fine. It was normal for one or two weirdos to appear among so many demons. But what the demons could not tolerate the most was that Vulgrim had learned to be unprincipled like human merchants. Not only did he transact with demons, but he also transacted with angels and even with the Charred Council. And demons and angels loathed the latter. This was why the three forces, demons, angels, and the Charred Council, did not have any favorable impression of Vulgrim whatsoever. They could trade with him when necessary, but when they were not trading, they regarded him as an ant. Lowly. It was the perfect word to describe Vulgrim. Even though he possessed the power of a high-rank demon, high-rank demons essentially regarded him as scum and were ashamed to acknowledge his status. Although Julia was a fallen angel, under the influence of other demons, she had never had any good impression of Vulgrim, so she spoke harshly to him as soon as he appeared. On the other hand, Roy did not have much understanding of Vulgrim because he had not been in this world for a long time. In order to deepen Roy's direct impression of Vulgrim, Julia pointed at the pair of demon wings on Vulgrim's back and said, Do you see those damaged wings? That was the punishment from other high-ranked demons. Such a shameless fellow is simply not worthy of being called a demon. Roy looked at the pair of wings behind Vulgrim and found that it was really incomplete, as Julia had said. The demon wings, which should have been wide and domineering, were only left with a small segment of the roots on his back. Vulgrim wrapped these wounds up with bandages like a pair of crispy wings, and they even moved from time to time. No wonder when Roy had not promoted yet and was still a middle rank demon, Vulgrim had been humble when he saw him. He understood his situation and was very cautious when dealing with each transaction partner. Looking at Vulgrim, who did not dare to move under Julia's sword, Roy shook his head. You being like this really subverts my impression of demons. However, Vulgrim did not care at all. It's nature. Your Excellency Osiris, this is nature. Don't humans say that nature is unchangeable? Although I live lowly, I've lived longer than most demons. Many of them die in battle, but I can continue to witness history. It's hard to say who profited more. Roy stretched out his claws and pushed aside Julia's sword, getting her to move her sword away. Then he said to Vulgrim, You are a rift demon and can travel freely anywhere in this world, in any space. You can naturally see many. People. Vulgrim, I need you to help me find someone. I'd be happy to help you, Your Excellency Osiris. Without the threat of the sword, Vulgrim revealed a humble smile. I'm willing to do any business, even if it's to find someone. So, who do you want me to find? Nephilim, or the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? Roy said. Hearing this, Vulgrim was stunned. Are. Are you sure about this? Yes. I want to find a Horseman of the Apocalypse. Roy nodded in confirmation. I have to say, Your Excellency Osiris, were you stimulated in your battle with the angel Uriel? Vulgrim was astonished. You actually want to find a horseman of the apocalypse? Do you know what those horsemen will do if they see a demon like you? Of course, I know they might kill me. Roy said. But they might also listen to a few words from me, right? Indeed, Roy had thought about it carefully over the past few days. At the time when war had just descended, it would have likely been suicide for a demon like him to approach the horsemen. But the situation now seemed to be a little different. According to the time frame. War had already been summoned back by the Charred Council and imprisoned, and his other three siblings should all be rushing to save him at this time, right? Under these circumstances, the four horsemen of the apocalypse could no longer care about the war between angels and demons. As long as someone could provide them with some help, they should still choose to listen, even if it was the words of a demon. It was indeed very risky to meet a horseman of the apocalypse, but at the same time, this risk was not necessarily greater than meeting the Mad Queen Lilith. Seeing that Roy was so certain, Vulgrim was stunned. He was silent for a while before rubbing his hands together and saying, Okay, since your Excellency Osiris insists on it, then I will help you. And coincidentally, just before coming here, I saw a horseman. Huh? In the human world? Roy was a little surprised. He initially thought that he might be able to go to another space by using Vulgrim's ability to meet death, the horseman who represented death but he did not expect to hear this unexpected news from Vulgrim. Yes, in the human world. 
Vulgrim nodded. Furthermore, it's Fury. I can think of a way to let you meet her, but I have to remind you that that woman is very difficult to deal with, very difficult. If you want to say something to her, it's best to be mentally prepared. Fury? Why is she in the human world? Roy touched his demon horns and pondered. In fact, Roy did not know much about the plot development of the Darksiders world. In fact, when he was reborn as a demon, the story about Fury of the Four Horsemen had not come out yet. Um, she seems to have been sent by the Council. Vulgrim said. It's said that she came to capture the Seven Deadly Sins. The Council sent her? That's strange. When war descended earlier, didn't it summon him back? The seal isn't broken, and the Council can't intervene. Why did it send Fury? What are the Seven Deadly Sins? Does it have anything to do with the Seven Deadly Sin Demon Kings? Roy pondered but did not say anything. Roy did not know that although Fury had indeed been sent by the Charred Council, she had come nominally under another purpose to hunt down the seven deadly sins that escaped from the Charred Council's prison. Due to the fact that the last seal was not broken, the Charred Council could not intervene in the end war and could only look on helplessly as angels and demons wreaked havoc in the human world. However, it was obviously impossible for them to just look on like this, so the Charred Council was actually secretly making some small actions. In fact, when war had mysteriously descended to the human world, it was caused by the Charred Council. War was not lying. He had indeed felt the power of the summons, but the Charred Council had manufactured this summons. As early as when Abaddon and Azrael moved to destroy the seals, the Charred Council had already seen through their motive, and it was very dissatisfied with their unauthorized destruction of the seals. But unfortunately, Abaddon's actions did not really break the contract, only exploiting the loopholes in the contract. Without concrete evidence, it could not dispatch the four horsemen of the apocalypse to descend to punish Abaddon, so they simply played a scheme and first let war descend in violation of the rules. Then it deprived war's power and summoned him back. It said that he had broken the contract and violated the rules. In doing so, the council was actually framing war. It knew very well that war was an extremely honorable knight. After being wronged, he would definitely want revenge in order to restore his reputation. This way, the council could use him to kill Abaddon, who had turned into the destroyer. During the period of war's imprisonment, Considering the difference in the flow of time, the war and the destructive behavior of the angels and demons in the human world had to be restrained, so the Council used the escape of seven deadly sins as an excuse to send out Fury. When Volgrim encountered Fury earlier, it had not been long since she had descended into the human world. Roy did not know this at the moment, but it did not affect his actions. He only needed to find a suitable opportunity to see Fury. And all of this required Volgrim's help. This was a deal. But such a deal was not worth paying the price of Uriel's soul, so Roy quickly negotiated with him and came to an agreement. As long as Vulgrim led to him to find Fury, he would give him 500 souls as remuneration. Chapter 159 The Purgatory Space It had to be said that despite Vulgrim being a humiliation in the eyes of many demons, his credibility was quite good after concluding a deal. After receiving the remuneration of 500 souls from Roy, he immediately opened his serpent hole to Roy and Julia. The so-called serpent hole was merely Vulgrim's name for it. In fact, these so-called serpent holes were spatial paths extending in all directions that existed in different spaces. Vulgrim was a rift demon, and his spatial talent allowed him to enter these serpent holes at any time and anywhere. However, Roy and Julia were not rift demons, so if Vulgrim wanted them to enter, he could only use his magic power to draw a magic formation on the ground. When standing on the magic formation, Roy immediately realized that the world in front of him had changed. The surrounding scenery became blurry, constantly wriggling and distorting, as though he was looking at something through water vapor, but it was also a bit different. Follow me closely. Vulgrim led the way in front. The serpent hole opens up in the purgatory space, and the purgatory space is constantly changing. The only relatively stable place is the serpent hole path I opened. If you get lost in this purgatory space, it will be very troublesome for you. Roy flapped his wings carefully as he flew forward. In this distorted and blurry space, there was no such thing as stepping on solid ground. Roy could only see a curved, white trail that Vulgrim left behind as he moved forward. This was probably the so-called path, so he followed this trail closely. Julia was no exception. She also followed closely while looking all around. What is the purgatory space? Roy asked Vulgrim as he followed. Although Roy roughly understood some knowledge about the Gate of the Abyss, it was only a part of the use of space. 
Roy did not know much regarding true space theory, so he could only ask this rift demon Volgrim. In many worlds, there are distinctions between the main material world and the sub-material world. Volgrim explained. I don't know why, but most of the time, the human world is the main material world, and the other races live in sub-material world. These two worlds are in their own spaces, as though they're wrapped in bubbles. This is the so-called space bubble theory. These space bubbles often pile up around the space bubbles where the main worlds are. You can imagine them as, well, like grapes, like a bunch of grapes. Vulgrim described Roy as he advanced. And these space bubbles will intersect with the space bubbles of the main material worlds. The edges of their spaces will often merge together, and then as long as you master the right method, you can go to other space bubbles. The so-called purgatory space refers to the parts where these space bubbles merge when they meet. These parts of the spaces can be regarded as the spaces of the main material worlds, and they can also be regarded as the spaces of the submaterial worlds, but they are neither. They are special spatial locations. After entering the purgatory spaces, you will see many inexplicable scenes. These scenes might come from the main material worlds or from the submaterial worlds. They are a kind of spatial projection, and in fact, they're not real. Vulgrim continued. These scenes also possess the same physical and or magic power properties as the main body, so even if you destroy these scenes, their true bodies will remain intact in the original world. Is there such a purgatory space in every world? Roy asked. Not necessarily. Vulgrim shook his head. Only in some high magic worlds will there be more space bubbles, which will cause the emergence of the purgatory spaces. In some low magic worlds, the main material world might only have one space bubble. Therefore, it's impossible for a purgatory space to appear. We rift demons like to live in these purgatory spaces the most, and I, Vulgrim, am the demon that is the best at digging paths in the purgatory spaces. Humph, bragging on your own. After hearing this, Julia wanted to mock him, but she then remembered that they were in the purgatory space, which was Vulgrim's territory. If she angered this guy and was tricked by him, it would be troublesome, so she could only swallow her words. Roy thought of this as well. So even though he was talking to Vulgrim, he was actually secretly guarding against him. Fortunately, Vulgrim did not mind at all and did not have any evil intentions. After a while, he suddenly pointed to the right. Ah, found her. Roy looked in the direction of his finger. As expected, a scene appeared in the void in front of him, seemingly like a projected movie screen. In the scene, a woman with magenta hair and armor was fighting a huge humanoid bird with a cane inside a building. This woman in armor held a long whip in her hand. This whip was like a living viper, and it was brimming with powerful magic power. As she flew, she continuously lashed at the huge strange bird, making it scream. Every time the strange bird fought back, she would avoid it with her agile movements. This lady was Fury of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Very formidable combat skills. After observing in the purgatory space for a while, Julia suddenly evaluated solemnly. Although this horseman doesn't have a large amount of magic power and strength, her combat skills are extraordinary. I can see that she has experienced many battles, so she has extremely rich experience and would be a very tough opponent. Roy was also observing the battle between Fury and the huge strange bird. Of course, Roy agreed with Julia's evaluation, but at the same time, Roy knew that the true strength of the four horsemen of the apocalypse laid in their infinite potential. Because the four horsemen of the apocalypse had the combined angel and demon bloodline, they could actually strengthen themselves by extracting souls. The more battles they experienced, the stronger they became. After watching for a while, Roy suddenly turned his head and asked Vulgrim, Will she find us? That's impossible. Unless she also has spatial powers. Vulgrim said. In other words, can you observe anyone's battles or actions as you please in these purgatory spaces? Roy asked. Of course not. It needs to just happen to be on the paths of the serpent holes. Vulgrim quickly explained. Moreover, sometimes powerful magic power can affect the purgatory spaces. I know what you want to ask. If I really can see everything and know any secret, do you think those demon kings would tolerate us rift demons? I'm just a humble merchant, and I'm unwilling to do things that can cause my death. Roy looked at Vulgrim, who maintained his cautious and flattering expression. After a while, Roy said, Okay. After entering this purgatory space, Roy realized a problem. Had this fellow also secretly observed him for a while? Roy felt that if this fellow really dared to spy on him, he would definitely beat him to death. Perhaps many demons hated this guy because of this. He turned his attention back to the horseman Fury. After a while, the battle over on Fury's side ended, 
and she knocked down the huge strange bird. She seemed to obtain a strange talisman from this bird, and while holding this talisman, she actually turned the huge strange bird into countless light rays and sucked it into the talisman. That strange bird she beat seems to be called Envy. Vulgrim said from beside him. That seems to be one of the seven deadly sins that Fury is looking for. What are the seven deadly sins? They don't look like demons. Roy asked. I'm not too sure about the specifics. Vulgrim spread his hands. Although they don't have the aura of demons from the abyss, they have the power of strong negative emotions. Moreover, judging from their strength, they're only at the high rank demon level. Logically speaking, this power should be the power that only the seven deadly sin demon kings possess. It's really difficult to understand. Okay, open the exit. I'm going out. Roy did not probe further. Are you sure? Vulgrim asked. She's just experienced a battle. At this time, her guard against a demon appearing will definitely be very high. Perhaps she'll attack you as soon as you appear. As I said, she has a terrible temper and is very difficult to deal with. Open it. Roy nodded. Vulgrim did not say anything else and raised his arm. The distorted and blurry scene around them gradually became real. At Roy's and Julia's feet, the ground appeared again, and the surrounding scenery appeared as well. This meant that they had unknowingly emerged from the purgatory space. And appeared right in front of Fury. Facing the sudden appearance of Roy and Julia, Fury was first startled but quickly calmed down. She stood on the spot with her hands on her hips and a whip in her hand. Well, look at this. The combination of a demon and a fallen angel is really rare. Hello. Are you also one of the seven deadly sins? Chapter 160 I am a demon, I don't need feelings. To be honest, Roy was under a lot of mental pressure facing a horseman of the apocalypse. When he first came to this world, he was still a middle rank demon, so he did not dare to meet War, one of the horsemen, and had avoided him early. Now, Roy had become a high rank demon. Although his strength had risen another level, he was still unable to deal with the horsemen of the apocalypse. Take death the leader of the horsemen of the apocalypse, as an example. He had easily killed many demon lords and fought against demon king Samael at his peak. As the only female among the four horsemen, Fury was not a pushover. Although her overall strength could not match up to death, it was obvious that even if Roy and Julia, two high rank demons, worked together, they would not be her opponent. Therefore, Roy was not stupid enough to fight Fury. He waved his hand. Don't worry, horsemen. I have nothing to do with the seven deadly sins. In fact, I'm only here to make a deal with you. Oh? What kind of deal? Fury placed her hands on her hips. What do you want from me? A. Secret. Roy spread his hands. Well, maybe it's not a secret. After all, this so-called secret may be something that all four horsemen, or all the Nephilim, know. Huh? Fury frowned slightly. Her intuition told her that this demon in front of her seemed really different. Roy ignored her expression and continued, in exchange, I will use an equivalent secret. I can guarantee that this secret is definitely worth it to you. Fury walked around Roy, carefully sizing him up, and also looked at Julia, who was standing beside Roy. Julia stared at Fury with caution. On the other hand, Roy was calm and let her examine him. As for Vulgrim, he was hiding in the purgatory space and did not appear because he did not know what Roy wanted to do with the horsemen. It would be bad if they fought. If he appeared together, he might be affected, so the timid Vulgrim only dared to listen quietly in the alternate space. After circling around, Fury stopped. A watcher from the Charred Council was floating beside her. On the strange face, several pairs of eyes were also staring at Roy, but she did not speak. What do you want? Fury said. Demon, say it. I hate it when people keep me in suspense. Roy smiled slightly, stretched out his arm, and pulled Julia against him. He hugged her in his embrace and said, I want to have a descendant of this woman. But as you've seen, I am a demon, and she is a fallen angel, so I really want to know what must be done to be able to give birth to descendants like you Nephilim. Dumbfounded. Julia, who was being held in Roy's arms, was completely dumbfounded when she heard this. Since Roy had not mentioned anything before, Julia had always been quite curious about why Roy wanted to find the horsemen of the apocalypse. She remembered very clearly that when Roy escaped from the main battlefield, he planned to avoid war, and other horsemen. For this matter, she had even regarded Roy as a deserter and wanted to fulfill her responsibility as a barrier troop. Unexpectedly, he took the initiative to find another horseman, and it was actually four. In essence, fallen angels were still angels. She and demons were two different species, so from the beginning, 
Julia only felt that Roy was slightly different from other demons. In addition, Roy had saved her once, so she felt that Roy could be trusted and never had any other thoughts about Roy. So when she suddenly heard Roy say that he wanted to have a descendant with her, her first thought was that it was absurd. The kind of absurd thought of I treat you as a friend, and you actually want to sleep with me? You. You. Being hugged by Roy, Julia raised her head and stared at him, not knowing what to say. Finally, she reacted and said, How can you do this? We have no feelings between us. Angels had more contact with humans than denoms, so they were more accustomed to human behavior. When they procreated, they would consider emotional factors. Julia was a fallen angel. Although her past memories were gone, she was exactly the same as an angel on this point. In the end, Roy said coldly, I'm a demon. Why do I need feelings? Just do it. What he said was so reasonable that Julia did not know how to refute him. She had stayed in the abyss and witnessed how demons reproduced. In the past, she had merely watched with cold eyes, thinking that she might have to follow Samael for the rest of her life and that this kind of thing would not happen for her. But she did not expect it to appear before her so suddenly now. Therefore, she could only stare at Roy blankly without saying anything, her mind in a mess. What she did not know was that Roy had brought her to find the horsemen of the apocalypse for this very reason. He needed a perfect excuse and shield. After all, he was only a high-ranked demon, and looking into creating Nephilim was something that only a demon king like Lilith would do. It seemed too ridiculous. If he said it like this, it would definitely raise the suspicion of the horsemen or other demons, but it was different with Julia. All the demons living in the abyss knew that starting from high-ranked demon, bloodlines were very important. Now that Roy was a high-ranked demon, it was reasonable for him to want to have a powerful descendant with a fallen angel. Perhaps in the abyss, there were other high-ranked demons or demon lords that had secretly tried such things. Julia was stupefied. Volgram, who was hiding in the purgatory space, was also shocked. Only Fury became angry after hearing Roy's words. Damned demon! Be careful with your words! Fury raised the whip in her hand and pointed at Roy. I treat what you said as an insult to the Nephilim. It was not surprising that Fury's reaction was so fierce. In fact, the Nephilim had always been very embarrassed about their bloodline. They were bloodthirsty and warlike and possessed great strength. This was not false. But at the same time, because they had two opposing racial bloodlines, they were not welcomed anywhere. Be it angels or demons, they were cursing and mocking the Nephilim. Even though they had human appearances, humans did not think that they were a part of their race. This cursing and mocking were both about discrimination and envy of their powerful strength. This was why demons secretly tried to have offspring with angels. On the surface, demons were cursing this hybrid bloodline, but their worship of strength secretly drove them to try. Roy was currently acting such a role. However, saying this in front of a Nephilim was disrespectful, so it was no wonder why Fury reacted so intensely. After all, perhaps the curse of angels and demons really came into effect. The Nephilim always had tragic fates. The four horsemen of the apocalypse also could not escape, and they had killed their own people with their own hands. From now on, there were only four of them left, and they even carried the infamy of being traitors over this. Although they had great strength, they had been reduced to becoming tools of the Charred Council, being thugs for it. Seeing that Fury was about to attack, Roy was not flustered at all and said to her, Don't be so hasty. I really have no intention of offending you, horsemen. Also, don't you want to hear what secret I'll tell you in exchange? Okay, go ahead. Fury resisted her urge to attack and replied, If the secret you want to tell me is just some trivial scam, then I will personally take off your head and cut that fellow below you into pieces. At that time, I'll see how you can create a descendant with this fallen angel. Damn, so cruel? Roy broke out in cold sweat. However, he did not show it at all. What I want to talk about is a secret about the end. A secret about the end? Fury was stunned for a moment before she flew into a rage. What the hell is this topic? Horseman, you didn't hear wrongly. The end. Roy let go of Julia. A secret about the end of all things in the infinite worlds. This world, the heaven world where the angels are, the alternate space where the white city is, the black stone alternate space where demon King Samael is, and even the worlds where all the ancient races live will welcome the end. The Charred Council and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse have been working to maintain the balance but it's useless and futile. Hearing Roy's words, Fury became a little serious, but she still pretended to be disdainful. Are you talking about this end war? How ridiculous, what kind of end is this? No, I'm not talking about the end war. Roy shook his head, 
pointed his finger at the ground, and strengthened his tone. I'm talking about the power you call deprivation. Horseman, you must understand the meaning of this word, right? At this moment, not only did Julia cover her mouth in surprise, but even Fury's face finally changed. Without a doubt, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, who listened to the orders of the Charred Council and maintained the balance in various worlds, had definitely heard of the word deprivation. It was the same for Fury. In fact, she had noticed long ago that many ancient races of the past had disappeared in the long river of time over the years. In the beginning, Fury did not pay much attention to it, thinking that this was caused by the natural law of the survival of the fittest. But then she discovered that not only did these ancient races disappear, but even the space and the world they lived in had also disappeared. When she killed some demons and angels, she had vaguely heard these enemies mention the word deprivation and gradually realized that this seemed to be a very terrifying power. However, this did not attract too much of Fury's attention. After all, she had not seen with her own eyes what deprivation was. But after hearing this word from Roy, she had to take it seriously because she felt that what this demon said might be true. Tell me everything you know, demon. Fury said to Roy. Roy smiled. Let's agree first. If I say it, it means that the deal has been reached. Do you agree? Fury thought for a while before finally nodding. Okay. I accept this deal. Tell me all the secrets that you know about deprivation. In return, I will tell you the secrets about the birth of the Nephilim. Good. Then come and sign this contract. Roy said as a demon contract appeared in front of Fury. It seems like the credibility of the horsemen of the apocalypse isn't worth anything in your eyes. Fury mocked Roy. I can't defeat you, so I can only guarantee it with a contract. Roy was not annoyed. Fury read the content of the contract carefully and found nothing wrong, so she quickly placed her hand on it and signed her name. Seeing that the contract was established, Roy was very satisfied, so he finally opened his mouth to say, the deprivation mentioned in this world actually has another name in other worlds, the Void. And all this must start from a place called the Pantheon. Next, Great Duper Roy began to tell Fury about the biography of a character known as Sargeras. Chapter 161 Actually, I am from the Burning Legion. In fact, before seeing Fury, Roy had been thinking about how to deal with these horsemen of the apocalypse and what topics to attract their interest. Since the four horsemen of the apocalypse were siblings, he had thought about using the topic to the imprisoned war in the beginning. He believed that the other horsemen would definitely take the matter of war being framed seriously. However, Roy could not explain his source of information. Leaking plots was not something that could be done at any time. Moreover, the matter of war being framed was full of all sorts of suspicious points. Not only did it involve the Charred Council, but it might also involve the schemes and arrangements of demon kings like Samael or Lilith, so he could not touch it easily. Roy would be in trouble if he did not handle it well. However, while chatting with Julia, the situation of Samael's demon king city, the Black Stone Throne, gave Roy inspiration. The deprivation power that could devour everything and decay life was very similar to the void power in the Warcraft world. This made Roy suspect that void power might be corroding the Darksiders world. Therefore, he simply decided to bring up this topic while facing fury and applied what he knew about the void power of the Warcraft world to this deprivation power. True Titans come from the souls of planets. And these so-called world souls are the life consciousnesses of the planets. When these nascent world souls awaken, they become titans. Roy sat on the ground and faced fury. It is said that the Pantheon was built by the first awakened titan, Amanthil. After waking up, he traveled through countless worlds to search for planets with world souls and then awaken his people. These naturally benevolent beings were born in harmony with order and stability, and they have innate affinity with the magic powers hidden in the universe. They are fully aware that their power is too great so they abide by the creed of gentleness when facing all the civilizations they encounter. Is that so? Turns out there are existences outside of this world like the Charred Council that uphold the will of the Creator and maintain the balance of the universe. Fury sat down, sitting cross-legged opposite Roy, listening to his story. Roy smiled at her words. Don't worry. I'm not done yet. In the Pantheon, there is a great titan named Sargeras. He is the strongest warrior of the Pantheon, the defender of the Pantheon and the noblest of the gods. He has an unparalleled and magnificent body that is the size of a planet, and he is unwavering faith, noble qualities, and strength and courage that no other can match. Entrusted by the Pantheon, he went to hunt down demons in the depths of the twisting nether and swore to cleanse the universe of all demons. Such a powerful titan is dealing with you demons? 
Fury laughed as he pointed at Roy. It seems like your demon world is about to end. No. When I was summoned to that world, this great titan, Sargeras, had fallen and become the Dark Titan. Roy crossed his arms and sneered. On the contrary, Sargeras destroyed the pantheon created by a Manthil. He also killed all the titans. Nonsense. Fury glared, suddenly stood up, and pointed at Roy's nose. I can tell that what you said is all nonsense. Humph. Although I'm a demon, I'm not lying. Roy retorted. Otherwise, how do you think I could still come back alive from that world? Don't interrupt. Listen to me, and you'll understand what's going on. Okay. I'll listen to your nonsense story and see how far it can go. Fury sat down again. Roy made up a story here. He said that he had been to the Warcraft world before and described it as though he had experienced it personally. Both Fury and the others knew that demons of the Abyss could go to millions of worlds through the gates of the Abyss, so despite Fury having some doubts, she accepted this as true. Moreover, Roy's tone of storytelling was full of emotions. Now, not only was Fury attracted to his story, but even Volgrim, who was hiding in the purgatory space, and the Watcher from the Council beside Fury were also attracted. When I was summoned from the Abyss to that world, what I entered was not the main material world. Roy said. But summoned to a place called the Twisting Nether, a realm of endless darkness, turbulence, chaos, and distortions. There, apart from the demons of the Abyss, there were also creatures known as Void Demons. They have the same savage appearances as that of the Abyss Demons, but they are not creatures of the Abyss but transformed from the erosion of Void Power. In the Twisting Nether, countless demons formed an incomparably large army. This army is called the Burning Legion. And the leader of the Burning Legion is the Dark Titan Sargeras. Roy continued to deceive her without changing expression. I stayed there for a while and became a member of the Burning Legion. From the mouths of other demons, I heard many rumors, including the origin of the Dark Titan Sargeras. Sargeras was originally entrusted by the Pantheon to go deep into the Twisting Nether to eliminate the demons there to prevent them from destroying worlds and interfering with the plans of the Titans to awaken world souls. However, when Sargeras went deep into the Nether, he discovered the truth about the origin of the Twisting Nether in a dark and withered world. The Void is the opposite of all things. If the Creator is the Creator of all things, then the Void is the Destroyer of all things. This power is the enemy of the Creator. Roy said solemnly. A group of terrifying creatures was born in the Void. These Void creatures are the Void Lords. They use the Cold Void power to attempt to corrupt any world that house slumbering world souls. Sargeras realized that once the power of the Void successfully corrupted a nascent Titan, it would awaken into an indescribable dark creature. All things of the universe, and even the entire Pantheon, would be powerless to resist it. At that time, the distorted Titan would consume all the matter and energy in the universe, causing everything that exists to submit to the will of the Void Lords. Sargeras, this invincible champion of the Titans, tasted fear for the first time in his life. He suddenly realized that the Void Lords were searching for world souls like the Pantheon. Moreover, Sargeras had never thought that Void Energy could corrode slumbering titans so thoroughly. In his fear and anger, he raised his blade high and cut the world in front of him completely, destroying this world and killing the nascent titan. After this battle, he realized that the only way to stop Void Power was to destroy the worlds in advance. However, when he returned to the Pantheon to report all of this, his people did not believe him. They had not witnessed the horrors of the Void Lords with their own eyes, and they could not understand the despair in Sargeras' heart. Instead, they rebuked Sargeras for his reckless action. Even though Sargeras tried his best to convince them of the necessity of what he did, he finally realized that it was all in vain. Regarding how to deal with the threat of the Void Lords, the argument between Sargeras and the other members of the Pantheon was exceptionally fierce. What was most worrying for Sargeras was that since Void Power could corrupt a world soul, it might be able to corrupt more, and it was probably too late to stop them. Therefore, the deep despair and disappointment crushed Sargeras. He left angrily and parted ways with the Pantheon. He believed that his compatriots would never be able to come to see the truth, and if they had no intention of helping him eliminate the corruption of the Void Lords, then he would do it alone. Sargeras felt that he needed an army that he could control to fight against the Void Lords. He thought of the demons, so he returned to the Twisting Nether and used the massive dark energy and evil energy here to become the Dark Titan. He gathered all the demons and led them to destroy the worlds that had world souls and might be corrupted by void power. The Dark Titan deeply realized that only by burning everything could he have hope of stopping the Void Lord's ultimate goal. Roy did not elaborate on the matters about Sargeras in detail, only describing them briefly, 
because these events might have gone through millions of years of history in the Warcraft world. And it was not something that he could explain with just a few words. But even so, after listening to Roy's story, Fury and Julia could not help but sink into deep thought. In Fury's opinion, Roy's story did not seem to be made up. If he made it up, there would definitely be many loopholes. Moreover, the names such as the Burning Legion, the Pantheon, Titans, and World Souls did not sound like they were made up on the spot. Is the power of the Void really that terrifying? Fury frowned and asked. It's so terrifying that even such a great Titan would feel desperate enough to do the opposite, turning from a protector to a destroyer? I don't know. Roy shook his head. After all, I didn't stay in that world for long. There were too many powerful forces in that world. At that time, I wasn't even cannon fodder among the demons, so I was lucky enough to survive and figured out a way to return to the Abyss. I have not come into contact with true void power, so I can't answer your question. I only know that there were many planets destroyed and ended in that world. In fact, when I came to this world, I didn't pay much attention to it. But after coming into contact with Julia, I heard the word deprivation from her. After hearing her description of it, I realized that the deprivation she mentioned was actually so similar to void power. Fury raised his head and looked at Julia, who had just recovered from her shock. She quickly nodded and said to Fury, I can confirm, horseman, that what Osiris said is true. I told him about the abnormal appearance of Lord Samael's Black Stone. I don't know if you've been to the Black Stone, but it's indeed on the verge of collapse. Perhaps this power really is the same power as the Void. Hearing this, Roy could not help but praise Julia in his heart. Her assistance was spot on. Chapter 162 Fishing is something that requires patience. Fury fell into deep thought again. She stared at Roy's eyes while various thoughts went through her mind. Roy looked at her calmly. In fact, Roy's words could not count as completely lying. What he said about the Void was indeed true. He was just taking the matters of another world and mentioning it in this world, causing Fury not to have the ability to verify the authenticity of his words. Void power was too similar to the deprivation power that Julia mentioned, so even Roy himself suspected that it was really void power. Fury's hesitation laid in this. Although she had only indirectly come into contact with some vague information about deprivation, some things immediately became clear after corroborating with Roy's words. She could now say that she had mostly believed Roy's words. So, did the Dark Titan Sargeras succeed? Fury suddenly asked Roy after a while. Did he succeed in preventing the corruption brought about by the Void? I don't know. Roy shook his head. Although the worlds he destroyed did indeed reduce the corruption of the Void power, and it can be said that he stopped the spread and growth of the Void, it may also weaken the powers that resist the Void. No one knows whether his actions are ultimately right or wrong. The outcome is impossible to know until the very last moment. Is that so? Roy's words dispelled the last traces of Fury's doubts. Earlier, she had always felt that Roy was using the deeds of the fallen Dark Titan Sargeras to tempt her into falling. After all, such a powerful and magnificent warrior had joined the demon camp. The power of this example was truly very powerful, but Roy's final words did not show any intention of promoting the demon's achievements. Instead, his evaluation of Sargeras was very objective, causing Fury to dispel her final doubts immediately. Very good. Fury stood up. I have to admit that the information you brought is truly very valuable. I will find a way to verify what you said. How will you verify it? Go to those corroded spaces? Roy asked. Of course, I have to see it with my own eyes. Fury said. Hearing this, the watcher beside her became anxious and quickly said, Mistress, don't forget your mission. Unlike the watcher the council sent to monitor war in the future, this watcher beside Fury seemed to be always cautious and followed Fury's lead. But when she spoke, Fury grabbed her neck and shouted at her, Shut up! If what this demon said is true, then the balance that the four horsemen are trying to maintain is meaningless. When the entire world is being devoured by the void, what balance is needed? What she said was indeed true. Although Fury was hot-tempered, she was still a horseman of the apocalypse, so she naturally knew what was important. The Watcher was unwilling to give up. But if you disobey the order of the Council and don't pursue the seven deadly sins but leave the human world and go to another world without permission, aren't you afraid of attracting the punishment of the Council? Don't forget that the horsemen of the apocalypse are loyal to the Council. How can you put yourself into a disadvantageous situation just because of the wards of a demon? Who knows if they're true or false? That's easy. Fury raised her head and said to Roy, Demon, your name is Osiris, right? Now, I hire you to help me solve the seven deadly sins. Afterward, 
I'll come back to find you and bring them back to the council to report. How about that? Not to mention the Watcher, even Roy was in disbelief. Are you sure this will work? Of course. Fury placed her hands on her hips. The council only made me in charge of hunting down the seven deadly sins, but it didn't say that I had to take action. There's nothing wrong with this logic. However, Roy still did not dare to take it lightly. The seven deadly sins sound like they belong to the demon camp. You actually want me, a demon, to hunt them down? Don't worry. The seven deadly sins aren't real demons. Fury said. They're just a group of prisoners, the extreme representations of negative emotions. They don't have real bodies to begin with. After escaping, they'll possess the bodies of other creatures to obtain physical forms. You only need to kill their physical forms to capture them. With that, Fury threw a skull-shaped talisman at Roy. She had taken it from the huge strange bird she killed. After Roy caught it, Fury said, This is the talisman of sin. It seems to be some kind of vessel that can resonate with the seven deadly sins. That Envy fellow used it to interconnect powers with the other seven deadly sins, but he's now sealed inside. You only need to find the other seven deadly sins. Seeing Roy wanting to speak, Fury shook her finger first. Don't reject me. If you still want to know the secrets of the Nephilim, you'd better do as I say. I'll carry out the contract, but I have to leave first to verify what you said. If what you said is true, then when I return, I'll fulfill the contract and tell you the secrets of the Nephilim that I know. But if I'm caught up in the matter of the seven deadly sins, you'll have to wait a long time. You really understand the demon contract well. Roy had no choice now. It was not that Fury did not intend to carry out the contract, but that she planned to wait until she verified what he said was true before fulfilling it. Roy could not refute such an excuse. After thinking about it, Roy said, It's not impossible to help you hunt down the seven deadly sins, but this is another deal, right? What can I get? Let's do it this way. Fury thought for a moment and said, Since I'm hiring you, I can pay you with souls. If you can give me all the seven deadly sins after I come back, I will pay you a million souls. A million? Roy sized her up. Do you have so many souls? Don't underestimate the wealth of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Fury said proudly. I've served the charred council for thousands of years and killed countless enemies. I still have these savings. Roy was doubtful and asked, What if you can't come back? What do you mean? Are you looking down on me? Fury was immediately annoyed. No, no, no. What I mean is, what if the council captures you? Roy said while looking at the watcher. Then you can eat the souls of the seven deadly sins. Fury waved his hand, seemingly unconcerned. When the watcher heard this, she immediately screamed, Mistress, how can you? However, Fury was just this capricious and only replied, I call the shots. Then she turned around and left. Among the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Fury was the only woman. But at the same time, she had the worst temper and was the most unpredictable. In fact, she only came to the human world to hunt down the seven deadly sins after negotiating conditions with the council. She did things so willfully that even the charred council had a headache over her. Seeing Fury turn around and leave, the watcher stopped and did not follow her immediately. Instead, she flew in front of Roy and pointed at him. Damn demon, do you know what you did? Hand over the talisman of sin quickly. Because of your lies and deception, the mistress will. However, before she could finish speaking, Roy suddenly stretched out his claw, pinched the watcher's head, and then lightly squeezed the watcher until she screamed. Roy put her in front of him and sneered at the watcher. Your power can restrain the horseman, but I'm not the target of your surveillance. Your power is useless against me, so. Who gave you the courage to shout at me? Let go. Let go of me. The Watcher's head was pinched by Roy, and her lower body was shaking around, wanting to break free. She shouted, I'm from the Charred Council, Demon. How dare you treat me like this? Aren't you afraid of the Council's punishment? Do you think I'll be afraid? Roy asked. Get this straight. I'm a demon, and I've always been an enemy of the Council. Even if I kill you here, do you think the Council would specially come to trouble me for a mere Watcher like you? Of. Of course. The Watcher struggled with all her might and said unwillingly, even without fury, there are still three other four horsemen of the Apocalypse. But the problem is that the other four horsemen of the Apocalypse can even take care of themselves currently, right? Roy grinned sinisterly. It seems a Watcher like you hasn't figured out the current situation of the Council yet. Roy was indeed fearless now because, according to his guess, Demon King Samael was probably plotting against the Charred Council. 
Through various events, he seemed to be planning to make the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the charred council turn against each other, thus dismantling the largest force of the council. According to Roy's impression, Samael might have done it in the end. At the very least, War betrayed the charred council after he reappeared a hundred years later. Moreover, Roy had successfully got Fury to leave the human world through the topic of the Void's corrosion. What was certain was that if Fury went to other alternate spaces to search for deprivation, the charred council might punish her. With Fury's personality, this punishment would undoubtedly be counterproductive. Although killing the angel Uriel had changed the plot of this world, Roy was not worried at all. He only needed to follow the general trend, and this trend was nothing more than the rebellion of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and the collapse of the Charred Council. This way, not only would it not interfere with the plans of Demon King Samael and Lilith, but it might even accelerate the process. After all, Roy was a demon from the Abyss. To him, Samael and Lilith were the true bosses. What he did was fine as long as it did not affect these two big shots. As for other angels or the Charred Council, Roy could not be bothered to care about what they thought. Just as Roy was thinking about whether he should help Fury kill this Watcher, Julia suddenly reminded him, the Talisman of Sin. Seems to be glowing. Roy lowered his head to look at the Talisman of Sin in his other hand. Sure enough, this Talisman was currently emitting a faint light. Since the Talisman of Sin itself had a dim light, this additional light could not be seen without looking closely. Roy was puzzled and waved the Talisman twice. Then he discovered a strange phenomenon. The closer the Talisman was to the Watcher, the brighter the light. Roy looked at the talisman, then at the watcher, and suddenly realized. Ha! What an incredible discovery! Roy said to the watcher. Why does this talisman of sin emit such a faint light when it approaches you? Could it be that? You accidentally borrowed a little bit of power through this talisman while struggling? Are you also? One of the seven deadly sins? Chapter 163 Not Telling W What nonsense are you saying? Although she said this, anyone could feel the unconscious trembling in the Watcher's voice. This was the first instinctive reaction from the body when a secret was exposed. Roy pinched the Watcher's head. He was so close to her that he naturally felt it very clearly, so he increasingly confirmed his guess. He swayed his tail slightly as he picked up the talisman of sin in his hand and continued to speculate. Hmm, let's think back and see. When Fury threw this thing to me just now, she said that this talisman was on Envy's body after she killed it. She said that this thing could allow Envy to interconnect powers with the other seven deadly sins. But then the question arises, why should Envy interconnect powers with the other seven deadly sins? Julia could not help but ask, yes, why? There's only one possibility. Roy turned to Julia. That Envy was simply a fake. The so-called interconnecting powers is basically fake. The true function of this talisman is to steal powers without permission from the other seven deadly sins and then use it to disguise herself. Hearing this, Julia suddenly came to a realization. I understand. If the strange bird that Fury defeated was really one of the seven deadly sins, then it should have been powerful. There's no reason for it to borrow other powers through the talisman. That's right. Roy nodded in approval. And it's very easy to verify this. As long as we find the other seven deadly sins and see if they have the same talisman of sin, we'll understand. If there's a talisman, my speculation is wrong. But if the other seven deadly sins don't have one, and only that strange bird had it, that proves there's a problem. Roy looked at the watcher pinched in his hand with a teasing expression. Am I right? The true deadly sin envy. Julia looked at Roy in surprise and then at the watcher in his hand, who had stopped struggling. She said in disbelief, you're saying that she's the real envy? The watcher sent by the charred council to a horseman of the apocalypse is actually one of the seven deadly sins? What? What is it trying to do? I'll have to ask her. Roy grinned and said to the Watcher, Why are you still pretending? I suppose I'll have to bring you to find the other seven deadly sins to verify it. As soon as he finished speaking, the Watcher suddenly said, No need. There's no talisman of sin among the other seven deadly sins. These words undoubtedly admitted that Roy's speculation was right. However, after her identity was exposed, the Watcher did not panic at all. Although Roy was still pinching her, she said calmly, So, demon, what do you plan to do with me? Will you seal me into the talisman? While saying this, the Watcher quietly mobilized her magic power and prepared to fight Roy and Julia. She really did not expect this demon in front of her to be so sharp. He could deduce so much with just a little flaw. Fury's carefree personality, coupled with her preconceived mentality, caused her to be deceived and not doubt the authenticity of envy. 
But now, a demon found out. This was seriously. The original intention of the Watcher was to take back the talisman of sin that Fury had given Roy. It was something very important to her, but instead of taking it back, she was exposed by Roy. The Watcher greatly regretted it. If she had known earlier, why would she have stayed behind alone? Why not leave with Fury first? However, just as the Watcher, or rather the true Envy, was about to fight with all her might, Roy suddenly loosened his hand and let go of her. Huh? W what's the meaning of this? The Watcher was dumbfounded. She floated in the air and looked at Roy in astonishment, not knowing what he was up to. I'm in a good mood now, and I don't want to kill you. Roy stretched his claws and flashed a sinister grin at the Watcher. So, you can get lost now. Hearing this, let alone the Watcher, even Julia was dumbfounded. She tugged at Roy's wings and said anxiously, Osiris. What the hell are you doing? Didn't you agree to help Fury capture the seven deadly sins? That's a million souls. Now that one of the seven deadly sins is here, you actually want to let her go? What seven deadly sins? I don't see any. Roy calmly held his demon horns with both hands and stroked them up along the horns. This action was just like styling his hair back when he had hair, making Roy feel extremely comfortable. You don't see any? Isn't she right in front of you? Julia had yet to react and still argued. Nonsense. Roy could not help glaring at her. Didn't Fury kill Envy? How can she not be sure about this? We're going to catch the other six. Ah. Uh, Julia was stunned. She finally realized that something was wrong. Although she still did not understand, she cleverly shut her mouth and did not say anything else. After settling Julia, Roy turned to look at the Watcher and said in a threatening tone, Aren't you going to get lost? I'm just giving the council behind you some face. Do you really think I don't dare to kill you? The Watcher looked at Roy suspiciously. She did not understand why Roy, who had already discovered her true identity, still let her go. But she was not a fool. Since Roy had made it so clear, why should she continue to stay here? So she turned around and quickly floated to chase after Fury, who had already left. After she left, Julia asked Roy curiously, What do you want to do? I don't want to do anything. Roy stretched his body, bones, and wings, making cracking sounds. If I want to exchange for a million souls from Fury, I only need seven souls in the talisman when I finally give it to her. As for whether or not one of them is wrong, it's not my problem, but Fury's problem. Hearing this, Julia nodded, seeming to understand. She could feel that Roy seemed to be plotting something, but it was a little hazy to her, and she could not see it thoroughly, so she could only suppress her doubts for the time being. Only when Roy and Julia were left at the scene did the timid Vulgrim finally emerge from the purgatory space. He had witnessed everything that had happened, but just like Julia, Volgrim could not guess what Roy was thinking. But this profiteer was smart enough. He had always been adhering to the principle of not caring about things that he should not care about, so he said to Roy flatteringly, Your Excellency Osiris, congratulations on making a big deal. One million souls. Even I have to work for several years to obtain so many souls through trading. All right. You'll benefit when the time comes. Roy waved at him and said meaningfully, Early birds might not necessarily have worms to eat, but smart birds will definitely be able to eat them. Do you understand what I mean? Of course. Vulgrim replied while reaching out his hand to make a zipping motion over his mouth. Very good. Let's go and find the other seven deadly sins. Roy spread his wings and flew up, and Julia hurriedly followed behind. As for Vulgrim, he returned to the purgatory space and disappeared. He would not follow when fighting was needed. On another side, the Watcher quickly caught up to Fury. Seeing her appear, Fury asked her, Where did you go just now? The Watcher explained quietly, I stayed behind and secretly looked at the demon named Osiris. He stayed there for a while before leaving. He probably went to look for the remaining seven deadly sins according to your instructions. Honorable Mistress, do you truly feel assured in trusting the mission to him? The Watcher lied, but Fury did not know this. It was said that personality determined fate. Fury's bad temper and negligent personality made her not doubt the Watcher, who had always been respectful. Fury smiled confidently. Humph. Although that guy is a high-ranked demon, and his strength is enough to deal with the seven deadly sins. Don't think I don't know what he's thinking. Huh? The Watcher was stunned for a moment before hurriedly asking, Honorable Mistress, you guessed his plan? Of course. Fury said with certainty. What he said earlier about using the secrets of void power to exchange for the secrets of us Nephilim and that he wants to have a powerful descendant with that fallen angel was all false. His true goal is probably to find a way to promote to demon lord. 
Is. Is that so? The watcher did not know how to respond. I've been dealing with demons for many years. Fury said. That's why I'm very clear about the thoughts of these demons. There are so many high rank demons from the abyss of hell, and every one of them is trying to find a way to promote to demon lord. But only a few lucky ones can advance to become demon lords. Talent and luck are indispensable. But since he can think of seeking the secrets of the Nephilim to help his promotion, he's a clever demon. Then, will you agree to his terms? The Watcher asked carefully. Of course. Fury nodded. As long as I can verify that what he said is true, I will fulfill my part. After all, that guy signed a demon contract with me. I think it's better for you to reconsider. The Watcher said. It won't be good if there's another lord level figure among the demons. However, Fury glared at her after hearing this. Do you think I'll be afraid? No, that's not what I meant. The Watcher quickly waved her hands in denial. Mistress, you're so powerful, so how could you be afraid of a demon lord? Fury was finally satisfied. Okay, you don't have to say any more about this. Anyway, even if he obtains the secrets to the birth of the Nephilim, he might not necessarily be able to use them. Now, I need to find an entrance to an alternate space and then go and see my eldest brother, Death, who has no news and traces. I'm certain that he must be thinking of a way to save war. Although I don't like him very much, I think he's probably the only one among the four horsemen who can truly come into contact with deprivation. Chapter 164 Find Something to Do When You're Bored Not only were Fury and the Watcher talking about demon lords, but Roy and Julia were also talking about this topic. When she and Roy were alone, Julia immediately became a curious baby. She flew behind Roy and kept asking him questions. In that world you've been to, are there really such powerful titan creatures? How is their strength compared to His Majesty Samael? Have you seen that Sargeras? What does he look like after he became the Dark Titan? Does he have his original titan appearance, or has he become a demon? Did you ask the Horsemen of the Apocalypse about the Nephilim because you wanted to obtain a way to fuse angel and demon bloodlines? Then. Why won't you go with me to find Mother Lilith? Shouldn't she be the one who understands the most? What are you worried about? Is it because of His Majesty Samael's seal? By the way, why did you let go of the real envy just now? Do you want to leave a hidden piece next to the horseman? Julia asked one question after another, making Roy's head hurt. At first, he had the patience to reply with a few words to her. But after being annoyed by her questions, he simply decided not to say anything. However, the more he did not say anything, the more excited Julia became, and she continued asking incessantly. Finally, Roy landed on the ground. Julia also landed and asked curiously, why did you land? Did you find traces of the seven deadly sins? Before Julia finished speaking, a thick tail came, wrapped around her, and then pulled her closer to Roy. Roy growled in annoyance why are you talking so much? Are you really a duck? However, Julia did not understand Roy's words at all because she did not know what a duck was, so she could only say to Roy in a daze, I'm just curious. You told me to follow you, but you didn't tell me anything. Of course, I want to know. Since when did I tell you to follow me? You're following me on your own. Roy said with a headache. Huh, didn't you? Julia was stunned as well. Then she tilted her head and thought carefully about it for a while before realizing that there really did not seem to be anything. She was so embarrassed. After a while, Julia said dejectedly, Then, why am I following you? You're not going to save His Majesty Samael. I say, why are you so determined to save Samael? What are you thinking? Roy could not help but poke her forehead with a finger. You're a four-winged fallen angel and just a high-ranked demon. Samael is a demon king, and he has so many demon lords around him. Even those demon lords haven't thought about saving him, so why does a high-ranked demon like you need to worry about it? Humph. The thoughts of those demon lords are difficult to understand. Julia could not help but snort. Who knows what they're thinking? As soon as His Majesty Samael was sealed, many of them couldn't wait to jump. Out. Isn't that normal? Roy said. The nature of demons is like this. The strong are respected. Since Samael was defeated by the Destroyer, isn't it normal for demons to submit to the Destroyer? In my opinion, you might as well defect too, and don't worry about him all day long. Julia was shocked when she heard that. How could I? Why not? Roy stared at her. Don't you understand? Won't those defectors be afraid of Samael removing the seal and settling scores with them? Wrong. They know, but they still defected. 
This is because if Samael defeats the destroyer after removing the seal, then they will immediately join Samael's side. Moreover, they know very well that Samael won't do anything to them because this is the nature of demons. Is. Is that so? Julia was stunned by Roy's words. After all, she was only a fallen angel who had been transformed and not a true demon born and raised in the abyss. Even though she had stayed by Samael's side for so many years, she still did not understand how true demons thought. On the contrary, Roy saw everything thoroughly because of his demon identity. Furthermore, he had one more thing that he did not say, if all of this truly was one of Samael's plans, then perhaps his so-called ceiling was also a step in his layout. In other words, he had deliberately lost to the destroyer. Why did he do this? Roy did not understand too well. He only vaguely felt that maybe Samael wanted to hide behind the scenes and use this to avoid the attention of the charred council. However, he was the leader of the demons after all. If he just hid like that, the demons, who had lost their leader, might not be able to win the war against angels, so he simply let the destroyer bear the responsibility of being the leader. This way, not only could the demons obtain an advantage in the war with the angels, but he also successfully made the charred council focus its attention on the destroyer. If the council dispatched the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they would only find trouble with the destroyer. He himself could leisurely wait in the sealed place for the plan to be completed step by step. To be honest, the more Roy guessed, the more terrified he felt. The wisdom of these ancient demon king level demons was simply too terrifying. Roy had even speculated using the memories of his previous life, but it was as though he was merely catching a glimpse of the big picture. He could only see some clues but not the overall situation clearly. Roy even wondered if the demon profiteer, Volgram, might be one of Samael's backup plans. If he did not remember wrongly, after War returned to the human world a hundred years later, Volgram was the one who guided War to find Samael's sealed place. And with War's help, Samael finally escaped from the seal. If all of this was just a coincidence, it would be too far-fetched. This was the real reason why Roy resisted Julia's suggestion and did not want to follow her to unseal Samael. Samael did not necessarily want someone to save him. If Julia acted rashly, she might harm herself instead. What Roy did not know was that his speculations and actions had once again changed the future course of this world. If she had not met him, Julia would have indeed tried her best to save Samael. However, when she returned to the place where Samael was sealed and attempted to unseal him, she angered him instead. In the end, Samael killed Julia. A hundred years later, when War descended and found Samael, Samael gave him a pair of fallen angel wings, and this pair of fallen angel wings actually came from Julia. Now, because Julia was following Roy, under his constant brainwashing, the thought of saving Samael had unknowingly faded a lot. Moreover, Roy had not only killed the angel Uriel, but he had also persuaded Fury, who had been ordered to descend into the human world, to leave. It could be said that under his interference, the future trajectory of this world had already left its original course, and no one knew what would happen next. Just as Roy's imagination was running wild, Julia's mind was also wondering. After calming down and thinking about it carefully, she realized that Roy was indeed right. Although she was a personal guard of Samael, she was limited in her strength and status. Regarding some things, she might not necessarily know more than the demon lords. Even the demon lords were being ambiguous about this matter. She was a high-ranked demon-level fallen angel, and it looked like she was really worrying blindly. For a moment, Julia could not help but feel dejected. She felt that her loyalty to Samael was rather laughable. Between demons, there truly was no point in mentioning loyalty. This was their nature. Julia, this fallen angel, had a lot to learn. At this moment, Julia suddenly thought of something, and her face turned slightly red. Lowering her head, she found that Roy's tail was still tightly binding her waist. She subconsciously poked her index fingers against each other and whispered, Um, Osiris, what you said earlier, is it true? Huh? What? Roy returned to his senses but did not understand Julia's words, so he could not help asking, What's true? About. About you wanting to have a descendant with me. Julia's voice became softer and softer. This sentence stunned Roy for a while. Then he looked at Julia's current appearance of lowering her head and playing with her fingers. If he could not realize what was going on, then he really would be an idiot. With a sigh, Roy walked toward a slightly intact building in the ruins ahead. His tail was still wrapping around Julia and hugging her in front of his chest. Compared to Roy's three-meter-tall body, Julia, whom his tail was curling around, looked so petite, but the two looked so well-censored. No need to ask anything. 
just like Roy said before, just do it. After a while, the movements in the ruins stopped. Roy had long removed the cold winter armor, revealing his frost demon blue skin. Julia was the same. Her angelic armor was placed aside, and her petite body was lying on his chest, panting. She traced her fingers along Roy's muscles and asked him curiously, Do you really think we can have descendants? Angels and demons are two different species. In human terms, we seem to have reproductive isolation. I don't know either, Roy said as he used his tail to rub Julia's long legs. It's not impossible to get lucky. Hearing this, Julia could not help but look forward to it. If we have a descendant, what do you think he will be like? Like the Nephilim? Will he be stronger than us? Julia seemed to have entered curious baby mode again and kept asking Roy questions. Annoyed by her questions, Roy turned over, pressing her under him, and used practical actions to gag her mouth. The two stayed like this the entire day, having forgotten about the seven deadly sins. Chapter 165 Julia's Origin Roy had a great time. Indeed, having sex isn't just the sensual experience, but the visual experience is very important as well. Whoever said that it's all the same when the lights are off is talking absolute rubbish. Fuck. Try having the lights off while you're pressing down on a female insect type demon. Compared to the succubi who accepted anyone, Roy found female fallen angels the most suitable. Although Julia's performance was quite amateurish, with Roy having to guide her the entire time, the sense of conquest made it an experience he could never find in succubi. In fact, Roy was a little confused about why Julia would give in so easily. But after thinking about it carefully, he seemed to understand. Regarding fallen angels, if there were no negative thoughts and emotions instilled into them during their transformations, they would not be called fallen angels. For example, killing intent, anger, lust, etc. Are we considered partners now? Julia asked Roy while putting on her armor. Just like the relationship between His Majesty Samael and Mother Lilith? Let's just say yes. Roy replied casually while admiring her movements. After staying in the abyss for such a long time, Roy knew very well that there were no husband and wife relationships between demons. Only high rank demons and above would attach some importance and pay attention to their bloodlines and descendants. Otherwise, they were left to fend for themselves. And this kind of partnership relationship that Julia mentioned existed among demons, but what maintained these relationships was not love, but the powerful force of one party. When it came to life and death, these relationships were not stable, and there were countless cases of demons killing their partners. Clearly, Julie also knew this very well, so she never really thought about wanting to discuss emotions with Roy. This was actually quite good. In the harsh environment of the abyss, no demon dared to guarantee their absolute safety. All their sense of security came from their own strength, so there were no emotional fetters. It was a good thing for demons, and of course, it also applied to fallen angels. Now, Julia did not mention anything about saving Samael. It seemed like she had listened to Roy's advice and planned to wait for Samael's return before returning to be his subordinate. During this time before Samael returned, she could justly follow Roy. After all, she and Roy had already become partners. What do we do next? Julia asked Roy. Are you really planning to help that horseman of the apocalypse hunt down the seven deadly sins? Of course. Roy nodded. I have nothing to do anyway so I have to find something to do. For demons, harvesting souls is one of the joys. Even if I can't get the powerful souls of the seven deadly sins in the end, it's still good to get them and appreciate them in advance. Moreover, I can exchange the souls of the seven deadly sins for a million souls from fury. Even if it takes some effort, it's worth it. Then, how do you plan on finding the seven deadly sins? This world is so big, so who knows where they'll hide? Julia asked. Don't worry. I have this. Roy flipped his palm, and a small eyeball with demon wings appeared in it. This was the demon eye that Roy had created in the Pirates of the Caribbean world. It integrated the combination of invisibility and teleportation. And Roy did not need to control it personally, so it was perfect for searching for people and things. The cost of creating demon eyes was not high, so Roy simply created hundreds of demon eyes in one go. Then he scattered them with his hands, and these hundreds of demon eyes spread out like a group of bats. These demon eyes would go invisible after leaving and report suspicious situations that they discovered to Roy. At that time, Roy only needed to judge the situation to find the traces of the seven deadly sins. After all, Roy did not believe that the seven deadly sins would hide and do nothing after escaping from the Chard Council. They're quite convenient. Julia looked at the shape of the demon eyes and roughly understood what they were for. But you're a frost demon, 
So why do you have this kind of summoning spell? There are many things you don't know. Roy could not be bothered to explain to her. Humph, I am a man with a cheat. No, a demon. While waiting for the demon eyes to report, Roy took out the angel souls that he had obtained from the system space. When he was collecting souls with the soul attracting flag before, Roy obtained mostly human souls, but a small portion of them were the souls of angels that he had killed and taken away. In the system's classification, the souls of low and middle rank demons were the same as the souls of humans. They were ordinary low class souls. Only after reaching high rank demon would they become evil souls. High rank demons, demon lords, and demon kings corresponded to low class, middle class, and high class evil souls respectively. But the souls of low level angels were different. The system displayed low class holy souls from the beginning. Roy guessed that this might be due to the difference between the nature of the souls of angels and demons. It seemed that their souls were full of the holy attribute the moment they were born, and the souls of demons had to gradually acquire the evil attribute as they continuously killed and destroyed. After asking Julia, Roy found that it was indeed the case. He learned from her that angels seemed to be able to use holy attribute magic power once they were born. This might be why angels were stronger than demons individually. Roy currently had about 70 low-class holy souls, all from the angel soldiers he killed. Angels and demons were the same. After death, their souls would return to their resurrection points. But if the opponents were natural enemies, it was often very difficult for souls to escape. Be it angels or demons, when encountering natural enemies, they would try their best to kill the enemies and snatch their souls. It was impossible for them to watch the souls return. Among so many low-class holy souls, only one was completely different Uriel's soul. This soul was very eye-catching in both size and brightness. In the system's display, it was a high-class holy soul. This made Roy feel a little strange. He still remembered that when he traded the angel warrior's soul that he obtained with Vulgrim, it was a middle-class holy soul, and that angel warrior was also at the Dominion angel level. Logically speaking, Uriel was also at the Dominion level, but why was the difference between the two souls so great? After Roy asked this question, he obtained an answer from Julia. Julia told Roy that Uriel was indeed different from other Dominion angels. Not only was she an original angel, but she was also in the process of promoting to a six-winged angel. Once she completed her promotion to throne angel, she would become a true six-winged angel. At that time, her entire body would remove her original flesh and blood and gradually transform into holy light. Precisely because of this, Uriel's soul looked different from other Dominion angels. This transformation is reflected in the wings of angels. Julia explained. After becoming First Order Seraphim, angels have already become pure elemental bodies. Holy Light is their true body, and angels have separated from gender and no longer have distinctions between men and women. That's why in many human legends, the appearance and gender of angels are difficult to distinguish. No wonder. Roy suddenly understood. He recalled the first time he saw Gabriel. Back then, Gabriel was burning with golden flames, and now that he thought about it and understood, weren't those pure flames of holy light? And because his body had completely turned into holy light elements, even his face became blurry, and his entire body looked like a glowing light bulb. Julia had relearned this knowledge about angels after she became a fallen angel. She had stayed by Samael's side and had many opportunities to come into contact with this knowledge. And now, she told Roy without reservations. Right. Roy suddenly asked Julia, Although you lost your memories in the process of transforming into a fallen angel, your previous self shouldn't be an angel of this world, right? Or did Samael help you rebuild your body? No, I'm indeed not an angel of this world. Julia said. I don't have the tattoos and patterns of angel runes on my body like Uriel, and my armor style is completely different from hers. In fact, I was brought back from another world by His Majesty Samael. Oh? What's your world like? Do you still remember? Roy asked. I don't really remember. Julia shook her head. But His Majesty once told me that he went to that world to find a traitor demon, and he just brought me back. That's it. Traitor? What kind of betrayal is worth Samael going personally? Roy asked in puzzlement. I don't know. I haven't seen that demon with my own eyes. Moreover, after His Majesty Samael went to that world, he found that other demon kings were also in charge of hunting down the traitor in that world so he returned very quickly. Julia said. However, His Majesty mentioned the name of the traitor. It seems to be. Sparta or something. PFFT. Roy spat when he heard Julia mention this name. He turned his head and looked at Julia in disbelief. You. What did you say? 
Sparta? The Dark Knight Sparta? I think it's this name. I don't really remember too much. Julia replied before looking at Roy curiously. Why, have you heard the name of this traitor? I've haven't only heard of it before, but I'm also very familiar with it. Isn't this the father of Dante and Virgil in the Devil May Cry world? Roy looked at Julia in disbelief. He never expected that Julia's predecessor was an angel from the Devil May Cry world. Chapter 166 Incompatible Angel Souls Perhaps there were many people named Sparta, but if the prefix was Dark Knight and the race was Demon, then it was definitely referring to the Devil May Cry world. The traitor of the demons, the legendary Dark Knight, Dante and Virgil's father. Roy did not expect to hear this name in the Darksiders world. Roy had wondered a long time ago that with the mobility of demons and angels in various worlds, would he encounter angels or demons from other worlds in certain worlds? Now, there was no need to guess. A living example was right in front of him, Julia. This former angel from the Devil May Cry world. But are there angels in the Devil May Cry world? Hmm, maybe there were. Isn't Julia one? Moreover, demons and angels are always like this. As long as there's one side, the other side will definitely exist. What's wrong? Is there a problem? Julia asked in puzzlement after noticing the surprised expression on Roy's face. It's nothing. Roy shook his head. He knew that Julia had lost her past memories. Even if he asked her about the situation in the Devil May Cry world, she probably could not remember, so he stopped decisively. Moreover, he did not know how long he would stay in this Darksiders world, so it was meaningless to ask about the situation in the Devil May Cry world now. He turned his attention back to the angel soul in his hand. Previously, he had encountered the end war as soon as he had fallen into this world, so although Roy had obtained angel souls, he had not had time to examine them carefully. Now that he observed carefully, he found that they were the same as other souls. The souls of angels also had differences in size and volume. These golden souls looked somewhat similar to the noble souls that Roy transmuted with the Haradric cube. This made Roy suddenly understand that perhaps the noble souls of humans could transform into the holy souls of angels through special means, so heaven spared no effort in searching for and admitting those noble souls. However, it was definitely much easier for humans to fall than to become noble. Are you planning to transform these souls into fallen angels? Julia looked at him as he observed these angel souls and could not help but say, let me remind you. This transformation isn't easy. With your strength as a high-ranked demon, I'm afraid it won't work. What do you mean? Roy asked. Is there anything special about the birth of fallen angels? Of course. Let's not talk about other things, but how do you create a body of flesh and blood for a fallen angel you want to transform? Julia asked. Um. Roy was stunned. Yes, souls usually needed a vessel to carry them. Otherwise, they would gradually dissipate. Of course, there were also exceptions. For example, in some special environments, souls would not dissipate and there was a possibility that some of the memories contained in the souls would restore with the passage of time. After the memories restored, the souls would unconsciously shape a new image according to the owner's original appearance in the memories, and what would form was a ghost. Similarly, the power of certain undead magic could also directly transform souls into ghosts. Roy learned these things from the Lich Cassandra. Speaking of Cassandra, Roy did not know how she was doing in the Pirates of the Caribbean world. Generally speaking, it was best for the vessels carrying souls to be bodies of flesh and blood, such as the artificial angels that Roy had killed before. Although they were artificially created, their bodies were still flesh and blood. If Roy wanted to transform these angel souls into fallen angels, the first thing he needed to solve was a body capable of carrying a fallen soul. It was indeed not an easy task. In Julia's words, ordinary high-ranked demons usually did not think about these things. Only after becoming demon lords or demon kings would they think of ways to make fallen angels. Roy was thinking about how to deal with these angel souls. It was temporarily impossible to transform them into fallen angels and make subordinates, so Roy thought about it for a bit before picking a low-class angel soul and throwing it into his mouth. Roy devoured an angel soul right in front of Julia, a fallen angel. This scene felt a little strange no matter how you thought about it. But Julia did not have any other expression because these angels' souls were not her compatriots at all. Once this low-class holy soul entered his mouth, Roy could not help frowning. He originally thought that this holy soul would taste as delicious as fallen souls or noble souls, but he did not expect it to be completely different. Hot. Scorching. And this kind of spiciness did not feel like a fragrant spicy and numbing sensation and so on, but pure spiciness. This burning feeling was not just purely the taste. 
It was completely different from the wonderful feeling of devouring souls in the past. This holy soul gave Roy the feeling that he had eaten something wrong, and his entire body was protesting. Therefore, after the spiciness, it was feeling uncomfortable. Damn it! What's going on? Why does the soul of an angel taste so disgusting? And the most outrageous thing is, why did those demons throw the souls into their mouths after killing angels on the battlefield? Don't they find it disgusting? Or were the demons devouring the souls of angels just out of a form of revenge? This was the first time Roy devoured an angel soul. The feeling was absolutely not wonderful, but he still endured it because he remembered the system saying that demons could increase their holy resistance after devouring angel souls. So after devouring the soul, Roy opened the system interface and checked his attributes. In the end, he did not find any description of holy resistance in his attribute table. After careful observation, he found that only the activity attribute seemed to have increased by one point. Roy could not remember how much it was before. After all, the increase of one point was easily overlooked. Roy felt that it was a little strange, so he could not help but ask Julia. Julia replied, the main purpose of demons devouring angel souls is to eliminate angels and reduce their numbers. As for the increase in holy resistance, there is indeed that, but it's really very little, and it can even be said to be insignificant. Otherwise, wouldn't a demon king level existence like His Majesty Samael have long become invincible? You have to know that he's devoured at least 80,000 angel souls. With Julia's explanation, Roy finally understood what was going on. To put it bluntly, the souls of angels actually conflicted with demons. This was because the souls of angels could be said to be a combination of positive emotions and energy. Moreover, their souls often contained a certain amount of holy power. When Roy devoured the soul earlier, the burning and uncomfortable feelings were actually due to holy power. However, this holy power was too weak compared to the dark power of demons, so even though it was uncomfortable, it would not cause any harm to demons. Moreover, because the magic power of demons came from the negative energy in souls, angel souls were not actually very useful to demons, and even magic power would not increase. By the same logic, the souls of demons were not very useful to angels. Generally, angels would not devour the souls of demons, and they would only thoroughly purify them with powerful holy power. Therefore, be it angels or demons, after obtaining the souls of their opponents, they would mostly eliminate them so that they could achieve the goal of reducing their numbers. Of course, this referred to demons that did not have the ability to transform souls. Demon kings like Samael would turn all the angel souls they obtained into fallen angels. First, it would reduce the number of angels, and second, fallen angels would augment their forces. It could be said to be killing two birds with one stone. The increase in resistance of these angel souls was very low and they could not be used to increase magic power. Roy could actually transform them into fallen angels. He could use the system to create bodies for fallen angels, but this way, it was no different from creating life through the system. Oh right. I can also use them to feed fat tiger. However, if you want to find out how Mother Lilith created the Nephilim, it's best if you keep these angel souls. Julia guessed Roy's thoughts. Especially Uriel's soul. The stronger the angel soul the more helpful it should be for you. That's true. Roy nodded. Looking at it now, the souls of angels and demons were simply incompatible, so he was even more curious about how Lilith used angels and demons to create the Nephilim. You had to know that a soul not only needed a body of flesh and blood as a vessel, but it also needed the soul to match the body. The body was the hardware, and the soul was the driver. The Nephilim possess both the angel and demon bloodlines. Does this mean that their souls are also a fusion of angels and demons? Otherwise, how could the Nephilim have such great power? Moreover, if the Nephilim are only the failed products of Lilith's research, how powerful would a true chaos demon be? In addition, it's said that the Charred Council in this world exists based on the will of the Creator. Then, was the Creator here the same as the Creator of the Abyss? There were too many secrets. But Roy knew that as long as he stayed in this Darksiders world and slowly explored, everything might have an answer. Yes. Roy had already planned to stay in this world for a while. Anyway, there was an abyss outpost in this world, and he would not be expelled no matter how long he stayed. As a long-lived demon, he had a lot of time to squander. Chapter 167 It's hard to change one's nature. After putting aside these angel souls for the time being, Roy finally received news from the demon eyes he released, so he brought Julia to the place where one of the seven deadly sins lurked. In fact, 
One of the reasons why he had promised Fury of the Four Horsemen to help her hunt down the Seven Deadly Sins was that Roy was a little curious about the origin of the power of these Seven Deadly Sins and if it had anything to do with the Seven Deadly Sin Demon Kings of the Abyss. Of course, Roy certainly knew that he could only act within his own abilities. It was precisely because Roy had observed the battle between Fury and Envy, false, in Volgrim's purgatory space that he could roughly determine that the strength of the Seven Deadly Sins was only at the high rank demon level. This was why he was willing to accept the mission. If the strength of the seven deadly sins exceeded Roy's abilities, then he would have never taken over. However, even though the seven deadly sins only had strength at the high rank demon level, they were actually very difficult to deal with. In the demon hierarchy, high rank demons were already quite powerful. They were the leaders and commanders of the demon armies. Once the people of other worlds encountered high rank demons in their worlds, they would feel as though they were facing formidable enemies and would not hesitate to send a large number of troops to surround and annihilate them. Especially in some worlds, if the natives were not clear about the hierarchy of the demons, they might treat a high-ranked demon as a demon king. In the history books of certain worlds, when describing a demon king, they would often use all sorts of words to describe how terrifying the demon king was. But in fact, the demon king they described was maybe only a high-ranked demon in the abyss. A more specific description to describe the strength of a high-ranked demon was that they could easily destroy a large city. When it came to demon lords, they could easily destroy a country. When it came to demon kings like Samael, they could easily destroy a world, a planet. The battle between Samael and the destroyer had caused the Earth's crust to change, chaotic weather, and frequent disasters. This was proof. Roy was now a high-ranked demon, so he also had the power to destroy a city easily. One of the demon eyes had found a strange figure. This figure was roaming through the destroyed buildings of humans, seemingly collecting something. When Roy and Julia rushed to the area where the demon eye was, they found that it was indeed one of the seven deadly sins. It was a goblin-like creature carrying a huge bag on its back. The bag was so big that it was several times the size of this goblin creature, and it looked heavy. However, the skinny goblin effortlessly carried this huge bag and wandered around. And from time to time, he threw some shiny things into it. There was no need to think too much. When Roy saw this goblin creature, he guessed its identity. It was one of the seven deadly sins, avarice. The shiny things this goblin collected were all gold and jewelry. Before the end war, these items might have been very valuable in the human world, but after the end war, they became the most useless things. They could not turn into food to feed the survivors, and they could not be used to bribe the angels and demons for a chance of survival for humans so they were naturally abandoned. The ruins that Roy and Julia were in seemed to have a large bank in front. However, the building had been flattened, and the underground vault was open. Countless colorful bills were scattered everywhere in this area, but this goblin, Avarice, ignored the money and only searched for shiny gold. Just as Fury had said, these seven deadly sins were indeed not demons. Among demons, there were no such existences like goblins. This goblin was merely a vessel Avarice possessed. That's strange. Roy hovered in the air as he looked at the goblin. Are there goblins in this world? It should be a species of the ancient races. Julia said. The space bubble where the Chard Council is in connects to all the alternate spaces of this world. When the seven deadly sins escaped, not all of them might not have found their bodies in the human world. Roy nodded and did not delve into it further. He folded his wings and descended. However, Avarice did not care about the uninvited arrival of Roy and Julia. He ignored them and continued to pick and choose in the ruins. Hey, stop. Julia pointed her sword at Avarice. You're one of the seven deadly sins, right? However, after shouting, what welcomed her was awkwardness. Greed ignored Julia, as though he did not hear her at all. Roy sighed. Why does Julia like to say something before attacking? Is this a bad habit left behind from being an angel? Don't bother talking nonsense. Go directly. Roy summoned Frostmourne from the system space, flashed in front of Avarice, and then slashed at him. It was not until this moment that the goblin finally discovered Roy and Julia. While being shocked, he quickly responded and raised his hand to block Roy's slash. Roy's height was too tall for this goblin. Looking down from above, Roy could finally see Avarice's appearance. Although he looked like a goblin, this goblin had a pair of demon horns, his cheeks were sunken in like a human skull, his eyes were blood red and his hands were a pair of large sharp claws. He already had looked like a demon to a certain extent, completely different from the goblins that Roy knew. In his huge bag, some items were visible. They were human corpses, the wings of angels, and even the limbs of demons. 
It seemed that what this fellow collected was not limited to gold and jewelry, but everything that was valuable to him. Damn demon, who are you? The goblin shouted in a sharp voice. Do you want to snatch my things? No, I'm just greeting you. Hello. Roy replied with a smile. Then he raised his right foot and suddenly kicked the goblin's abdomen. The enormous force sent him flying along with the huge bag. Roy's kick aimed him toward Julia. Seeing this, Julia raised her longsword and slashed at the goblin's waist, intending to split him into two. However, unexpectedly, the goblin was exceptionally agile. He adjusted his posture in mid-air, causing Julia's sword to slash directly at his bag. With a bang, Avarice landed on the ground, and everything in his bag spilled out. Ah! Seeing this, the goblin screamed even though he was not injured. After landing, he did not care about anything else, desperately hugged the things that spilled onto the ground, and stuffed them back into his bag. However, the bag had already been cut by Julia's sword and could not hold anything at all. After he stuffed things into it, they fell out. After discovering this situation, Avarice looked up at Julia and Roy and screamed coldly, You damn demon and fallen angel! How dare you break my important bag! I will kill you and use your skin to repair it. With that, he picked up a large piece of concrete with curved steel bars and threw it at Julia. When the concrete flew over, there was a loud whistling sound. The goblin's small and short body unexpectedly hit an immense strength that did not match it. The concrete came fast and swiftly in a parabola. Julia could not find a direction to dodge, so she could only grit her teeth and resolutely slash her sword at the concrete. Although she split the piece of concrete in half. The enormous force contained in it sent her flying. However, a hand stopped Julia as she was flying back. Roy had flashed behind her and caught her. Roy caught Julia with his left hand and raised his right hand slightly. A large cone of ice suddenly pierced out from the ground where Avarice was. The sharp tip of the cone hit the goblin's stomach and knocked him flying. Avarice screamed in pain. This ice spike pierced through his skin and stabbed a few inches deep. Fortunately, he was short and light so he was sent flying up instead of being completely pierced. But before he could land and stand firmly, a large ice storm attacked the area he was in. Countless large icicles descended from the sky and smashed into the ground. The hard black icicles pierced through the concrete and penetrated deep into the ground. Avarice had no time to dodge and was immediately submerged by the ice storm. Roy's magic did not stop. He continued controlling the icicles to hit the ground for 10 seconds before gradually stopping. Under his high-quality magic power, Roy's frost attacks became much stronger. The countless icicles did not disappear after falling, but as the cold air froze, they connected with each other to form a huge ice cage. The sharp icicles failed to kill Avarice, but this guy was already dripping with blood. When the ice cage formed, he was sealed within. The magic power virus and the desolate virus contained in the ice immediately began to erode his body. The surface of his body felt cold and bone-chilling. But the blood inside his body was boiling and hot, and even his magic power was constantly dissipating. Avarice immediately realized that he had encountered a tough opponent. This high-ranked demon was stronger than him. Thus, he mustered all his strength to break the black ice cage and jumped out. Then. He turned around and ran. The goblin was short, so he could go to his nest through the narrow underground passages. These underground passages extended all over, and once he entered, it would be difficult for the tall Roy to find him. However, just after he turned around and ran a few steps, he suddenly heard clanking sounds behind him. That's the sound of gold falling? Instinctively, Avarice turned around and saw a scene that made him immensely jealous. From the hands of the demon, a large number of gold bars appeared out of thin air and fell to the ground. The sound was from the noise of these gold bars colliding continuously. He clearly knew that his life was in danger, but his greedy body could not help but turn around and walk toward Roy. Roy knew that Avarice wanted to escape, but he did not bother to use Flash to chase after him. Instead, he let Avarice obediently walk back himself. Chapter 168 Special Soul Before coming to this Darksiders world from the Abyss, Roy had dug out a lot of demon gold and threw it into the system's space. If he only took out a bit, he could bury people. No matter what, demon gold was still gold. The shiny golden color would not lie. Roy was now a nouveau riche among demons. He used the countless gold bars to draw back Avarice, who wanted to escape. The goblin stared greedily at the gold bars continuously falling from Roy's hands. The sweet, crisp sound kept striking his eardrums. He wanted to escape, but his body walked obediently toward Roy step by step. He was Avarice, 
one of the seven deadly sins, so he naturally could not avoid this natural weakness. Just as Avarice was about to approach Roy, Julia suddenly appeared behind him. She raised her sword and pierced through Avarice's body from his shoulder, nailing him to the ground. Avarice screamed, but his eyes were still fixed on the pile of gold in front of Roy. Roy watched Julia restrain Avarice and stopped releasing the demon gold. But unexpectedly, when the sound of the gold falling stopped, Avarice screamed at the top of his lungs, Don't stop! Don't stop! More! I want more gold! Roy was speechless. This guy really wanted money. Julia was holding the hilt of her sword with both hands and stepping on Avarice's body with one foot. When she heard this, she snorted coldly and activated her magic power. Black flames suddenly rose from the sword, and under the high temperature of the flames, Avarice immediately let out a blood-curdling scream as the flesh on his wound began to sizzle. But this was not the worst. The worst part was that after the flesh on Avarice's wound was burned, it quickly regenerated and then continued to be burned, falling into a cycle of torture. This was because Julia's hellfire had the very special recovery attribute. Previously, Julia had used these flames to repair her damaged armor. Now, she was using it on Avarice as a kind of torture. Looking at the scene of Julia using the flames, Roy did not know why, but a word suddenly came to mind Nirvana. Julia's flames felt very similar to the Phoenix's flames of Nirvana. But these flames were black hellfire. When Samel transformed and shaped her body, did he use materials from the Black Phoenix? Thoughts were whirling in Roy's mind, but he did not stop his hand movements. With a wave of his hand, he put the gold piled on the ground back into the system space. This gold might be useful in other worlds in the future, so Roy did not want to discard it here. However, what Roy did not expect was that his action had an unintended consequence. The moment the gold disappeared, Avarice, who was still screaming, suddenly froze. The next second, his anger burst out, and a powerful force suddenly erupted from his skinny body, knocking Julia over. Julia's hell flames were still hanging on his shoulder, but his feet stomped the ground, and he pounced at Roy ferociously. Gold. Where did you put my gold? Roy was caught off guard as his face greeted Avarice's pounce. As Avarice screamed, he used his sharp claws to tear at Roy's face frantically. But because Roy was wearing the helmet of cold winter armor on his head, Avarice did not cause him any harm. It only made Roy's hard helmet creak and have sparks fly everywhere. He seemed to have regarded the pile of gold that Roy threw out as his own, but when Roy took it back, he immediately exploded. Roy, who came back to his senses, was also furious. He reached out and grabbed Avarice's face, but then he found that Avarice was shockingly strong at this moment. Under the struggle, it was difficult for Roy to grasp him. The next second, Roy immediately activated bloodlust. Red light spread over his body, and the muscles on his arm swelled. Under the strength increase of bloodlust, Roy pinched Avarice's face with his left hand and suspended him in the air, while the claw of his right hand, which was holding Avarice's demon horn, used great force. With a crack, Roy broke off one of Avarice's demon horns. After breaking off Avarice's demon horn, Roy had still not vented his anger. He looked at Avarice, who was constantly waving his claws to try to scratch him, and sneered. He stretched his hand out and broke off his other demon horn. Generally speaking, demon horns had a thick layer of cuticles that constantly piled up. The horns usually did not have too many sensory nerves, but this was only under normal circumstances. Roy's brutal actions of breaking off Avarice's demon horns also affected the roots of the horns. Avarice screamed in pain as black blood kept flowing out from his forehead. Seeing Avarice's miserable state, Roy finally felt relieved. After using psychokinesis to choke Avarice in the air, he released his hand and took a few steps back. As he retreated, Julia appeared from behind. This time, she did not show any mercy. The sharp sword in her hand flashed with cold light, and with a swift slash, she split Avarice in half. Julia was petite and lightweight, so it was often easy for her to lose when facing opponents with immense strength. And it was not just her. Almost all angels were similar to her. In battles, angels usually used skills and magic power to defeat their opponents, and they rarely fought their opponents with strength, so Julia was extremely angry when Avarice sent her flying twice. She felt that it was slightly embarrassing in front of Roy, her partner, so she directly killed Avarice. Roy had stepped back and gave way just now because he had noticed Julia's thoughts and gave her a chance to salvage her face. After being split in half, Avarice finally stopped struggling. However, his body was clearly dead but his bright red eyes were still staring intently at Roy, as though he wanted to bring Roy, the enemy who had taken away his gold, into hell together. 
Dear heavens, that gold was clearly Roy's. Julia swung the longsword in her hand and shook off the black blood beads on the sword. Then she walked up to Roy and said, Did you notice? This guy's strength fluctuated a lot. Yes. Roy nodded. It seems I stimulated him when I put away the gold. I don't know much about the seven deadly sins, but... Julia said thoughtfully. From Avers's situation, certain emotions seem to increase their strength. In Fury's words, the seven deadly sins that escaped from the Chard Council's prison were not demons but aggregations of specific negative emotional forces, and they existed in the form of souls. After escaping from the prison and coming to the human world, they chose different bodies to possess. Avarice had possessed this goblin, but because goblins did not know how to use magic power, which was the case in many worlds where goblins existed, in the battle with Roy and Julia, this goblin had not used magic power to attack. However, without using magic, it had immense strength and agility, especially the last burst that forced Roy to use bloodlust to hold onto it. After a brief exchange with Julia, Roy immediately understood that perhaps the source of the power of the seven deadly sins was the corresponding seven negative emotions. Once they produced or absorbed these negative emotions from other places, it was possible to increase their strength. We have to hurry. Roy said. Now that this world is in the end war, the negative emotions born under the stimulation of the war are definitely very strong. This is when the seven deadly sins are absorbing power. No wonder they come to the human world. If we ignore them or put it off for too long, their strength might increase to the point where we can't handle them. Julia nodded in agreement. She knew very well that as long as creatures had intelligence, they would inevitably produce all kinds of emotions. This point was the same for humans, angels, and demons. Happiness, pleasure, fear, greed, anger, and so on. Without these emotions, intelligent creatures could not be called intelligent creatures, and they could only be regarded as puppets. Precisely because of this, even though the population of the humans in this world had been greatly reduced, the seven deadly sins could still obtain and absorb these negative emotions from angels or demons, thereby increasing their strength and breaking through their shackles to become more powerful existences. At that time, it would be troublesome. After talking for a while, Roy found that despite the goblin being dead, Avarice's soul had not been exposed. After thinking about it, Roy took out the talisman of sin and activated it with magic power. A dazzling light flashed and turned into a bolt of lightning that connected to the goblin. Under the power of this talisman of sin, Avarice, one of the seven deadly sins, was finally pulled out of their body. It was a special soul that was constantly distorting, and countless faces emerged. Every face that appeared on the soul had a greedy expression, but this scene only lasted for a moment before the talisman of sin drew out the soul. Ah! Roy did not know whether it was an illusion or not, but the talisman of sin even let out a satisfied sigh. Seeing this, Roy suddenly had a thought and stored the talisman of sin into the system's space. He wanted to see what Avarice's soul was in the system. Chapter 169 Faint Truth After putting the talisman of sin into the system's space, something unexpected happened. In the system's recognition, it identified the talisman of sin as a true spirit vessel. It was a little special, but it was not too surprising for Roy. However, the souls of the seven deadly sin stored in the talisman were marked as seed of the power of law. In the talisman of sin, there was the soul of avarice, which Roy had collected, and the soul of envy, which Fury had collected earlier. Therefore, the system marked them as the seed of the power of law 1x and seed of the power of law fragment 1x. This meant that Roy's guess before was right. The Watcher following Fury was the true envy of the seven deadly sins. The soul of envy that Fury had collected was actually just a soul fragment. However, the souls of the seven deadly sins were not real souls but the power of law, which surprised Roy. Laws, as the name implied, were the laws of the operations of heaven and earth. Logically speaking, all physical and chemical phenomena in the world could be called laws. Flames, frost, darkness, light, and even space. In fact, everything could be called laws. Even things like souls could be regarded as one of the laws. But what was strange was that Roy had never seen the word law in the system's marking of items before. Except for the souls of the seven deadly sins. What is the reason? Why are only the seven deadly sins defined as laws in the system? Ever since Roy learned about the functions of the system, he had always felt that his system was very mysterious and powerful. The power of using souls to create things as he pleased made Roy feel awe. Therefore, even though he did not know the origin of the system, Roy had always believed in the system's definitions of items. He knew that the system would not lie to him. Since the system defined these seven deadly sins as the power of law, then they were laws, 
and there was no mistake. Out of curiosity, Roy asked the system in his mind, System, what do you mean by the power of law? The power of law can only be used and strengthened, and cannot be changed or eliminated. It is a necessary derivative for creation, a necessary condition for intelligent life to create culture and history, and the source of the evolution of the world. The system gave a long string of explanations. Roy heard and obtained a smattering of knowledge, but he understood little. Flames would be extinguished, frost would melt, time could be reversed and accelerated, and space could be distorted. These things that seemed to be universal truths actually had conditions that could change them, but only laws could not be changed. To put it bluntly, the seven deadly sins were the representations of negative emotions that intelligent life possessed. These negative emotions were invisible and intangible, but they were real existences. As powerful as angels, demons, and dragons were, and as great as titans and gods were, they could not eliminate the interference of these emotions. This power was probably the sole power in the universe that life could not be free from. Moreover, according to the system's explanation, the power of law was not only the negative emotions of the seven deadly sins but also positive emotions such as tolerance, integrity, temperance, humility, joy, love, and so on. These emotions should also belong to the power of law. Throughout the history of all intelligent life, without exception, they were under the control of these emotional laws. Under the control of hunger, life was able to survive, under the control of love and sex, life was able to multiply, under the control of unity and friendship, life established ethnic groups and countries, and under the control of anger and hatred, life produced wars. These emotional forces silently affected all life, making the world vibrant and colorful. They affected every choice in life and naturally affected the evolution of the world. On careful thought, it was actually quite terrifying. Be it humans, angels, or demons, they always felt that they were in control of their thoughts, but they did not know that this kind of thinking was wrong. Many a time, life itself did not notice that these emotional laws were affecting them. Roy noticed that in the system, Avarice's soul was only marked as seat of the power of law, without special classification. It seemed that the system categorized all the emotional powers into the power of law. Thinking of the eyes of nightmare and the fear runes engraved on his frost wings, Roy could not help but ask, the power of fear I defined is actually a type of law power? Yes. The system replied affirmatively. The application of emotional laws is actually very simple because they are a universal power. With this explanation, Roy immediately understood. Although the system defined emotional powers as the power of law, and this term sounded rather high-end, it was not a higher level power. In fact, it might not necessarily be higher than elemental power and spatial power. But this power was the only power that could not be changed or eliminated. This reminded Roy of the cultivation novels he read in his previous life. Perhaps this was the so-called simplified Great Tao? Gradually, Roy felt that he seemed to understand what the so-called seven deadly sins demon kings were. Is that level of existence demon kings who can control these emotional laws to the limit? Imagine what would happen if a world with billions of lives could be brought into a state of anger. People would pick up weapons and kill each other day and night out of anger. All the weapons they created could be thrown at their own people, and then they would wipe out their race. If an entire world fell into the control of gluttony, they would devour all the animals and plants on their planet and leave the world barren. Such scenes made people shudder just thinking about them. Then, can I use these seeds of the power of law? Roy asked the system. Of course. But let me remind you first that these seeds are actually a kind of convergence of emotional powers and have an extremely powerful influence. When you use them, you will also be affected. The system prompt said. Are you sure you want to use them? I'll reconsider it. Roy immediately changed his mind when he heard the system's reminder. It seemed like using the power of these law seeds had a lot of side effects, and one of them was the power of avarice. Roy could not imagine himself becoming a money grubber, so he temporarily withdrew the thought. Correspondingly, the use of Roy's eyes of nightmare and the fear runes was much safer. Although this superficial use had a limited effect, it also did not affect and damage him. Now, Roy finally understood why the Charred Council wanted the horsemen to capture the seven deadly sins. Such power of law could not be completely eliminated, so it could only think of ways to limit its growth and imprison it. Otherwise, the consequences would be really unimaginable. What's wrong? Julia's voice came from the side. She noticed that Roy had suddenly stopped walking and was in a daze, so she asked curiously. Speaking of which, this curiosity is also a type of emotion, right? A desire for knowledge? Roy thought about it and realized that he seemed to have gone a little crazy, 
and now his mind was full of thoughts about the emotional laws. He quickly shook his head to expel these thoughts and then said to Julia, It's nothing. Let's go. We have to hurry. Spreading his wings, Roy led Julia and rushed to the next location where a demon eye sent back news. Not long after they left, a huge magic formation suddenly appeared where they had been. A tall figure with a hunched body appeared with a large walking stick. On his back was a strange huge coffin. There were two sculptures on the coffin. One of them was the image of an angel, while the other was the image of a demon. The two sculptures were facing against each other, looking very much like the standpoints of angels and demons. This tall figure stared in the direction that Roy and Julia had left in and was silent for a long time. Finally, he sighed softly and said, a deviation has appeared. An unexpected demon, and hmm, there's also a fallen angel. That horseman of the apocalypse actually gave them the mission to capture the seven deadly sins. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Are they capable of completing this mission? After a long time, this tall figure gradually disappeared, leaving only a mutter, perhaps I should continue observing. Chapter 170 Blood Oath Roy and Julia continued to search for the remaining seven deadly sins, but Roy did not know that his actions in this world had gradually attracted the attention of some people. At the same time, in another direction hundreds of kilometers away, a group of angels in golden armor was flying low in the dim sky. This group of angels numbered about a thousand. In the combat troops of the angel army, it was a fully organized battle team. But what was strange was that this angel team was not finding the demon army to fight. Instead, they flew slowly while looking down, seemingly searching for something. Most of the members of this team were low-level two-winged angels. Apart from some original angels, the rest were artificial angels, but there were six four-winged angels leading this team. Although the angel army suffered heavy losses after the destroyer appeared, heaven was not completely expelled from the human world. It continued to send troops into the human world to fight against demons, as it had done for hundreds of millions of years. It was not discouraged because the balance of power was broken. However, it was actually two leaders who had directed this end war on the side of heaven. The angel soldiers at the lower level had no idea what the real situation was, so they were at a loss about why the war situation had become like this. The only ones who knew the war situation were Abaddon and Uriel, who had led the angels into the human world at the beginning of the end war. However, Abaddon, one of the leaders, had suddenly disappeared. Judging from the accounts of some angels who had returned to the heaven headquarters, Lord Abaddon seemed to have been killed by demon Lord Striga. This was definitely bad news because Abaddon's soul had not been able to return to heaven. Similarly, Uriel had not been able to return, but according to reliable news, Uriel was not dead or captured. After her attempt to assassinate the destroyer failed, she only escaped injured. The side of heaven wanted to know what had happened, so it continuously sent reinforcements and even attempted to find the Dominion Angel Uriel. This group of angel soldiers was one of the teams that came to find Uriel. Their mission was to meet up with Uriel after entering the human world. And while figuring out why there was the additional Demon King level destroyer, they would be incorporated into Uriel's subordinates and follow her command. But unfortunately, after entering the human world, this team could not sense Uriel's aura, and it also could not find Uriel's location with detection magic. After discovering this situation, the four winged angels leading the team had a vague premonition, but they were unwilling to give up just like that. Therefore, according to the reports of the soldiers who had seen Uriel, they searched in the direction where Uriel and her troops had retreated in an attempt to find traces Uriel left behind. This angel team had been searching for several days now. On the way, many demons attacked them, but they had successfully repelled them. Although they did not obtain any information about Uriel from the demons, they discovered the strange movements of the demons. A large number of low-level demons were gathering and heading southeast under the supervision of some high-ranked demons. Moreover, these low-level demons were carrying all kinds of stone materials, seemingly planning to build something. Although the angels did not know what the enemy wanted to do. They would usually do their best to destroy the plans of the demons when faced with such situations or, at the very least, create some obstacles for them. But after much hesitation, the four winged angels leading the team decided to find Uriel first. Just like that, they continued flying. After some time, the griffin mounts of the angels suddenly stirred and screeched. Sensing the situation, the angels immediately focused their attention on searching the ground below. Then a few sharp eyed angels quickly found something on the ground. Under the command of the four winged angels, this angel army spread out in all directions and flew to the ground to search. Within a radius of about a kilometer on the ground, 
the angels quickly found something. It was. Dozens of blood-stained white angel feathers. This proved that an angel had fought in this area, and the battle situation was not too encouraging. As time passed, the angels found more and more things. Among these things were a few golden feathers and some broken armor fragments. It's Lady Uriel's armor. The four-winged angels widened their eyes in horror as they recognized the patterns on the damaged armor. Quick, expand the search range. Considering that the battle might have taken place in the air, the angel feathers that appeared here might have drifted over with the wind, so the angels expanded the search range once again. As expected, after continuing to search, the angels found the true battlefield. Here, there were some scattered corpses of angels. They were the remaining angel soldiers who had retreated with Uriel. The corpses of these angel soldiers were spread out disorderly over a large area. It was caused by frost element magic power. They were completely frozen and then fell to the ground and shattered. A four-winged angel investigating said solemnly. Where's Lady Uriel? Did you find her? Another four-winged angel asked anxiously. Before he finished speaking, an angel soldier walked over, holding a stiff corpse. When they saw this corpse, all the angel soldiers fell silent. This corpse was none other than Uriel, whom they had been searching for. Lady Uriel died in battle, but her soul was taken away and did not return to the White City. The angel soldier carrying the corpse had a pained expression. Damn it! Upon hearing this, a four-winged angel could not help but draw his sword and stab it violently into the ground. Who was it? Who killed Lady Uriel? Uriel was an original angel with high hopes in the White City. If nothing unexpected happened, it was very likely that she would successfully promote to a new six-winged angel after a hundred years, becoming an important force for the angels. In fact, the White City had even discussed adding a leader position for Uriel. But unexpectedly, she died in the human world, and even her soul could not return. The only ones who can kill Lady Uriel are demon lords. Only a few demon lords appeared this time. Who was it? The angels said indignantly. However, they could not find any clues because in the battle traces found on Uriel's corpse, besides finding traces of frost power and dark power, they also found traces of hellfire and wounds caused by two completely different swords. This left them a little confused. They were slightly suspicious that after Uriel retreated with heavy injuries, she was intercepted by a demon lord with an army. What should we do now? The four winged angels leading the team were extremely worried. In any case, let's first bring Lady Uriel's corpse back to the White City. If we can find her soul, she might have a chance to resurrect. One of the four winged angels sighed. Soon, the angels split out dozens of soldiers to protect Uriel's corpse and return to the White City. Then the remaining angels gathered. This might be a despicable scheme of the demons. After they killed Lord Abaddon, they killed Lady Uriel too. A four-winged angel said angrily. We must take revenge. But our strength. Another four-winged angel said hesitantly, even Lord Abaddon is in trouble. Our enemy may be more than two demon lords. We don't have enough strength. Let's request reinforcements from the headquarters. Someone suggested. However, the four-winged angel who first proposed taking revenge shook his head. There are no reinforcements. Even if there are, it's impossible for it to be too powerful. The destroyer is attacking the White City, and the leaders are resisting his attack. We can only rely on ourselves now. But we. A four-winged angel was interrupted as soon as he began. Use the blood oath. The four-winged angel who proposed revenge said firmly. Upon hearing this term, the angels present fell silent, but they all quickly nodded resolutely. Chapter 171 Underground Nuclear Bunker The blood oath was the angel's final trump card. This was a power that only angels with four wings and above could use. It had to be known that in order to preserve the purity of their souls, angels generally tried their best to maintain their calm and indifferent hearts to reduce their exposure to too many negative emotions. Even in combat, they had to shout slogans of justice to strengthen their will and prevent themselves from falling because of negative forces. However, the blood oath was an exception. Angels were beings with free will, and they had their own siblings, compatriots, and people they cared about and valued so they would also produce the mentality of revenge due to anger. The blood oath was such a power. It could transform angels through their anger and desire for revenge into blood angels, giving them more strength to help them complete their revenge. This was the origin of the angels of vengeance in human legends. However, blood angels transformed from the blood oath, so they had also fallen in the eyes of orthodox angels. This was a sign of anger and vengeance blinding them. But compared to true fallen angels, 
blood angels still possessed self-awareness and would not stand against angels. Therefore, the cost of transformation into blood angels through the blood oath was immense. The moment the transformation finished, it was equivalent to being exiled and never allowed to return to heaven again. Moreover, after completing the oath and killing the target of revenge, blood angels would gradually die. However, the four winged angels present did not intend to consider more about it. Now that the war situation on heaven's side was in an extremely disadvantageous state, even if they did not make blood oaths, staying in the human world would not change this situation. It would be better to turn into blood angels and use this opportunity to kill one or two demon lords. For hundreds of millions of years, the hatred between angels and demons in this world had long become so deep that it could no longer be resolved. Especially after the end war began, the angels were also affected and began attempting some desperate actions. They would strive to succeed or die trying for their righteous cause. After making the decision, the angels' ritual was soon ready. They engraved a huge golden magic formation on the spot, and around 1,000 low-level angel soldiers knelt on one knee around the magic formation. They inserted their weapons into the ground, and in the magic formation, the six four-winged angels were facing each other and also kneeling on one knee. With their heads down and one hand over their hearts, they began to pour magic power into the magic formation while chanting softly. Gradually, the magic formation started emitting a dazzling light that enveloped the six four-winged angels. As time passed, the color of the light slowly changed from golden to blood red, and the four-winged angels enveloped in it let out painful roars at the same time. However, they forced themselves to endure and persisted until the ritual finished. When the light of the magic formation gradually faded away, what appeared in the eyes of the angel soldiers were six kneeling blood angels. Their appearance did not change much, but the wings gathered behind them turned from white to blood red. Even the angelic armor and swords on their bodies were dyed with blood red halos. At the same time, the aura of surging magic power burst only from their bodies. The blood oath did not promote them but it could stimulate their potential and temporarily strengthen them. Originally, five of these six four-winged angels were virtue angels, and one of them was a lower-level power angel. But after completing the blood oath, they all became existences at the dominion angel level. It could be said that they were all not weaker than Uriel at her peak. This way, with six dominion angels in total, even if they really encountered a demon lord, they would have the strength to fight. In addition, with a large number of low-level angel soldiers cooperating with them, this was a military force that could not be ignored. Most importantly, the Blood Oath could identify the revenge targets of their prayers, and the targets were the murderers of Abaddon and Uriel. The former was, of course, Demon Lord Striga, but the latter was Roy. The angels were all wrong. They thought that the one who killed Uriel was a Demon Lord, but they did not expect that the one who truly killed Uriel was Roy, a high-ranked demon. Uriel was injured at that time and was not in good condition, and Roy and Julia had used the expulsion incantation on Frostmourne to suppress Uriel's magic power. Only with these things together could they successfully kill her. Otherwise, if it were a one-on-one -on -one battle, Roy would still be lacking in strength when facing Uriel in perfect condition. But battles were like this. In life and death situations, who cared if you were at your peak? Roy only needed to do everything possible to kill Uriel. However, after killing Uriel, an important figure of heaven, the subsequent consequences arrived. Roy had never thought that a group of four winged angels had chosen to transform into blood angels to avenge Uriel. If Roy encountered them, these blood angels would immediately discover that Roy was the true murderer. At that time, Roy might be in big trouble. If he were still a low-ranked demon, he might be able to avoid them and survive, but now that he had become a high-ranked demon, he would still have to face what he had to face. After all, high-ranked demons were no longer nameless existences. Under the guidance of the six blood angels, the angel army whizzed through the air and began searching all over the world for their revenge targets. On another side, Roy and Julia had already gone deep underground under the guidance of a demon eye. However, they had come here not because the demon eye had found traces of the seven deadly sins but because it had found a surprising scene. They had entered underground through the underground transportation hub of a human city. It was a neighboring city hundreds of kilometers away from the coastal city that Roy had been. Similarly, the surface of this city had long been destroyed, but since it was not close to the coastline, it had not become submerged by huge tsunamis, and the underground buildings were still relatively intact. However, even so, the all-pervasive demons had long invaded the underground hub here. The hundreds of demon eyes that Roy released darted around everywhere, and one of them came to the city's underground. 
while wandering and investigating, the demon eye transmitted a scene back. It was a group of low-level demons attacking an underground human military facility. The reason why Roy was surprised was that there were still human survivors in this underground military facility. They were a group of fully armed human soldiers. After Roy controlled the demon eye to wander around, he found that it was an extremely huge underground bunker. It was 5 kilometers below the surface, had paths extending in all directions, and was very wide. It could probably accommodate hundreds of thousands of people, so Roy immediately thought that it might be an underground nuclear bunker, the nuclear defense facility of this city. Through the scenes transmitted by the demon eye, Roy saw that the demons had already discovered this place. There were thousands of low-level demons moving in the passages of the nuclear bunker and fighting against humans. There were a lot of human soldiers in this bunker and also a large number of civilians. They relied on thick reinforced concrete and alloy doors to fight against the demons. Moreover, in such a defensive battle, they repelled the attacks of the demons many times, completely blocking the demons in the periphery of the bunker and preventing them from entering. However, they also knew that this situation would not last too long. Although there was sufficient food in the bunker, enough for them to survive for a long time, they could not completely kill the demons and were dying one by one. Even through the demon eye, Roy could feel the pessimism of the humans. Roy was helpless about this. He knew that even if these humans did not die in the hands of demons, they would still die in the hands of time. When war descended a hundred years later, the humans of this world were already extinct. In cruel environments, no humans could survive for that long and they no longer had the space to continue procreating. Perhaps some ancient races that came to the human world through alternate space channels would be willing to save them, but it was probably only a drop in the bucket. Moreover, Roy roughly remembered that death of the four horsemen of the apocalypse seemed to be trying to resurrect the human race to save his brother war. As for the final result, Roy did not know. However, Roy came here because he found something extraordinary in this underground nuclear bunker through the demon eye. Stored in the human armory were dozens of tactical nuclear bombs with radioactive symbols. Chapter 172 Ambush The tactical nuclear bombs Roy saw through the demon eye were the kind that launched from vehicles. They were not too big, so their yield was probably relatively small. It was unknown if it was because the humans did not know the activation codes or because they were not ready to perish together with the demons, these tactical nuclear bombs were stored in the armory and not taken out. However, no matter how small the yield was, they were still nuclear weapons. Roy still clearly remembered the scene when humans launched nuclear attacks against angels and demons. He knew that these nuclear weapons could even kill high-ranked demons. Now that he saw them, he naturally did not plan to let them go and wanted to take these nuclear bombs for himself. This thing should be very useful to deal with the seven deadly sins, right? Roy thought. After spending some time, Roy and Julia entered the city's underground hub. In the narrow underground space, Roy's tall body caused him a lot of trouble, so he could only expand the passage through violent destruction many times. Such big moves naturally attracted the attention of the survivors in the bunker. There was complete industrial equipment in this underground bunker, so there was still electricity supply. When the survivors saw Roy and Julia walking toward the bunker through the surveillance system, they inevitably panicked. Even though the humans in this world did not know much about the societal structure of demons, they could tell at a glance that Roy was not an ordinary demon from his appearance. His tall body, two pairs of demon wings behind him, and domineering black armor showed how powerful this demon was, not to mention the rare fallen angel beside him. The reason why the humans in the bunker were still able to persevere was that only low-level demons were attacking them. These low-level demons had no organized actions and were all acting independently so the pressure on the survivors was not too much. But if this clearly powerful demon came, would the situation change? Would this powerful demon organize the low-level demons, break through the bunker in one fell swoop, and then massacre them? This speculation seemed to gradually be confirmed because, through the surveillance cameras, they saw some low-level demons who encountered him being very respectful as they made way for him. After he walked forward, the low-level demons would follow behind him. In less than half an hour, Hundreds of low-level demons gathered behind this powerful demon and followed him. Upon seeing this scene, the panicked survivors were almost in despair before Roy even reached the bunker. However, how could they know that Roy's target was not them at all? These low-level demons were only following him out of respect for the superior. However, Julia secretly told him that these low-level demons had most likely already surrendered to the destroyer. It was not that Julia felt the mark or aura of the destroyer on these low-level demons, but purely based on her intuition. After the battle between Samael and the Destroyer, 
It could be said that 80% of the demons in this world had already changed sides. Julia did not think that they would be lucky enough to encounter the remaining loyalists to Samael. Roy did not care. In any case, to him, it was all the same regardless of who these low-level demons submitted to. Ever since he roughly figured out what these demon kings were thinking, Roy understood that this kind of internal camp change was probably not a betrayal in the eyes of the big shots. The true betrayal of demons was either damaging the interests of their bosses, like the illusion demon Caesar, or directly betraying their people, like the Dark Knight Sparta that Julia had mentioned. Only these actions could be regarded as betrayal. Otherwise, this kind where a big shot lost his ability to command, so the demons under him followed the orders of another big shot was not considered true betrayal at all. On the contrary, Julia's diehard loyalty to Samael was completely unnecessary in Roy's view. Fortunately, Julia seemed to have gotten over it through his persuasion, so she did not reject these low-level demons of the Destroyer faction and did not fight them. This underground bunker could be said to be a city built underground. The paths were intricate and complex, and the scenes observed by the demon eye did not show the route in detail. Now that Roy had these low-level demons, it saved him a lot of effort. After finding a few demons who were familiar with the route to lead the way, Roy and Julia began to quickly approach the central area. His target was the armory, but the survivors did not know. After seeing Roy lead a large number of demons toward the central area, the survivors felt that their guess was being increasingly confirmed. This powerful demon was coming for them. Therefore, before arriving, Roy and the others encountered an attack from the human survivors. This wave of human soldiers attacking them was like a suicide squad. They knew that it might be a wasted effort, but in order to stop Roy, they still launched a suicide attack on Roy and the others. Relying on their familiarity with the terrain, they went around the areas where the demons concentrated, came to the route that Roy and the others had to pass through, and set up booby traps. Caught off guard, the low-level demons leading the way stepped on these booby traps and exploded into pieces. Then the soldiers emerged from their hiding spots, loaded their machine guns and rocket launchers, and attacked. Roy did not expect these human soldiers to take the initiative to attack him, but it was futile. Seeing dozens of rockets flying toward him, Roy did not even move and let them bombard him. In the end, Roy was still standing intact after the violent explosion. The cold winter armor blocked all the impact of the explosion, and the armor did not even have the slightest damage. With a wave of his hand, Roy dispersed the smoke in front of him. The pungent smell of gunpowder made him feel a little uncomfortable. As a result, the low-level demons behind him regarded this action as a signal to fight. They screamed and rushed excitedly toward the ambushing human soldiers, intending to tear their bodies apart and snatch their souls. Retreat. Quickly retreat. Seeing that the target of their attack was not the slightest bit injured, the human soldiers were terrified. But they still kept their mission in mind. Since the attack had not been effective, they would use their lives to lure this demon away. The human soldiers got on their motorcycles and quickly withdrew according to their planned route. As they retreated, they also fired at the low-level demons chasing behind them. Weapons such as rocket launchers could cause large damage to low-rank demons, so they had eliminated many demons while escaping. However, even if they were low-level demons, their speed was not something that the motorcycles could shake off. The demons chased closely behind these human soldiers, and the distance between them began shrinking. What made the soldiers even more depressed was the report from the control room and their earpieces. The powerful demon did not follow them but instead found another demon to lead the way and continued toward the central area. The survivors realized that the demon seemed to have seen through their goal. Seeing that the demons were about to catch up, the fleeing soldiers gritted their teeth. Just as they were about to stake everything on fighting the demons, a sudden change occurred. A loud whistling sound came, and an enormous black shadow flew through the air. With unstoppable momentum, it slammed into the demons behind. In an instant, the demons hit by the black shadow were immediately torn asunder, and before they could even scream, they were killed. The human survivors were stunned. They saw the black shadow that suddenly smashed into the demons was a huge and heavy warhammer. This warhammer flew straight, stirring up a storm of blood among the demons along the way. As countless amounts of purple blood splattered through the air, the warhammer smashed open a straight passage and hit a wall on one side creating a large hole on the wall and continuing to fly. On the other side, Roy, who had just walked a few steps, suddenly heard a loud noise, and the thick wall on his left suddenly exploded. With a bang, a hammer that was as tall as Julia slammed down in front of him, creating a big pit in the ground. Looking at the huge war hammer, Roy finally stopped. Chapter 173 Cryogenic Fate 
The moment this warhammer flew out, the force it contained was extremely terrifying, so Roy and Julia both subconsciously made defensive stances. Turning his head, Roy looked at the big hole smashed by the warhammer and heard the screams of many demons dying on the other side of the wall, as though someone was slaughtering these low-level demons wantonly. A moment later, the screams came to a stop. Roy immediately understood that the chasing demons were all dead. Boom! Boom! Heavy footsteps came. At the entrance of the hole opened by the warhammer, a burly, stocky figure appeared. When she saw this figure, Julia's pupils could not help but shrink as she subconsciously shouted, Ulf Thane? It's you? A short and stout man appeared in front of Roy and Julia. He had a pair of incomparably thick and solid arms, and explosive muscles covered his entire body. On his flat-topped head, only his temples had hair flying back, and he had a full beard and a resolute expression. After hearing Julia's voice, the burly man glanced at Julia. Without saying a word, he stretched out his hand and pulled out the warhammer that was deeply embedded into the ground. With cracking sounds, the ground cracked open like a spiderweb as he pulled the warhammer up. The weight of the hammer was unimaginable. However, Ulf Ain easily held this warhammer in his hand. After swinging it in a circle, the blood and minced meat of the demons on it were flung away. Only then did Ulf Ain place it on his shoulder. After doing this, Ulf Ain opened his mouth and said with a deep voice, Fallen Angel, do you know me? Of course, who hasn't heard of your name, Black Hammer Ulf Ain of the Makers? Julia's expression was very serious. She held her sword tightly and asked, Why has someone of an ancient race like you come to the human world? Don't the Makers never intervene in the war between angels and demons? Ulf Thane did not speak and slowly walked forward while carrying his war hammer. Seeing this, Julia became increasingly nervous and subconsciously moved closer to Roy. Although Roy remained calm on the surface, he was actually gathering magic power. When Julia mentioned the Makers, Roy immediately recalled that there was indeed such an ancient race in the Darksiders world. How ancient was this race? Their history predated even the appearance of the Charred Council. The Maker race was a born artisan race. They were very similar to the so-called dwarfs, but in fact, they were even stronger than the dwarfs. There seemed to be very few of this race, but every one of them was an extremely powerful warrior. It was obvious from Julia's nervousness. Now that the Black Hammer Elf Thane appeared and killed a large number of demons, Roy could not help but be wary. He was a very strong enemy. Before figuring out his intentions, he had to be prepared to fight. Elf Thane ignored Julia's question. Instead, he stood not far away from them and turned to look at Roy. After sizing him up for a while, he said, I'm Black Hammer Elf Thane. Demon, who are you? My name is Osiris. Roy replied expressionlessly. I hate you. Ulfane immediately said straightforwardly. You're exuding a cold aura, and the makers hate anything that can lower the temperature. Oh, really? Roy mocked, don't tell me that you use magma for cooling and quenching when forging? Ulfane choked at Roy's words but then shook his head. It seems like you're also a cunning demon. I won't argue with you. The war between angels and demons has nothing to do with me. But if you want to pass through here, you'll have to first ask if my hammer agrees. With that, he moved the warhammer off his shoulder and held it horizontally in front of him. Huh? Roy was slightly stunned for a moment before asking with a subtle expression on his face, You want to stop me? Do you know what I want to do? Of course, I know. Ulfane's nostrils spewed out two rough streams of air as he said in disdain, Aren't you just trying to plunder the human souls in this facility? I don't believe that you won't be tempted by so many souls. No, no, no. Roy stretched out a finger and shook it. You've guessed completely wrong. In fact, I'm just lost. Do you think I'll believe that, demon? Ulfane snorted. Of course not. Roy spread his hands. Your tone of voice means that you were already planning to fight, right? That's right. Ulfane suddenly roared and swung his heavy hammer at Roy. Roy stretched out his hand and quickly condensed a black ice wall in front of him. At the same time, he grabbed Julia with his other hand to stop her from rushing out. With a loud bang. Ulfane's hammer smashed fiercely against the ice wall. The ice wall containing the power of the dark dark fruit had a strong resistance to physical attacks, but it broke from Ulfane's attack. The moment of contact, cracks covered the ice wall, and in a few milliseconds, it shattered into countless black ice crystals. But Ulfane's hammer continued to maintain its indomitable momentum as it swung toward Roy behind the ice wall. However, even though it only blocked Ulfane's hammer for a moment, it was enough for Roy. He held Julia's hand, flashed, and appeared behind Ulfane. 
Facing a warrior with super strength, Roy was not stupid enough to take out Frostmourne to fight him head on. Ulthane was from the so-called Maker race, and just by thinking about the hammer in his hand, he could tell that it was definitely made of an indestructible material. Although Roy had created Frostmourne using the system, its essential material was only the demon iron that was commonly seen in the abyss. Ulthane's hammer might even break it in a single blow. Facing an enemy like Ulthane, Roy reckoned that even using bloodlust, he might not be able to win in terms of strength. And needless to say, Julia was not good at dealing with strength-type opponents. Therefore, Roy chose to avoid immediately. At the same time that he appeared behind Ulthane, he flew up with Julia. Although he could not fly too high in the space here, it was bullying Ulthane, who did not have wings. In mid-air, Roy pointed at the remaining low-level demons. Go. The low-level demons would absolutely obey the orders of a high-ranked demon like Roy. Moreover, demons were like this. They had no fear and only fought fanatically, so after Roy gave the order, the remaining low-level demons howled and pounced at Teuton. Damn it! Get lost! Ulthane let out a deafening roar as he swung his warhammer and started fighting the low-level demons. Roy said to Julia, check the path ahead and wait for me. Leave this guy to me. There's no need to become entangled with him. Julia shook her head in disagreement. Ulthane is strong, very strong. Even some demon lords are unwilling to provoke him. Let the low-level demons hold him back, and we can quickly leave. It doesn't matter. This narrow space is the best battlefield for me. Roy said. It will take some time to move the things I want. It won't be good if I let him disrupt me. It's best if I make him know how powerful I am. Hearing Roy say this, Julia could only nod. She did not say anything else and turn around to fly forward. In just a few words, Ultane had almost killed all the low-level demons. Low-level demons were ultimately low-level demons, and under Ulthane's hands, they would die from a mere touch. They could not even bring Ulthane the slightest resistance. All they could do was pounce on him ferociously, and then turn into a rain of blood. After killing all the low-level demons, Ulthane turned around and looked at Roy, who was floating in the air behind him. Without another word, he threw his warhammer. The warhammer flew forward with a loud whistling sound. Its speed was exceptionally fast, and Roy did not have much time to dodge. Moreover, there was an intense gust of wind around the warhammer. Once he did not have enough space to evade, he would probably suffer a lot of damage, so Roy did not think much about it as he flashed and disappeared. Boom! The warhammer hit the concrete layer at the top of the passage and blasted a huge pit. Roy reappeared and smiled at Ulthane. Can you take back your weapon now? Why not? Ulthane replied. He stretched his hand toward the warhammer in the distance, and the hammer shook while falling loose and then flew back into Ulthane's hand. Ulthane said proudly, Demon, don't think that I can't do anything to you just because you can fly. You can continue flying, but once I hit you, your body will be crushed. Wow! Roy clapped his hands and praised. Speaking of which, do you have a relative named Thor? Often shouts for the glory of Asgard or something like that. What nonsense are you talking about? Ulfane did not understand Roy's words. He swung his hand and threw the hammer. Roy dodged again. Okay, let's fight. But how about you trying my new ability this time? With that, Frostmourne appeared in Roy's right hand, and he raised his left hand. The next second, a blue light shone down and enveloped his entire body. Cryogenic Fate. Chapter 174 Attacking Means Ending. With the use of the skill, Roy's body glowed with light blue light. This scene was very similar to when Roy used bloodlust. After the light blue light appeared, Roy waved his right hand slightly and began to mobilize his massive amount of magic power. In an instant, the surroundings changed. Roy and Ulthane were currently in a subway tunnel to the central area of the underground bunker. The moment Roy released his magic power, black ice immediately covered the surrounding walls and all the stones and concrete that formed the entire tunnel made grinding sounds at the same time. It was due to the shrinking of these building materials at an extremely low temperature. Under the influence of this shrinking, some stone fragments broke away from their original positions and fell from the top onto the steel rails on the ground. In the end, with cracking sounds, the steel subway rails laid on the ground exploded. The steel material had become as fragile as glass, and the instant it came into contact with slight pressure, it immediately cracked inch by inch and exploded. At the same time, some colorless water droplets appeared in the air. These water droplets were extremely tiny, even smaller than the raindrops described in a fine drizzle. Ulfane did not understand what was going on. 
he only felt difficulty breathing the moment these colorless water droplets formed. With the formation of these colorless water droplets, a breeze appeared in the subway tunnel, but when the breeze blew, it made more and more water droplets in the air. These tiny water droplets were still mist-like in the air at first. But as the number of them increased, they began to gather and condense together, turning into bigger water droplets before finally looking more like rainwater. When their weight was enough, they began to fall. With a plink, Ulthane looked on helplessly as a raindrop hit his arm. In Ulthane's eyes, when the raindrop touched his skin, it started boiling like boiling water. The boiling only lasted for a few milliseconds before the raindrop turned back into mist. But during this process, something terrible happened. Ulthain found that the skin that came into contact with the raindrop suddenly lost feeling, and his skin was instantly frozen. Be bad. Ulthain wanted to speak, but he found that he could not open his mouth at all. He wanted to take a step, but he found an immense adhesive force coming from the ground, firmly sticking his shoes to the ground. The raindrops continued to fall one by one. Those that landed on the ground instantly boiled and exploded into countless tiny mist beads. In the eyes of others, it was actually a small cloud of mist. When it landed on Elthane, it turned into ice crystals and began to freeze his body. Without even being able to resist, Elthane quickly turned into an ice sculpture. This entire process did not even take three seconds. Roy's magic power had not even come into contact with Elthane. It had only spread once to cause these phenomena. Only Roy knew what was going on. The so-called cryogenic fate was actually a new skill Roy created that was similar to bloodlust. Except for the light blue light covering his body, this skill did not have many special effects. The light blue was only used to distinguish from bloodlust's effect. Overall, this skill was actually a buff. However, the attribute of this buff skill was to lower the temperature caused by Roy's frost magic power and force it to 200 degrees Celsius. After Roy promoted to high rank demon, he had once taken a moment to create a thermometer to test the temperature of his frost magic power. He found that even if he continuously increased the output of his magic power, his frost power would hover at most around minus 150 degrees Celsius. Although this temperature was terrifyingly low, and compared to when he was a middle rank demon, it was a substantial improvement from minus 100 degrees Celsius, Roy still felt unsatisfied. Where was the powerful place of frost? It was not those fancy ultimate moves, but lower, lower, and lower temperatures. Roy had thought about where the limit of frost type demons was before. It was nothing other than absolute zero, which was the extreme temperature that froze everything and stopped everything from functioning. However, absolute zero was very difficult to achieve, and Roy did not know how many souls he would need to consume to achieve this goal. It would definitely not work if he wanted to succeed overnight, so after thinking about it over and over, Roy decided to take a step-by-step -step approach to realize it. Thus, he created the buff skill, Cryogenic Fate. Cryogenic Fate, at the cost of the additional consumption of magic power, forcefully reduces the temperature of the frost power to minus 200 degrees Celsius. This state can continue until the amount of magic power drops to zero. Reality proved that Roy's idea was right. The creation of the Cryogenic Fate skill did not consume too many of Roy's souls. After spending over 100,000 souls to create the Cold Winter Armor, he later obtained more than 4,500 souls. In the end, he only spent 4,000 souls and 5 fallen and noble souls to obtain this cryogenic fate skill. Of course, this was also because Roy's frost power had a certain foundation, causing the consumption to be relatively low. Had his magic power been only able to create a low temperature of less than minus 10 degrees Celsius, then the consumption of souls would have definitely been way beyond that if he wanted to reduce it forcefully to less than minus 200 degrees Celsius. In addition, it was not that Roy did not want to lower the temperature further. But he found that if the temperature continued to decrease after reaching minus 200 degrees Celsius, the consumption of souls would begin to increase dramatically. Roy tested it and discovered that he needed 10,000 souls to create a temperature of minus 201 degrees Celsius. In order to create a temperature of minus 202 degrees Celsius, the consumption of souls was 18,000. The higher he went, the more it cost. From this point, each quarter degree increase cost 2,000 more souls than the previous level. Roy was not very good at math, so he did not calculate how many souls he needed to reach absolute zero. But in any case, the immense consumption of souls left him with no choice but to back down. In the end, he chose the most cost-effective, 200 degrees Celsius. Although it did not reach absolute zero, making the obsessive-compulsive patient very unhappy, 
the effects caused by the temperature of minus 200 degrees Celsius were very shocking. Because at this temperature, the oxygen and nitrogen in the air directly liquefied. The tiny colorless water droplets that Elfane saw just now were liquefied oxygen and nitrogen. This was the reason he felt it was difficult to breathe. Fortunately, the place where the two of them were fighting was not a sealed space. Otherwise, even if Ulfane had not frozen, he would have quickly died of suffocation. Once oxygen and nitrogen liquefied, their volume naturally decreased, and the nearby gas would fill in. This was the reason the airflows formed in the subway passage. As these airflows filled in, more oxygen and nitrogen liquefied again, finally forming rain droplets that dripped down. The liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen were extremely terrifying. When they dripped down and came into contact with objects with higher temperatures, they would immediately undergo super cold boiling. If there were enough liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen, you could even see a scene like boiling water. During this process, the process of heat transmission would accelerate to a very short period. In particular, Roy's fight with Elfane was in a relatively narrow space, which even more so displayed the effectiveness of his frost power to the pinnacle. In the past, Roy's frost power's temperature was not too low. Even if he wanted to freeze his target, it would take at least 3 seconds. But now that it had reached, 200 degrees Celsius, the freezing time shortened to about 2 seconds. Don't underestimate this difference of 1 second. In fact, 1 second could almost determine whether the target could react or not and whether they could use magic power to protect themselves. The difference in this was massive. Not even giving time to react meant that it was over. Chapter 175 The Lord of the Hollows Ulfane had never thought of fighting such a battle before. Of course, he knew that he was facing a frost demon this time. In fact, Ulfane was already more than 20,000 years old. He was still young among the makers, but he had seen countless people over the past 20,000 years. In this period of time, he had also encountered a frost demon and had even fought against it. Therefore, when Roy fought him, Ulfane thought that he might encounter magic attacks like Ice Spear or Ice Storm, and he was already prepared to deal with them. But who knew that this frost demon in front of him did not play according to common sense? He did not use any offensive magic at all. Had it been a proper battle, Ulfane would have definitely not have fallen into such a situation. He was a famous warrior of the Makers and had a strong physique that could crush angels, demons, and dragons. However, Roy took advantage of environmental factors and used an ultra-low temperature to cause unreasonable overloading and explosions to resolve this battle directly. Ulfane did not even have the time to respond effectively before he was instantly frozen. Under the ultra-low minus 200 degrees Celsius, his entire body had already lost feeling, and even his mind was frozen. In layman's terms, he blacked out and did not know anything. However, Ulfane did not die because his soul did not appear. His incomparably strong body saved his life at the critical moment, allowing him to maintain a weak heartbeat after he was frozen. But in this state, Ulfane was extremely fragile. As long as Roy landed and poked him lightly with a nail, his frozen and fragile body would shatter like broken glass, turning into countless ice crystals. At that time, no matter how strong his body was, it would not be able to save him. Roy landed and came in front of Ulfane. However, Roy did not attack Ulfane whom he could easily destroy with his hand. Shaking his tail, he felt that it was slightly troublesome. This guy, Ulfane, was a formidable enemy, and usually, Roy should eliminate the roots here to prevent future trouble. But the problem was that Roy knew very well that the Makers were not a warlike race. Of course, he knew why Ulfane had attacked him earlier. He only intended to save the fleeing human soldiers. He regarded Roy as the leader of the low-level demons and wanted to kill him so that he would not continue to harm the surviving humans. After the end war began, angels and demons fought earth shakingly on the ground, but the ones suffering were these unprepared humans. And in this world, humans were an important part of the order of balance, so even the ancient races that were unconcerned about worldly affairs such as the makers were now appearing in the human world. They intended to save these pitiful humans and pull them out of the tragic end war to prevent them from truly becoming extinct. As for Roy himself, he actually had not given orders to the low-level demons to slaughter at all. It was purely the low-level demons spontaneously hunting them down after the human soldiers fled. Ever since he met Cassandra in the Pirates of the Caribbean world, Roy had always placed himself in the position of punishing evil. He felt that this was probably the true intention of the Creator to create demons. It was precisely because of this insight that he suddenly obtained the talent of Chosen One of the Abyss. After coming to this world, although Roy got caught up in the end war, he had indeed not taken the initiative to attack the humans of this world. 
He had always followed this principle. Unless humans attacked him, then he would fight back. The human soldiers had attacked him with rockets, so Roy naturally would not stop the low-level demons from chasing after them because they were already considered enemies. However, Roy had never had any thoughts about the survivors in the bunker from the beginning. He only planned to leave here after obtaining those tactical nuclear bombs. Clearly, Ulfane did not know his purpose. He had misunderstood Roy, but there was nothing he could do about it. It was impossible for the two of them to sit down and chat to understand each other, right? Forget it. After thinking about it for a while, Roy felt that there was no need to provoke the ancient maker race. His purpose in staying in this world was very simple. First, he wanted to collect as many souls as possible, and second, he wanted to find some information that would help him promote to Demon Lord, for example, the Nephilim, or the Creator, and so on. The history of the Makers was ancient and long, and it was even longer than the establishment of the Chard Council. Perhaps the Makers had information about the Creator, so there was no need to strain the relationship into a deadlock. Of course, Roy did not intend to unfreeze Althane. This was his punishment for attacking him. Since he still had a heartbeat, Roy felt that he might be able to survive, so he left Althane frozen so that he would not cause trouble for him. Roy turned around and left, chasing after Julia. Not long after Roy left, a huge magic formation appeared in the subway tunnel. The tall figure carrying the angel and demon coffin on his back appeared from the magic formation. He held a staff in one hand and waved his other hand gently. A ray of light shone on the frozen Althane. Under this light, the ice on Althane's body began to melt slowly. After a while, Althane finally completely thawed and gradually regained consciousness. After thawing, Althane's legs went weak, and he knelt on the ground. He supported himself with both hands on the ground and panted heavily. The black war hammer smashed onto the ground with a bang. The tall figure with the coffin on his back was hunched and wore a crown on his head, but his scarlet, shining eyes showed his demon identity. He slowly stroked his beard and said to Elthane, The frost power acting on you is very powerful, so you will have a long period of after effects. Elthane raised his head and looked at the ancient demon. Lord of the Hollows? Did you save me? He then looked around and asked doubtfully, Where's that frost demon just now? Did you kill him? No, not at all. The Lord of the Hollows shook his head slightly. In fact, he did not kill you. He had the chance, but he gave it up. Huh? Why? Ulfane was stunned. I don't know. That demon. Is very strange. The Lord of the Hollows was also puzzled. He's different from the other demons I've seen, be it in terms of strength or behavior. Ulfane understood the meaning in the Lord of the Hollows's words. He slowly stood up and asked curiously, are you observing him? Ulf A knew who this ancient demon in front of him was. It was the Lord of the Hollows. He was indeed a demon, but he was also once one of the members of the Chard Council. However, he left the Chard Council because of disagreements with the other council members. After that, he found an alternate space and opened his own domain, the Hollows. This ancient demon possessed unimaginable power. He seemed to plan on accomplishing some kind of balance in his own way and some angels and demons, who were physically and mentally exhausted from the endless fighting, would take the initiative to find the Lord of the Hollows so that they could completely free themselves from the pain of their souls constantly resurrecting. In this world, the Lord of the Hollows was a famous existence. Therefore, after hearing the meaning in the Lord of the Hollows' words, Ulf Ain found it strange that such a big shot would pay attention to a high-ranked demon. At the same time, Ulf Ain felt that what was even more strange was that the Frost Demon clearly had the chance to kill him but let him go. The Makers were not people who could not distinguish right from wrong. Ulf Ain also faintly felt that the Lord of the Hollows was right. This Frost Demon's behavior was indeed really strange. Facing Ulf Ain's question, the Lord of the Hollows glanced at him and said slowly, because Fury, one of the horsemen of the Apocalypse, actually handed over the mission given to her by the Council to this demon. So I think it's necessary to investigate what he said to Fury. Perhaps this demon will also be the key to restoring the balance. Really? Ulf Ain lowered his head and looked at his war hammer, deep in thought. As for you, Black Hammer Ulf Ain, you need more patience. The Lord of the Hollows said. Perhaps things may not be as you think. With that, a magic formation appeared beneath the feet of the Lord of the Hollows, and he slowly sank into it. Only when just Elfane was left did he pick up his war hammer and carry it on his shoulder. He ran forward with large strides. Looking at the direction, it was still to the central area of the underground bunker. But this time, he planned to observe more, like what the Lord of the Hollows had said. 
Chapter 176 A title isn't easy to write. Not long after, Roy caught up to Julia. Seeing Roy coming so quickly, Julia was extremely shocked. She naturally knew how difficult Elfane was to deal with, but it was precisely because of this that she was shocked. However, she did not ask Roy about the specific process. It was not easy for demons to survive in society, so almost all demons, including her, would leave a trump card. She could not casually inquire, even though they had become partners. The closer they got to the central area, the more low-level demons they encountered. When these low-level demons saw Roy and Julia appear, they all chose to follow them without exception, so the demon entourage that Elfane had killed was replenished. In this underground bunker, the living areas of the surviving humans and the armory were separate, so when the humans saw Roy and Julia bringing a large group of demons to the armory, the survivors both rejoiced and felt uneasy. They rejoiced because Roy and Julia did not show any intention of attacking the survivors. But their uneasiness was because the survivors did not know whether Roy and Julia would come back after going to the armory. They could only hide behind the steel door, waiting anxiously for the verdict. At this moment, Roy and Julia had arrived outside the armory. Since they could not find the control room, they could only use violence to break the door. Fortunately, this method had always been what demons were best at. The task of breaking the door was naturally left to the low-level demons. They rushed forward, scratched with their claws, spat out flames, and smashed their weapons with all their might, using all kinds of attacks on the door. It had to be said that this nuclear defense facility could be regarded as a fortress in a certain sense. Under the continuous attacks of many low-level demons, the door made of special alloy only deformed but could not be broken. Humans did not have the powerful bodies and strength of angels and demons, so all they could rely on was technology. In the end, Julia grew impatient. She pulled out her fallen angelic sword, stepped forward, and directly cut through the alloy door with her sword skill. Then Roy and the others entered. In the armor, there were a large number of boxes of different sizes stacked all over. Thick, dust-laden canvases covered most of these boxes. But when Roy lifted open these canvases and opened the boxes, he found that the weapons stored inside were well maintained and were usable at any time. There were some traces on the ground of the armory and many empty open boxes. It seemed that the survivors had taken away a portion of the weapons. Roy went further inside and saw rows of tanks and armored vehicles. If Roy were still a little demon, he might have found some fuel for these tanks and tried to play with them, but it was impossible now. His Tau body could no longer get into these narrow tanks. Julia was quite curious. She had seen humans driving these war chariots to fight against angels and demons, and she had even personally destroyed these weapons. But she could not understand how these mechanical puppets moved. Although this world was a high magic world, the humans here had not embarked on the path of magic. They did not have any magic power themselves, and these weapons did not seem to be driven by magic power. Do you want the weapons of these humans? Julia asked Roy as they walked. But these things are very weak. One slash can cut them open, so they're useless. Roy looked at her and grinned. You'll know if you follow me. It was no wonder that Julia looked down on them. To angels and demons, these human weapons were indeed too weak. Not only were they clumsy, but their attacks were simple, and they did not have much defense. It seemed that it was precisely because of this that angels and demons rarely paid attention to the progress of human science and technology. But for Roy, he knew very well that whether it was the scientific development route or the mystical development route, they might both arrive at the same destination in the end. The intercontinental nuclear bombs launched by humans could easily kill high-ranked demons, so who could guarantee that technology would not develop to a point where interstellar warships could eliminate a demon lord in one shot? In this world, it was not without reason that humans were an important part of the balance. It was not only in this world but also in many other worlds. He led the many demons deeper into the armory. After destroying a few alloy doors one after another along the way, Roy finally arrived at the core of the armory. When he entered, the demon eye hidden in a corner flapped its little wings and flew toward Roy for him to store. Since the demon eye appeared here, it meant that this was where the tactical nuclear bombs were stored. After opening a bunch of long boxes, Roy found what he wanted inside. Unlike the big intercontinental nuclear missiles, tactical nuclear bombs were much smaller and ranged from 3 to 5 meters long. These missile-shaped weapons were meant to be mounted on fighter jets, so they were naturally not that big. Roy easily grabbed a missile with one hand, waved it gently in his hand, and found it very convenient to handle. He could use these missiles, which were about the same height as him, as javelins and throw them without trouble. The yield of these warheads was about 2 to 3,000 tons, 
But there were only 12 of them, not too many. Roy estimated that even the human survivors might not know about the existence of these tactical nuclear bombs. Otherwise, they would have carried them out long ago to deal with the demons besieging the bunker. But now, Roy did not stand on ceremony and accepted all of them. Although he did not know the activation codes for these nuclear bombs, it did not matter. With Daddy's system around, he could use some souls to create a special detonator specifically to detonate these nuclear bombs. Let's go. Let's leave this place and continue looking for the seven deadly sins. I already have a clue. Roy put the twelve tactical nuclear bombs into the system space and waved at Julia. The two of them walked out of the armory, and the demons naturally followed them. After coming out, the low-level demons were stunned because they realized that these two high-ranked demons were planning to leave the underground. Did they not want those delicious human souls full of fear and despair? For a time, there was a commotion among the low-level demons. They did not know if they should follow Roy and Julia or stay here to find a way to break the human fortress and plunder the human souls. However, Roy did not care about them at all. Low-level demons were everywhere in this world, and Roy could encounter many of them at any time. Roy did not regard these low-level demons as his subordinates. It did not matter to Roy if they were willing to follow him or not. They would just be a group of cannon fodder to break into enemy lines. And for enemies that Roy and Julia could not deal with, it made no difference no matter how many low-level demons came. Just like that, they left. When they were about to walk out of the central area, a figure suddenly appeared in front of them. It was the Black Hammer Elfane of the Makers. Roy was not surprised to see him and only sized him up for a moment. I didn't expect you to recover so quickly. It seems like you did let me go on purpose. Ulfane placed his warhammer on the ground and said somewhat unhappily, how laughable it is that a demon actually spared the life of Black Hammer Elfane one day. If you really want to die, I can fulfill your wish now. Roy spread his wings and revealed a sinister smile. Stop. I'm not here to fight you this time. Ulfane said. I'm just here to confirm if the demons besieging the survivors really have nothing to do with you. No. Roy shook his head. If you want to save those humans, you'd better hurry up. If it takes too long, I can't guarantee what will happen. Ulfane looked at Roy and remained silent for a long time before saying, It seems like you're really a different demon. Okay, I, Ulfane, owe you one. Next time, if we can meet again, I'll help you do what I can. Deal. Roy nodded expressionlessly and continued walking forward with Julia. After Roy passed by Elthane, his mouth could not help but arch into a smile. It worked. Chapter 177 Fire in the Hole Although the Makers were all powerful warriors, their true strength lay not in their combat power but their forging ability. In fact, when Roy saw Elthane and recognized him as the guy from the Darksiders 1 game, he became a little concerned. If he did not remember wrongly, he would help War reforge the Armageddon Blade a hundred years later when War returned to the human world. The Armageddon Blade was a powerful holy sword in this world. And Ulthane was actually the creator of this holy sword. He had forged this divine weapon. In the beginning, Heaven held this holy sword. However, when Abaddon secretly plotted to start the end war, he had used this holy sword to break the powerful force of the Seven Seals contract. After breaking six of the Seven Seals, the Armageddon Blade shattered. Finally, War retrieved the fragments of the sword and got Ulfane to reforge it to restore the original power of the Holy Sword. It was through this Armageddon blade that War could kill Abaddon, who had transformed into the Destroyer. Since this Holy Sword could slay a demon king, what else could it be if not a divine weapon? If sparing Ulfane's life could be exchanged for a favor from this divine artifact craftsman, why would Roy not do it? If Roy was thick-skinned enough and asked Ulfane to help him reforge Frostmourne, he would probably not reject this favor right? Even if Frostmourne could not reach the power of the Armageddon Blade in the end, Roy would make a huge profit as long as there was a big improvement. Of course, this favor had not been easy to obtain. The key was that Roy had to be able to defeat Ulthane, and Roy's ability just happened to be able to do this. As Ulthane had said, he hated everything that could lower the temperature. If Roy used flame abilities like other demons, Ulthane, a 10,000-year-old blacksmith who had been dealing with fire for a long time, might not have been the one to lose. Roy achieved his goal. He struck Ulfane with a stick and then gave him a date to eat. However, Ulfane could not help but appreciate it because Roy indeed had the ability to kill him at that time, but he had not done so. Even though Ulfane was released from his frozen state, the muscles all over his body were still very stiff. But under his powerful recovery, the necrotic cells in his body were rapidly changing. Of course, 
he would not be able to recover from this weak state for a while, and it was naturally impossible for him to fight. Fortunately, this frost demon did not seem to have the intention of attacking the human survivors. This did not conflict with the purpose of Althane's trip, so he made a straightforward exchange. Although he said next time we meet, Roy was not in a hurry. He knew that it was impossible for Elfane to bring all the tools he used for forging with him. If he really wanted to find him to upgrade Frostmourne, he would probably have to follow him to the alternate space where the Makers lived. Currently, Elfane and his people were searching for human survivors and would not leave the human world in a short time. Therefore, Roy could rest at ease to capture the Seven Deadly Sins first. About two days later, Roy and Julia found another one of Seven Deadly Sins. This time, it was Gluttony of the Seven Deadly Sins. He was a ferocious-looking octopus-like monster. Most of his body was in the ground, and only his head was exposed. The shape of his head was like an octopus, with tentacles constantly shaking around its neck. Gluttony was much stronger than Avarice. Just as Roy had guessed, as time passed, the seven deadly sins would become more powerful after obtaining the same power as the deadly sin they represented. At present, they were still at the high-ranked demon stage, but it was hard to say what would happen if time dragged on a little longer. Roy did not know how long this long would be. After all, high-ranked demons needed to accumulate a lot of power to become demon lords. But in any case, it was always right to hurry up. Roy did not let Julia participate in this battle against Gluttony but instead had her hide far away. During the battle, Roy discovered that the tentacles around Gluttony's neck would spit out poisonous venom, and his mouth, which was full of sharp teeth like a meat grinder, would desperately try to bite Roy. This guy was indeed worthy of being Gluttony. He really ate everything. After trying to bite Roy, and Roy flashing away, he would often end up biting dirt, rocks, steel, or even the venom that he spat out and swallowed everything without hesitation. Moreover, this guy could even move underground. He could devour the hard rocks underground to dig tunnels. He could even eat the ice wall Roy created. The magic power virus, the desolate virus, and the corrosive effect of the dark power contained in the ice were of little use against him. In order to prevent him from digging into the ground, escaping, and wasting time, Roy had been showing weakness in battle, but he had not allowed Gluttony to bite him. This made Gluttony unable to satisfy his strong appetite, so he opened his mouth to suck in the air, attempting to pull Roy over and eat him with a powerful pulling force. However, what Roy was waiting for was this moment. In mid-air, he suddenly took out a tactical nuclear bomb from the system's space. After installing the black technology detonator created by the system on it, he threw the missile like a javelin at the huge mouth of Gluttony below. Fire in the hole! Roy shouted as he threw it. Unfortunately, Gluttony did not understand what this meant and swallowed the missile in a daze. Because the missile was too long, he even raised his neck and swallowed again. While watching the missile enter Gluttony's stomach, Roy quickly used ice block. Thick black ice stacked on Roy's body layer by layer, turning him into a huge round ice coffin. The next second, a dazzling light appeared in Gluttony's mouth, and then the light rapidly expanded and exploded in his stomach. Boom! As Gluttony's body was torn apart, a huge shock wave swept out. The intense heat scoured the land in all directions, and invisible radiation penetrated through everything at the speed of light. Looking from afar in the sky, you would see a ball of sun-like light emerging from the surface of the city, and then a mushroom cloud slowly rising. Half of the city was gone in an instant, but Roy who was in the center of the explosion, was fine. The yield of tactical nuclear bombs was small. The defense Roy created was the important reason why he was safe and sound. Not only did the thick black ice offset the high temperature impact from the explosion, but even the explosion's fatal radiation was mostly absorbed by the desolate virus in the solid ice. After removing the protection of ice block, Roy landed on the ground and looked at the raised ground around him. He moved his limbs and checked his body before shouting, Awesome! It could be said that Roy's ability completely restrained this small-scale nuclear explosion. Precisely because of this, he dared to throw out a tactical nuclear bomb as a grenade at close range. Hmm, speaking of using a tactical nuclear bomb as a grenade, he was probably the only one. Unlike the time when he killed Envy, Gluttony's soul was completely exposed because his physical body had thoroughly disintegrated and turned into ashes. And it was impossible for his soul to hide. Roy took out the talisman of sin and shot a ray of light at Gluttony's soul, pulling it into the talisman. He had also obtained the soul of Gluttony, one of the seven deadly sins. Chapter 178 Appearing Roy's prediction was right. He could indeed withstand the explosive power of this small yield tactical nuclear bomb. 
Compared to other elemental magic, the ice element could form a substantial physical defensive structure to resist the blast wave. At the same time, because of the low temperature of the ice element, it could also resist the high temperatures produced during the explosion. This was an advantage that other elemental magic could not match. As for the most fatal radiation of the nuclear bomb, Roy's desolate virus absorbed it during the explosion. And after absorbing the radiation, Roy could clearly feel that the desolate virus had become stronger. In other words, when using these tactical nuclear bombs to deal with enemies, not only could they cause immense damage, but they could also strengthen Roy. The only pity was that Roy had only obtained 12 tactical nuclear bombs. If he wanted more, he would have to go to other cities to search for similar nuclear defense bunkers. Julia had followed Roy's instructions and hid far away, but after the explosion, she immediately rushed over. When she saw that half of the city had been razed to the ground, she was very surprised. Of course, she recognized that this explosion seemed to be the kind of attack that humans had used to retaliate before. However, the one Roy used this time had much less power. At first, Julia did not know what the human weapons that Roy had taken away were, but now she knew. What surprised her was that Roy actually knew how to use these human weapons. How did you do it? Julia asked Roy curiously after landing. Using a special method. Roy threw the talisman of sin in his hand. How is it? Human weapons are pretty powerful, right? Are you planning to use these weapons to deal with the remaining seven deadly sins? Julia asked. Of course, the greatest advantage of these human weapons is that they don't need to consume any of my magic power. Roy nodded. I don't even need to appear. As long as I find the locations of the other seven deadly sins, I can send a few low-level demons with these weapons and directly donate them after finding them. If one isn't enough, then I'll use two or three. Roy's idea of using suicide attacks was something he thought of just now. The more he thought about it, the more feasible he felt it was. He thought that Julia would praise his idea, but unexpectedly, Julia asked solemnly, You mean that even low-rank demons can use these powerful weapons? Yes. What's wrong? Roy looked at her in confusion, not understanding why she had this expression. Oh Cyrus, it's best not to use these human weapons in the future. Julia persuaded. Have you thought about it? These kinds of human weapons that can allow low-level demons to kill high-level demons, what would happen if they spread in the demon world? Roy was stunned and immediately understood what Julia meant. In Roy's view, these powerful weapons were convenient and easy to use, but it was not necessarily the case for other demons. Just as Julia had said, they were something that could allow low-level demons to challenge high-level demons. Such things existing were provocations to the strict hierarchy of the demon world. Just think about it. If Roy found enough nuclear bombs with sufficient might, would he be able to kill a demon lord? A high-ranked demon killing a demon lord was simply a joke in the abyss, but it would be different with these human weapons. Julia was saying this for Roy's own good. She was worried that Roy would frequently use these human weapons and allow other high-level demons to see how to use them. In that case, some demon lords might look for him and even kill him personally for the sake of maintaining the hierarchy. Don't worry. I understand. Roy nodded. I won't hand these weapons to low-level demons to use. It's fine as long as I don't let other demons notice that anyone can use these human weapons. After hearing Roy's words, Julia smiled and hugged Roy's tail from behind. She pressed her entire body against Roy's tail and said, Let's go and continue searching for the other seven deadly sins, but I want you to carry me while flying. Roy smiled and did not say anything. He spread his wings and soared into the sky with Julia. A week passed by quickly. During this week, after avarice and gluttony, the souls of two more of the seven deadly sins landed in Roy's hands. These two souls belonged to sloth and lust. In addition to Roy's demon eyes, he also had Vulgram's help in finding these two seven deadly sins. This demon merchant had provided Roy with information on the location of Sloth, a place that Roy's demon eyes could not find it, so Roy had paid hundreds of souls for it. In order to find traces of these seven deadly sins, Roy and Julia had traveled through several cities and saw many battles between angels and demons on their way. But it was undeniable that the angels were completely suppressed by the demons, and their numbers were becoming fewer and fewer. Because the demons were now winning the war, these cities that Roy and Julia had passed through were basically full of demons they wandered in the ruins of every city and searched for every soul they could find. The number of souls that Roy could collect through the soul attracting flag was becoming less and less. But there was nothing he could do about it. Although there were numerous souls in the Sand War, the number of demons dividing the souls was also huge. After the initial harvest period, he could only accumulate souls over time. 
This was why Roy was now doing his best to complete Fury's mission. As long as Fury kept her promise, Roy could obtain a massive number of souls from her, far more than Roy's hard work collecting them. Now, the talisman of sin stored the souls of five seven deadly sin, the envy part was only a soul fragment, leaving only wrath and pride before Roy completed the mission. However, Roy noticed a strange place when he killed a seven deadly sin and stored his soul. North of the city where Sloth had been, he could vaguely see some huge objects floating in the sky. Roy and Julia could see them from afar even though they were standing on the ground. These huge objects floated in the air, motionless, and they seemed to have a faint tendency of gathering together. What are those things? Roy asked somewhat doubtfully. Julia observed intently for a while and said, I'm not sure. They seem to be some. Platforms? Platforms? Roy looked at them with all his might. Then he found that in his radiation perception, there were some tiny radiation sources near these huge floating objects. However, because it was too far away, the radiation sources were just spots of light, and these radiation sources kept flying around these floating objects without any pattern. They should be some kind of flying creatures, but he did not know if they were angels or demons. Do you want to take a look? Julia asked Roy. Roy was about to agree when a voice suddenly came from behind him. I advise you not to go. Roy turned around abruptly. In his perception earlier, there was no one around. He thought that Vulgrim had run out from the purgatory space again, but it did not sound like it. After turning around, Roy and Julia saw a magic formation burning with bright flames on the ground. In the center of the magic formation was a black vortex. As the magic formation slowly rotated, a tall figure emerged from the vortex. This tall figure had a large staff in both hands. His body was hunched, and behind him was a huge coffin. When Julia saw this figure, she was clearly shocked and quickly bowed. Lord of the Hollows. Fallen Angel Julia greets you. That's right. The figure that emerged from the magic formation was the Lord of the Hollows that had freed Elthane from the ice. Roy noticed that the person Julia called the Lord of the Hollows was actually a demon. He was taller than Roy, but because he did not stand up straight, Roy was only a head shorter. Roy's eyes darted around, and like Julia, he hammered his chest and paid respects to the Lord of the Hollows. However, the Lord of the Hollows waved his hand and said, You don't need to be so polite. I'm just a demon who left the Abyss, so you don't have to follow the methods of the Abyss before me. Julia had stayed in this world much longer than Roy, so she knew some of the famous figures in this world. But Roy was a little confused. He did not know where this demon known as the Lord of the Hollows came from. However, the immense aura on the other party could not be faked. This Lord of the Hollows was at least a powerful demon at the Lord level. Therefore, Roy saluted with Julia. Although Roy saluted, he did not say a word. He thought that the Lord of the Hollows was here looking for Julia. But to his surprise, the Lord of the Hollows looked at Roy and said in a deep voice, Demon Osiris, you should be a demon who just came from the Abyss, right? He actually came to find me? And he even knows my name? What does this mean? It means that this demon lord has been secretly observing me. Roy's mind raced, but he nodded calmly. Yes. Then, do you know that the mission to hunt down the seven deadly sins should have been the mission that the Chard Council gave to Fury of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? The Lord of the Desolate Souls looked at Roy with his slightly golden scarlet eyes. Although Fury is only a pawn that the Chard Council is deceiving and casually manipulating, your actions have undoubtedly disrupted the Chard Council's plans. Aren't you afraid of the anger of the Chard Council? Chapter 179 What is the Cheesy Festival? Bah! I want to update. Oh, no, no, Your Excellency Lord of the Hollows. Roy bowed slightly. I think you must have misunderstood. The mission to capture the seven deadly sins was forced onto me by the Horseman Fury and not me deliberately causing trouble. You should have heard of Fury's temper and personality, right? How can a high-ranked demon like me dare to reject a Horseman of the Apocalypse? Roy lowered his head, but at this moment, his eyes were flashing with the cunningness of a proper demon. Roy was not quite sure what the intentions of the Lord of the Hollows were, but his tone sounded like he was here to interrogate and criticize him. Roy had used the term void power from the Warcraft world to draw Fury's attention away, and Fury had gone to investigate what was going on with the deprivation power of this world, ignoring the Seven Deadly Sins mission. This would undoubtedly anger the Charred Council, but Fury's bad temper was not easy to subdue. If the Charred Council insisted on punishing her, it was very likely that Fury would walk down the path of severing relations with them. This push should match the intentions of the behind-the-scenes plotters, Demon King Samael and the Mad Queen Lilith. 
Roy did this to make a good impression on Samael. It could not be helped. The demon kings that had appeared in this world were Samael and the Destroyer. If nothing unexpected happened, the Destroyer would definitely be killed by the horsemen of the apocalypse. There was no future if he followed him. On the contrary, the chess game directed by Samael and Lilith showed unfathomable wisdom. Even though Roy was neutral now, in essence, he still favored Samael. But it was important to note that changing Fury's original plan would certainly hurt the interests of some people because they had originally planned to use Fury as a pawn. The Chard Council was definitely one of the parties whose interests were hurt. And if he was right, the Lord of the Hollows in front of him might be one of them. Therefore, facing this kind of questioning, Roy simply refused to admit it and pushed it all onto Fury. Anyway, the Lord of the Hollows probably would not confront him. Of course, this excuse might have the possibility of angering the Lord of the Hollows. Facing a demon lord, Roy and Julia had no chance of winning, so while saying this, he was secretly preparing to activate his teleport skill. As long as he saw the slightest possibility of the Lord of the Hollows attacking, he would not hesitate to take Julia back to the Abyss. This was what he had been guarding against when he left Fat Tiger in the Abyss. However, what surprised Roy was that the Lord of the Hollows did not show any sign of anger after hearing Roy's excuse. He suddenly sighed. It seems like I really am old. You, a high-ranked demon, dared to participate in this game of chess and use fury as a pawn to pursue your own interests. But I can only hide in an alternate space and place my hopes on others. Roy looked at him in confusion, not knowing why he was sighing. However, he did not agree with what the Lord of the Hollows said. He felt that he was not a player in this game. In fact, Roy's understanding of the Lord of the Hollows was a bit off. The Lord of the Hollows did not specifically come to question him. Even without Roy's interference causing the plot to go astray, the Lord of the Hollows would have also looked for Fury of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. He would then use Fury to have her discover step by step the truth of her being deceived by the Charred Council, thereby instigating Fury to rebel. In other words, the ultimate goal of the Lord of the Hollows actually targeted the Charred Council. Back then, he left in anger because of disagreements with the other members of the Charred Council. From his point of view, the Charred Council had already decayed over the hundreds of millions of years. The Charred Council used the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse to suppress the various races to maintain the so-called balance. This point was understandable, but the crux of the issue was that this maintaining the balance began to change later. When he realized that maintaining the balance was just an excuse, and the Charred Council's true goal was to protect its rule and authority, it had already deviated from the original intention of the Charred Council's establishment. The Lord of the Hollows felt that the current Charred Council had already been corrupted and fallen, so he began to oppose the Charred Council. Similarly, there were many who were dissatisfied with the Charred Council. Angels, demons, the Lords of the Hollows, and even some ancient races. Perhaps the Charred Council did not realize that using the powerful force of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse to suppress the various races was only continuously accumulating the dissatisfaction of these races. Now, this end war between angels and demons was an opportunity for all those standing opposite the Charred Council to jump out and add fuel to the flames. To collapse the Charred Council, they first had to cut off its limbs, and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse were its limbs. When Fury descended into the human world, the Lord of the Hollows had been eyeing Fury. But unexpectedly, Roy appeared in front of Fury first and got her to leave behind the mission and leave. This prevented the Lord of the Hollows from implementing his original plan. So naturally, the Lord of the Hollows focused his gaze on Roy. He was very curious about what Roy, this high rank frost demon, wanted to do. Although the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse had always remained neutral, their chances of fighting against demons were much higher than their chances of fighting against angels. However, not only did Roy not fight Fury, but he even made Fury throw her mission to him, which was indeed unbelievable. During this period of observation, he discovered that Roy had strength far beyond that of ordinary high-ranked demons and was very smart. And he even knew how to use human weapons to fight. Strong, smart, and cunning. Although he pushed all the blame onto Fury, the Lord of the Hollows still relied on his intuition to realize that this demon might have the same aim for the Horsemen of the Apocalypse. However, the Lord of the Hollows sized Roy up and down and muttered to himself, Not enough, not enough, not enough. He said these words very faintly, so Roy could not hear them clearly. He only felt that this old man was rambling. Is it be because he's too old and a bit demented? Therefore, he immediately thought about finding an excuse to leave and stop entangling with this old demon. However, before he could come up with an excuse, 
The Lord of the Hollows pointed at the huge floating objects in the distance. Did you want to go there just now? Yes. Roy nodded and thought, I was only interrupted by your appearance. Julia replied, Your Excellency Lord of the Hollows, you said earlier that we shouldn't go. What do you mean? That's the Destroyer's Tower. The Lord of the Hollows explained, that's the home he ordered the demons to build for him. He wants to build a demon king city there and then completely rule over this entire world. Be it demons or angels, he will have them all succumb to his terror. Of course, he's currently attacking the White City, but because the Makers and some of the ancient races have also appeared in the human world, it might not be long before he returns. If you aren't his subordinates, it's best not to fall into his trap. Is that so? The Destroyer's Tower? Roy looked thoughtfully at the huge buildings floating in the sky. No wonder he could see some radiation sources flying around. They should be the demons building the tower. However, if that's the destroyer's tower, then is Samael's sealed place not far from the tower? The destroyer couldn't kill Samael and could only seal him. He should be afraid that Samael will cause him trouble after he escapes, so wouldn't it be better to build his residence near the sealed place to monitor him? Of course, Roy was not too sure either. He would ask Julia later to see if the tower was near where Samael and the destroyer had fought. But, at this moment, the Lord of the Hollows, who was persuading Roy and Julia not to go to the tower, suddenly changed the topic. It doesn't mean that you can go near the tower. There's a demon named Abraxas who is the overseer of the destroyer's tower. Demon Osiris, if you can find Abraxas and kill him, I will give you a special reward. Oh? What kind of reward? Roy asked curiously. Power power that belongs to me. The Lord of the Hollows said. Although you're much stronger than average high-ranked demons, you're still merely a high-ranked demon. In this game, you're still too weak. If you're not careful, you may be crushed to pieces. If you have this power that I reward you with, you can reach the level of a demon lord for a short time. Even though this power is only usable once, it can let you experience what kind of existence demon lords are. It's very beneficial for you to break through to the demon lord level in the future. Oh. Really? Roy's eyes lit up as he asked in surprise. Kill Abraxas, bring his heart and soul back to me, and I'll give you this power. The Lord of the Desolate Souls said. Okay, deal. Roy said straightforwardly. The Lord of the Hollows was satisfied. A magic formation appeared under his feet, and he sank back into it. After he left, Julia asked Roy, are we really going to the tower? However, what she did not expect was that Roy spat on the ground. Go my ass. Let's go find the seven deadly sins. Julia was stunned. Then. Then, what about the deal you made with him just now? That's just being perfunctory with him and getting him to leave quicker. Roy sneered. Do you think that Abraxas is that easy to kill? If we can deal with him, why doesn't the Lord of the Hollows do it himself? Listen to me and ignore this old guy. Then. Then, what should we do if he comes to find us? Julia was a little confused. What's there to be afraid of? We only said that we would kill Abraxas, but we didn't say when we would go. Roy poked Julia's forehead with his finger. Besides, there isn't even a demon contract, so it's just empty talk and without teeth. How can he manage when we go? After she came to this realization, Julia's eyes looking at Roy changed into stars. She said to Roy in admiration, Osiris, you're so devious. Well, there's nothing wrong with this word. In the abyss. Being called devious is the best praise for a demon. Julia felt that she was falling for Roy's charms more and more and could not extricate herself. Chapter 180 Trouble Comes Female demons love bad boy demons. This was how mate selection worked in the abyss. Although Julia was a fallen angel, she was still from the abyss, so she was no different from other demons. The Lord of the Hollows would never have thought that Roy, a high-ranked demon, would dare to agree casually to the condition proposed by a demon lord. However, he immediately regretted it. Perhaps it was because he had been in this world for too long and had been in the Charred Council for too long, causing the Lord of the Hollows to forget how to deal with a demon, all verbal promises without contractual restraints did not count. It was not that the power of the Lord of the Hollows was not attractive to Roy, but Roy felt that there was a pit in this job and did not want to jump in. Roy had never seen a demon named Abraxas before. But since the Lord of the Hollow not only did not take action himself but did not tell Roy Abraxas's demon rank either, how could Roy foolishly run to find trouble with him? After being perfunctory with the Lord of the Hollows and getting him to leave, Roy turned around and forgot about this matter. Of course, since the Lord of the Hollows was a demon lord, it was not good for Roy to disobey him blatantly, so the method he planned to adopt was one word, 
Stroll. As for Julia, since she followed Roy, she would definitely support his decision unconditionally. Therefore, after only the two of them were left, they followed their original plan and continued to hunt down the remaining two seven deadly sins. However, they did not leave the destroyer's tower, which was under construction, too far, and they could still vaguely see the huge floating rocks because, according to the intelligence provided by Vulgrim, Pride of the Seven Deadly Sins was nearby. Before long, Roy and Julia found Pride. Just as Fury had said, the Seven Deadly Sins were not demons, and the targets they chose to possess were also different. Pride turned out to be a four-winged angel. Furthermore, it was a female angel wearing a golden mask. Roy could not see what she looked like under the mask. But what surprised Roy was that this angel possessed by the deadly sin pride was not a fallen angel. Her wings were still pure white. Finding a demon and a fallen angel appearing with hostility, pride was unconcerned. Just like the deadly sin she represented, she stubbornly believed that she was the strongest and most perfect of the seven deadly sins. She did not even look at Roy and Julia at all, completely treating them like ants, chattering non-stop to belittle them. Regarding this, Roy felt quite speechless. He did not know where Pride's self-confidence came from. Perhaps this was the characteristic that her deadly sin gave her. After killing several seven deadly sins, Roy discovered one thing, the bodies possessed by the seven deadly sins were all chatterboxes. For example, Lust, whom he had encountered earlier, was a humanoid creature that was neither male nor female. It was fighting while chattering non-stop, attempting to seduce Roy and Julia into joining its camp. It even attempted to provoke Roy and Julia's lust. At that time, Roy and Julia had almost fallen for its trick. They were already partners and had had a taste, so they were nearly unable to bear this arousal. But in the end, it was lust to elk first because Roy had been guarding against it before the battle. Roy had created a black blizzard from the beginning, and lust fought Roy and Julia in this blizzard. But finally, it was drained of its magic power by the magic power virus. When lust realized this and wanted to escape, it was locked down by Roy's black hole and beaten by Julia. Now, Pride also began using her mouth cannon. Of course, Roy knew that the words of the seven deadly sins actually carried some of the power of the deadly sins. Every intelligent creature would more or less have some negative emotions. The seven deadly sins triggered the negative emotions of their opponents through their words and led them step by step into the domain they were good at. Therefore, as soon as they saw Pride using her mouth cannon, Roy and Julia immediately surrounded and slashed her. However, Pride's power was indeed very strong. It could be said that she had the highest combat strength among the seven deadly sins that Roy and Julia had encountered thus far. After all, her body was a four-winged angel, which was more suitable for exerting her power than the octopus and goblin bodies that they had encountered before. In the battle, Roy discovered one thing, the damage that Pride suffered during the fight instantly restored, be it sword wounds or frost wounds. At first, Roy thought that she had a powerful self-healing ability. But then he realized that this was not the case. This was because when Roy used the cover of Julia's attack to approach Pride and directly grabbed her with his hand to freeze her entire body, after about three seconds, all the ice on her body disappeared without a trace. He could not see anything resembling shattering, as though the ice had never existed. This scene made Roy and Julia very surprised, so they became even more cautious in the battle. Through constant observation, Roy gradually saw some clues. He felt that Pride's instant recovery was a bit like distorting reality. When she suffered an injury, she arrogantly denied this fact, believing that she was not actually injured, so reality distorted due to her pride, making the damage disappear without a trace. If Roy's speculation was right, then Pride was really too difficult to deal with. This ability to distort reality was simply invincible. If Roy had not noticed that her magic power decreased every time she healed like this, and she gradually began to pant during the battle, he might have turned around and left with Julia. After discovering this situation, Roy one again summoned a large-scale black blizzard. He also activated cryogenic fate to try to freeze Pride completely at the ultra-low temperature. But unfortunately, Pride's special power still eliminated her frozen state. It seemed that her reality-distorting power would take effect even with her consciousness frozen because it was always passively existing and acting on her body. Therefore, this battle could only be one of consumption, but in terms of a battle of attrition, Roy was not afraid of anyone. The large black snowflakes fell, carrying the magic power virus that could continuously devour his opponent's magic power. And Roy's cold winter armor gave him powerful magic power recovery speed. As this continued, Roy's sword would always be slashing pride. However, while the battle was continuing, 
The black blizzard brought about by Roy's magic power was noticed. It could not be helped. This blizzard covered quite a large area. Within two kilometers, the weather in the sky over this area was completely different from the surroundings, so it was difficult not to notice. Not far away, an angel army was hovering in the sky. This angel army was the angel team that came to find Uriel not long ago. The six four-winged angels leading this group of angels had turned into blood angels after using the blood oath. Coupled with the hundreds of low-level angels they led, they were considered a very powerful force among the remaining angel armies in this world. During this period of time, this angel army had been wandering this land but had not been able to find their revenge targets. Demon Lord Striga, who had killed Abaddon, was currently missing. They searched countless demon gathering points but could not find any traces of Striga. Similarly, Roy, the murderer who killed Uriel, mostly wandered underground because he had been searching for the seven deadly sins. As time passed, the six blood angels and their angel army became more and more anxious. The blood angel state formed by the blood oath could not last forever. This was the greatest drawback of becoming blood angels. Once the power of the blood oath weakened and disappeared, these six four-winged blood angels would immediately turn into bubbles and vanish from the world. Not only would their bodies be annihilated, but even their souls would completely dissipate. These six four-winged angels had paid such a high price to use the power of the blood oath to take revenge. But if they could not find their revenge targets, it meant that they would have offered their lives and souls for nothing. How could they be willing? Earlier, they had noticed a large number of low-level demons gathering in this area. After some investigation, they discovered that the demons were actually planning to build the Destroyer's Tower here. Although the Blood Angels wanted to destroy this Demon King's residence, the one supervising the construction of the tower was actually a demon lord named Abraxas. The Blood Angels did not want to use the power of their revenge on this demon lord, so they could only leave temporarily. But after leaving, they spent a large amount of time flying around but found nothing. As the time limit of the Blood Oath approached, the Blood Angels began to feel a little despair. Finally, they discussed for a long time and returned to the Destroyer's Tower once again. They felt that if they could not find the murderers, they should use the power of the Blood Oath to the greatest extent before it dissipated. It would be good if they could kill a Demon Lord and destroy the throne of the Demon King. Thus, they returned to the vicinity of the Destroyer's Tower. As a result, before they could launch an attack on the tower, they unexpectedly found a distinctive climate area in the sky, where black snow was drifting. The Angel Army looked at each, turned around, and rushed over, intending to see what was going on. Roy would never have thought that his biggest trouble was coming. Chapter 181 Army Magic On the other side, Roy and Julia were still constantly consuming Pride's magic power. Although this four-winged angel had gradually evolved the special ability of Pride, she was still not invincible, and she could not use the bugged ability to distort reality unlimitedly. The Cold Winter armor gave Roy unimaginable endurance. Even after fighting for so long, Roy still had abundant magic power, which was something beyond Pride's reach. Seeing that Pride was getting more and more exhausted and panting, and as Roy and Julia were about to win, Roy suddenly discovered a huge radiation source coming from behind in his radiation perception. Roy fired several ice spears consecutively, forcing Pride to retreat a distance, and then looked back. Roy was shocked when he found that the radiation source in the sky behind was actually an army of hundreds of angels. Roy glanced at Pride. When he saw her angel-shaped body, Roy's mind raced. What would the angels think if they came here and saw a demon and a fallen angel chasing after another angel? Let's end this quickly. Roy came to this conclusion in an instant. It was not easy to suppress pride to this extent. If he could not finish the kill this time, who knew what would happen next time? The magic power in his body surged out, and Roy used cryogenic fate again. The gases in the atmosphere liquefied and the black snowflakes floating down from the sky turned into countless sharp black blades under the control of Roy's magic power. They splashed down and cut Pride's body all over. The golden blood flowing out of the angel's body was frozen before it could even pour out of the wounds. And under the extremely low temperature, the cold corroded through the wounds. Pride desperately activated her ability to distort reality, wanting to eliminate this frozen state. But the moment she removed the frozen state, she was immediately frozen again in the next second and the severe cold washed through her entire body like a tide. No. When the last trace of magic power in her body was sucked out, and she was unable to stop herself from being frozen, Pride only had time to let out a miserable cry before being frozen to the ground. The shape of the ice sculpture was still maintaining her open hands to the sky. Julia threw her angelic sword and accurately hit the ice sculpture. With a crack, 
the ice sculpture shattered, and the body of this four-winged angel, pride, shattered into thousands of ice fragments. And without stopping to rest, Roy took out the talisman of sin and stored pride's soul in it. After doing all of this, the angel army arrived above Roy and Julia. The angel army did not dare to continue approaching. The black blizzard that enveloped a radius of two kilometers made them feel a trace of fear. But they saw the scene of Roy and Julia killing Pride. They could not distinguish Pride of the seven deadly sins clearly and only saw a masked four-winged angel die under the attack of a demon and a fallen angel. This scene made all the angels burn with anger. However, what surprised the angels the most was that their blood began to boil as they approached. Th this is. The six four-winged blood angels in the lead looked at each other. This was. The sign of the blood oath discovering a revenge target. It's not Struga. Then, are this demon and fallen angel Lady Uriel's murderers? The blood angels, who instantly came to a conclusion, could no longer suppress their anger. They drew their angelic swords, pointed them at Roy and Julia from afar, and roared, Angel Army! Execution! The next second, hundreds of angels raised their weapons in unison and launched a holy light assault on Roy and Julia below. Hundreds of golden rays of holy light condensed into an incomparably huge golden pillar of light in the blink of an eye. Like a night spear falling from the sky, it stabbed diagonally at the ground. Although they had long expected the angels to launch an attack, Roy's and Julia's hearts still jumped when they saw this spectacular combination attack. Julia reached out her hand to Roy, and Roy grabbed her. Then he instantly activated Flash and teleported back a distance. However, this distance was not enough. After Roy and Julia appeared, they immediately spread their wings and flew back. Boom! The golden pillar of holy light hit the ground where Roy and Julia had been standing, causing a powerful explosion. Roy and Julia only saw a ball that flashed blindingly with intense light at the explosion point. It was as strong as a nuclear explosion, and then the ball of light spread, bringing with it an unparalleled burning impact. Although Roy and Julia retreated fast enough, they could not compare to the speed of light. Even though they avoided the explosion. The holy light sweeping over afterwards shone on them without any blind spots. Ah! Roy and Julia screamed in pain. How rich was the holy light fired by hundreds of angels? Even though Roy was wearing the cold winter armor, and it had the effect of reducing the damage of the holy light, he was still in so much pain that he wanted to die. All the exposed skin felt scorching pain. Roy had been burned by the flames of other demons before, but the pain was incomparable to this time. Julia, a fallen angel also suffered the same burning damage. Even though she was once an angel, holy light was mainly used to evolve and disperse the dark power in the bodies of beings. When the dark power reacted, it did not matter if you were an angel or not. The two of them fell from the sky. Enduring the pain, they stood firmly on the ground. But their bodies were emitting large amounts of green smoke, and their skin was showing signs of melting. You go first. I'll stall them. Roy took out a tactical nuclear bomb from the system space and held it in his hand. Be careful. Follow me as soon as possible. Fly southeast. Julia knew that this was not the time to talk, so she immediately persevered in spreading her wings and flying toward the southeast. Roy did not think about why Julia wanted him to fly southeast. He only quietly took out a detonator and attached it to the tactical nuclear bomb. Seeing that the army magic released by hundreds of angels failed to kill Roy and Julia in one blow, the angel army stopped using it and instead spread out and surrounded the entire airspace. Roy looked up at the sky and found six angels whose wings were different from those of the other angels. They had blood-red wings. These six angels landed and stood on the ground not far from Roy. The leader pointed his sword at Roy and said hatefully, Demon! You're the murderer who killed Lady Uriel, right? They were merely reconfirming it, but it made Roy realize that this angel army was not here to avenge pride but for the killed Uriel. Roy did not answer them but threw a tactical nuclear bomb at them. Without a doubt, Roy did not need to talk nonsense. He needed to break out as soon as possible. Facing the three-meter-long missile Roy threw, the Blood Angels did not know what it was. But anything thrown by the enemy was not something good, so they immediately slashed at the missile. One of the Blood Angels severed the missile in half, but a massive explosion still followed afterward. Just like the holy light attack of the Angels, the nuclear bomb also emitted a dazzling and intense flash. The moment the flash appeared, the Blood Angels realized that something was wrong and quickly used their magic power to protect themselves. As for Roy, he took a risk this time. He did not use his frost power to protect himself but threw out two more tactical nuclear bombs in different directions one after another. The three nuclear bombs exploded almost at the same time, 
and powerful shock waves instantly swept through the entire battlefield. The encirclement formed by hundreds of angels was immediately broken through under these powerful impacts. Many of the low-level two-winged angel soldiers were burned to ashes by the high temperatures, and the rest were pushed far away by the violent wind. Roy was in the center of the explosions, so he was naturally not spared. However, the cold winder armor absorbed a portion of the high temperatures and shock waves, and he broke through along with the turbulent air waves. After stabilizing himself in the air, Roy ignored his injuries and flew southeast at the speed of sound. The explosions of Roy's three nuclear bombs covered the hundreds of angel soldiers in dust. After the dust on the ground dispersed, the blood angels realized that their revenge target had flown far away. They roared in anger and chased after him with the angel army. Chapter 182 Demon King City, Blackstone Throne Roy had no choice but to escape now. No matter how fierce he was, it was impossible for him to fight against an army of hundreds of angels. Unless Roy could use his status as a high-ranked demon to gather a group of low-level demons around him, in which case, he might be able to try fighting this angel army. But it was hard to say who would win or lose. In this angel army, the six blood red-winged angels gave Roy a very bad feeling. In his radiation perception, the radiation energy emanating from these six blood red-winged angels was very powerful. Almost every one of them was no worse than Uriel. Roy did not understand what kind of angels those with blood-colored wings were because this was the first time he had encountered this type of angel. But this did not hinder him from judging the strength of both sides. While flying southeast, Roy occasionally looked back to observe. He found that the angel army was still following him, but because of the difference in flying speeds, the formation of the angel army had changed dramatically. The ones following Roy the closest were the six blood red-winged angels. The radiation emanating from their bodies was like bright lights, and he could see them at a glance. With Roy's eyesight, he could even see the furious and distorted expressions on their faces. A little further back were some two-winged angel soldiers. These angel soldiers were probably original angels, so they were slightly stronger and could barely follow behind the six blood red-winged angels. However, it was impossible for the artificial angel soldiers. During the long-distance flight, the distance between them and their teammates in front of them gradually widened bit by bit. The entire angel army was being pulled into three segments during the pursuit. But even so, Roy had no intention of stopping. Even if he were to stop now and would only fight the six blood red-winged angels, if he could not quickly solve these six, the angel soldiers behind them would quickly surround him again. Roy could only continue flying forward. He could vaguely see the radiation source representing Julia in front. Although he did not know why Julia wanted him to fly southeast, he guessed that she had her reasons for doing so. After flying for more than two minutes, Roy caught up to Julia. Julia's flying speed was slightly slower than Roy's, so when she saw Roy catch up, she hugged Roy's waist, pressing tightly against him, and pointed at the front. Quick, continue flying. Hang on. We're almost there. Although Roy was now holding Julia, his flying speed did not slow down. Roy's definition for his demon wings was mock flight. This definition was equivalent to keeping his speed constant, and he would not slow down because of additional weight. Where are we going? Roy asked Julia while flying. A volcanic crater. Julia replied. In that volcano, there's a spatial channel that leads to the alternate space where the black stone throne. Roy's spirits instantly rose when he heard this. Julia was quite clever. Being chased by these angels they would indeed be safer hiding in an alternate space. Otherwise, Roy had no doubt that these fellows, who wanted to avenge Uriel, would chase him all the way to the end of the world. While hugging Roy tightly, Julia turned around and looked at the six four-winged angels following closely behind. She said hatefully, damn it. They're actually blood angels. These guys are staking everything. Blood angel? What the hell is that? Roy asked loudly. An angel of vengeance who has made the blood oath. Julie also explained loudly. With the oath, they can temporarily obtain powerful strength. With six blood angels, they're almost capable of killing demon lords. It seems like we can only hide in an alternate space. Roy took out a tactical nuclear bomb from the system space and handed it to Julia. I've already installed the detonator. Throw it out and let them have a good time. Roy could feel that the six blood angels behind were slowly pulling closer to him. They seemed to be willing to expend a large amount of magic power to increase their speed, and it would be troublesome if the angels intercepted them before they entered the volcano. Julia hugged Roy tightly with one hand and grabbed the missile Roy handed her with the other. This missile felt too big for her, but she could still hold it stably with her strength. For some reason, 
Julia was a little excited when she held this missile. She had seen Roy use these human weapons before and felt that the explosions were quite powerful. So at this time, Julia felt like a child who was setting off firecrackers for the first time, nervous and excited. Following what Roy said, Julia pressed the button on the detonator and quickly threw the missile without using much strength. The missile went toward the blood angels behind them. Be careful. Seeing Julia throwing the cannonball, the blood angels were alarmed. They had seen the power of this thing exploding earlier, so they hurriedly flew and spread to the sides. However, when the missile flew down the path they made, it suddenly exploded. Boom! A dazzling flash of light appeared in the sky again. The six blood angels swayed from the blast of air, almost falling. They were fine, but the explosion blocked them, and they were a little farther away from Roy. However, the angel soldiers slightly farther behind were unlucky. As they advanced, they collided with the huge blast wave head-on. Under the confrontation of the two forces, they were squeezed to the point of almost vomiting blood. In this way, Roy and Julia threw tactical nuclear bombs from time to time to stop the angels from advancing. The two sides were in a deadlock as they flew hundreds of kilometers. At this time, the terrain below changed. A continuous mountain range appeared on the ground, and at the same time, a colossal volcano was in sight. This volcano was very famous in this world because it was full of scorching flames and magma. Someone had once vowed that they had seen demons fly out of the volcanic crater, so the humans of this world called this place the Gate of Hell. Of course, although the people of this world called this volcano this name, they did not believe it deep down. Before angels and demons came to this world, scientific thought had always occupied a superior position in the minds of humans. This so-called Gate of Hell was more like a method to attract tourists. But who knew that this place was really a gate of hell? In fact, there were many entrances to alternate spaces on this earth. They were the gates that could connect to other alternate spaces. However, these gates to alternate spaces were not like the huge vortexes that movies depicted. But they were rather ordinary and without the slightest flaw. It was like you were clearly looking at a mountain or a wall in front of you, but when you bumped into it, you would find yourself in another space. Of course, you could enter some alternate spaces in this way, but some were encrypted and required unlocking to enter. Under Julia's guidance, Roy flew to the crater and quickly rushed into the volcano. The blood angels behind them seemed to realize what Roy and Julia were trying to do, and they quickly expended a large amount of magic power to accelerate. After breaking through the volcanic smog formed from sulfur smoke and countless particles, Roy and Julia arrived at the bottom of the volcano. Although the magma here was not completely cooled, it formed a fragile solidified layer on the surface. Roy stepped on it carefully, and magic power poured out from his feet. He used frost to solidify the magma a bit more before putting Julia down. Holding her fallen angelic sword, Julia walked to the volcanic wall and stabbed the sword into a rock on it. Then a strange scene happened. Her sword did not pierce through the rock, but the place where Julia's sword stabbed was rippling, and the front part of her sword disappeared. As Julia slowly turned her sword, the ripples created by spatial fluctuations were gradually expanding. As a personal guard, His Majesty Samael bestowed me the right to enter the Black Stone freely. Julia explained without looking back. This sword is the key to open the space where the Demon King City is. But after the corruption power eroded the Black Stone, His Majesty Samael had no choice but to move out. It has been a long time since I've been to the Black Stone, so I'm not sure what it's like inside. If, I mean if the Black Stone has been completely eroded, then what awaits us will also be huge trouble. After all, if corruption is really the void power you mentioned. Hurry up. We don't have a choice now. Roy looked up the crater above. There, six blood angels were roaring and already charging straight down. After hearing this, Julia did not say anything else and continued to turn her longsword slowly. With a pop, a circular channel opened up, and they could even see the scene of the opposite world through it. However, Roy and Julia no longer had the time to look. She withdrew her longsword and jumped in with Roy. Just after they entered, the channel began to close slowly. But unexpectedly, just as the channel was about to close, the six blood angels arrived, and they seized the last opportunity to rush into the channel. Chapter 183 Command Authority Those who had not seen the black stone with their own eyes would definitely find the scene here unimaginable. In this space, there was a sky that was always dim, and the entire world seemed to be shrouded in a layer of haze. The air here was like the abyss full of the pungent smell of sulfur and flames. The ground was black. It was a land formed by cooled magma. In addition, there were no traces of plants. 
The black stone throne stood on a lone island with a sea of red magma surrounding it. But this was only in the past. Now, a bright sun appeared in the black stone space. It was a massive golden vortex. Compared to the dim yellow color of this world, it looked dazzling. It hung high in the sky of this space, and in the center was a deep darkness that could not be seen nor approached. This massive vortex rotated slowly, but it brought with it an unparalleled powerful gravitational force, as though the center of the vortex was a true black hole. All the matter in this world was torn apart, broken down, and then turned into rubble and dust that were sucked into the sky and then entered the vortex. When Roy and Julia entered this place, they saw this scene. Even standing on the ground, Roy felt that he was being pulled upward and could only lower his center of gravity to resist. Julia had a surprised expression as she looked at the black stone throne standing high at the top of the black mountain in the distance. She had not been here for a long time, so when she first saw the situation of the black stone, she found that the erosion had intensified. More than half of the black stone throne, the city of the demon king, had been sucked into the vortex in the sky, and the damage was getting worse. The two of them did not stay where they were long. After entering this space, they appeared on a wide road paved with black rocks. After exchanging glances, they ran toward the top of the mountain. Due to the corruption devouring power in the sky, they did not dare to fly and could only run. Be careful. Don't get caught. Julia said to Roy as she ran. Also, the flow of time in this space is different from the outside world. Hearing this, Roy stole a glance at the spatial channel, which was slowly closing, and asked, is it faster or slower than the outside world? It's faster. Ten minutes here is about one minute outside. Julia replied. About ten times? Roy sighed. That's bad. Can this channel close in time? It's all right. Julia said. I brought you here because there are still a large number of demon guards left in the Black Stone Throne. Now that Lord Samael isn't here, we can command these demon guards. With their help, even if those blood angels chase in, we might be able to deal with them without the angel army. The two of them did not say anything else and hurried along the path to the Black Stone Throne. After they had run some distance, six figures rushed into this space just as the spatial channel was about to close completely. Due to the difference in the flow of time, Although the six blood angels seemed to have rushed inside less than three seconds behind Roy and Julia, there was about half a minute between them when they arrived in this space. Roy and Julia had already run far away, so the blood angels could not intercept them immediately after rushing in. After entering this space, the six blood angels were all stunned when they saw the scene in the sky. Perhaps most angels had heard of the existence of the Black Stone, but there were very few angels who could truly enter the Black Stone. This extremely oppressive world was like a real hell making the blood angels very uncomfortable. However, they were only stunned for a moment. After all, after making the blood oath, they were already determined to die, so even if they came to the demon's headquarters, it was the same for them. After returning to their senses, they noticed the figures of Roy and Julia running ahead and subconsciously wanted to fly up and chase after them. But the moment they flew up, they found that their bodies were being sucked up uncontrollably, so they could only flap their wings and fall back to the ground. The six blood angels looked unwillingly at the massive vortex in the sky, but they could only follow on foot. The path to the top of the mountain was not too long. Soon, Roy and Julia arrived in front of the Black Stone Throne. It was a huge city in the typical demonic style, and black was the main color of this city. The entire city gave off a ghostly feeling. It had solid city walls that were tens of meters thick, and the city walls were full of fierce, sharp sculptures that looked like demon horns. These densely packed sharp sculptures pierced into the sky like a sword mountain, full of the meaning of rebellion. A thick, 15-meter tall gate appeared in front of Roy and Julia. On the gate was a three-dimensional pattern of a demon skull, and its dark eyes seemed to stare at everyone that approached the gate. But Julia did not even look at it. She walked forward, inserted her long sword into the skeleton's mouth, and injected magic power into it. First came a loud click, then a loud rumbling sound and the city gate slowly opened. Before the gate fully opened, Roy and Julia rushed in through the gap. After entering the gate, Roy saw a large number of demons holding weapons. These demons stared at Roy and Julia rushing in with their scarlet eyes, seemingly confirming whether or not they were intruders. As Julia had said, there were many demons in the black stone throne. Roy took a casual glance around and could not see any low-rank demons at all. The guards here were almost all middle-rank demons. Each of them looked strong and powerful, and even the weapons in their hands looked very powerful. It seemed that the guards in the Black Stone Throne were all elites among demons. 
I am a personal guard of His Majesty Samael, the fallen angel Julia. Julia drew her longsword and stabbed it into the ground. She shouted at the demon guards present, Now, I'll take over all the guards for the time being. Prepare to meet the invaders from heaven. Logically speaking, when Samael left, he had taken away almost all the high-ranked demons and demon leaders of the Black Stone throne, so after Julia returned, she had the authority to command them. But strangely, after hearing Julia's loud shout, these demon guards looked at her indifferently. It was not that they were actually indifferent. The scarlet light in the eyes of these demons was flickering, but none of them moved in response to Julia's command. Damn it! Are you deaf? Julia was taken aback for a moment before she flew into a rage out of humiliation. She drew her longsword from the ground and placed it on the neck of the demon closest to her. Did you hear what I said? The sword on the demon guard's neck did not fluster him at all. He only said, Your Excellency, you don't have the authority to command in this city. Huh? Why? Julia wanted to ask, but Roy stopped her. Don't panic. Roy whispered. Let's go in a little. It doesn't matter if they won't listen to your command. I don't believe that they'll remain indifferent when those blood angels rush in. Julia thought that it was indeed true, so she stopped talking and joined the group of demons with Roy. Behind them, the six blood angels were approaching the gate. The gate was still open, so they immediately saw the dense group of demon guards behind the gate. They could not help but stop and hesitate a little. But then they saw Roy and Julia, who had mixed into the crowd and were looking at them. Under the power of the blood oath, the blood in the blood angels began to boil again, constantly reminding them that their revenge targets were right in front of them. Therefore, the blood angels no longer cared so much and roared angrily as they charged into the gate with their weapons. As a result, as soon as they entered the gate, the demon guards immediately moved, as though some kind of stress mechanism had triggered them. They also let out low roars and rushed toward the blood angels with their weapons. The battle between angels and demons unfolded in an instant. The six blood angels had their backs to each other, forming a small circle, as they fought against the demons. They continuously waved the angelic swords in their hands and slashed the demons. Purple blood splattered into the air. It was naturally impossible for middle rank demons to be the opponents of these blood angels, but there were too many of them. When the demons in front fell, the demons behind immediately filled up the gap, and even more demon guards poured out from the depths of the castle. Previously, Roy was in the disadvantageous situation of being outnumbered, but he did not expect the situation to reverse so quickly, and now the blood angels were outnumbered. Roy and Julia hid behind, allowing the demon guards to consume the blood angels' magic power. But they did not just look on and do nothing. Roy raised Frostmourne, and an immense amount of magic power surged out, condensing a huge ice block weighing tens of tons above the city. Then he swung his sword, and the ice block went smashing toward the middle of the blood angels. Of course, this huge ice meteorite could not hide from the blood angels, but they were powerless to stop it. When they saw the ice meteorite falling, they only had time to warn their companions to be careful before scattering. Boom! Although the ice meteorite had not been that high up, it still brought tremendous force when it smashed down. Not only did an enormous pit appear on the ground, but the huge vibrations caused the ground to tremble a few times. However, the purpose of this ice meteorite was not to injure these enemies but to separate the blood angels. With such a huge obstacle, the blood angels could no longer help their companions and could only fight separately. Under the siege of so many demon guards, they were at ease in the beginning, but it quickly became difficult. If they were not careful, the demon guards would cut them. In a short time, the six blood angels were injured one after another. Although their injuries were not fatal, their blood was flowing out. The blood angels also realized that they should not continue wasting time like this, so one of the blood angels launched a surprise attack at Roy. He ignored the siege of the surrounding demons, spread his wings, and charged straight at Roy. However, a black ice wall blocked him halfway. Roy had been guarding against this move. The battle at the city gate was fierce. And in the depths of the castle, with the vibration caused by the ice meteorite, bubbles suddenly started appearing on the surface of a huge magma pool. These bubbles burst again and again, from the small amount at the beginning to becoming more and more concentrated, as though something was about to rise from the magma pool. Chapter 184 Turning Point The battle at the gate of the Black Stone Throne continued. Countless demon guards rushed at the six blood angels fearlessly and fell under the swords of the blood angels or turned into ashes under their holy light magic. Although the blood angels killed numerous demon guards, 
they had no time to care about the exposed souls of the slain demons, so these souls quickly turned into streams of light and flew into the depths of the black stone throne. Seeing this scene, the hearts of the blood angels sank. As angels from the white city, they naturally understood that this demon king city was actually the same as the white city. In addition to having powerful defensive strength, there was also an important Placithi reincarnation pool. Under the protection of the powerful magic of the demon king city, the souls of all the demons who died here would not return to the abyss but would resurrect nearby in the demon king city. Precisely because of these reincarnation pools, the white city and the black stone throne had become base camps of angels and demons. As long as the reincarnation pools still had energy and magic power, such cities were difficult to conquer. To be honest, the blood angels did not expect that Roy and Julia would introduce them into the black stone space. But since they had entered, they could only brace themselves. They knew that they would not be able to escape death, but it was worth it if they could complete the revenge of the blood oath. So while fighting the demon guards, they were desperately trying to find an opportunity to kill Roy and Julia. The power of the blood oath had reached its peak in them, making them look invincible. However, Roy and Julia were constantly falling back. They were not stupid. How could they be willing to go forward and fight these blood angels who had entered a berserk state? Even if both sides suffered heavy losses, it was a loss to Roy. With so many demon troops to consume the blood angels, they naturally had to retreat. Roy and Julia had almost retreated to the castle gate. The square hundreds of meters in front of them was full of demon guards charging forward. With such a thick shield wall, it was simply a dream for the blood angels to rush over. Most importantly, because of the massive vortex of corruption power, the sky above the demon king city was like a forbidden zone. If they did not want to be sucked in by the vortex, then the blood angels could only fight on foot. Their wings and flying abilities were completely useless. Roy and Julia became onlookers here. From time to time, they used magic to support the demon guards, causing the blood angels to roar angrily but helplessly again and again. How long do you think they can last? Roy asked Julia with a smile. An hour? Julia guessed. Roy estimated and felt that it was about right. He was about to answer when he suddenly heard a voice in his ear. That won't do, little fellows. If it really takes that long, someone will be unhappy. This voice made Roy shudder all over. When he heard this voice in his ears, it could be said to be the best sound in the world. Not only did it have strong magnetism, but every note seemed to pluck at his heartstrings, and an inexplicable sense of heat appeared in his body, causing his imagination to start wandering in an instant. Beside him, Julia felt even more unbearable than Roy. Her eyes instantly became blurry, and she could not help but stick her body to Roy's and began touching herself and Roy with both hands. Realizing that something was wrong, Roy hurriedly forced himself to remain clear-headed. At the same time, he activated his eyes of nightmare. The light in his eyes shined, and the pentagram in his pupils appeared. However, it was useless because the voice did not have any illusion effect. Clank clank. A slight ringing sound of metal chains, accompanied by footsteps, gradually approached Roy and Julia from behind. Roy pinched himself hard with his sharp nails and finally regained his mobility. He turned around and looked behind. The first thing he saw was a pair of bold and free giants. These things were trembling in front of Roy's eyes, causing Roy to be stunned. He forced his eyes to look away, and when he looked up, he saw the face of a succubus. Yes, this was a succubus taller than Roy. She stood in front of Roy, staring at him with her head lowered. Her golden demon eyes were full of charm, but this charm was not directed at Roy but was always like this. When Roy looked into her eyes, the tall succubus naturally saw the pentagrams in Roy's eyes. She bowed slightly and leaned in front of Roy while carrying a slight sense of suppression. She reached out and pinched Roy's chin between her fingers. Did Roy dare to move? No, he did not dare to move at all now. Therefore, he could only let the succubus pinch his chin and tilt her head to appreciate the pentagrams in his eyes. At this point, even if Roy was stupid, he still knew who the person in front of him was. Who else could it be other than the Mad Queen Lilith? The first succubus of the abyss. Her name could be found in all kinds of human myths and legends. Lilith's image was different in these legends, but just by looking at how many there were, you could tell how famous she was. It was no wonder that when Julia tried to command the demon guards of the Blackstone throne, they told her that she did not have this authority. With a demon king like Lilith around, how could a high-ranked demon take over command? However, Roy was very puzzled. Why was Lilith here? Julia had once said that Lilith and Samael had separated. Samael led the demon army and started the end war against heaven, while Lilith had gone to another alternate space. 
since she said it was another, it definitely did not refer to the black stone space. Roy looked at Julia from the corner of his eyes. Lilith's powerful charming ability seemed to have disappeared, and Julia's eyes became clearer. But Roy found that she was staring at Lilith with wide eyes in disbelief. It appeared that meeting Lilith here was also beyond her expectations. Previously, Roy had suspected that Julia had done this on purpose. After all, she had always wanted to find Lilith to save Samael, but judging from her expression, Julia should not have lied to him and had not deliberately deceived him to come here to find Lilith. At this moment, Lilith released Roy's chin and looked at Roy and Julia curiously. Little fellows, who are you? Why can you enter this sealed black stone? And you brought a group of blood angels? Hearing this question, Julia finally reacted and hurriedly knelt on one knee. Mother Lilith, I am Julia, a personal guard under His Majesty Samael. His Majesty Samael once bestowed me permission to enter the black stone, so. So, that's how it is. Lilith placed her hands on her hips, and the sound of metal chains shaking came from her movements. Roy then noticed that apart from wearing demon armor that perfectly accentuated her figure, she also had some strange black chains around her waist and hands. But these black chains did not restrain her but looked more like decorations. After carefully recalling, Roy vaguely remembered that Samael also had such chains. When he had gathered at the Abyss outpost, he had seen them before, and he did not know what these chains were for. Lilith had a long tail behind her, but unlike the other succubi in the Abyss, her legs were not recurved demon hooves but a pair of long and slender legs like those of human women. Moreover, she wore a pair of high heels on her feet, matching her great figure making her look very sensual. However, she was still a demon. On her back was a pair of demon wings that soared into the sky, and on her head were huge demon horns that looked like a crown. How should he put it? She was indeed worthy of being the first succubus in the abyss. In addition to her voice that had made Roy's entire body feel extremely hot earlier, Roy felt his mouth go dry when he was secretly sizing her up. He wanted to rush up and push her to the ground. Lilith was actually so powerful that she was even unconsciously radiating seduction power from head to toe. In addition to this seduction power, Roy could also feel the majestic power of fire elements from her. It seemed that Lilith was also a big shot at playing with fire. Lilith naturally noticed that Roy was secretly sizing her up, but she did not mind at all. She knew how hard it was for demons to resist her charms. She merely raised her head looked at their blood angels fighting against the demon guards, and said, although the black stone throne has a reincarnation pool, we can't waste its energy. If these little red-winged fellows continue to cause trouble like this, the demon king city will lose face. While speaking, Lilith raised her hand and waved it gently. Roy and Julia looked over and saw one of the six blood angels suddenly stop moving after Lilith's action. Then his eyes turned red. Ignoring the demon guards around him, he raised his angelic sword and slashed another blood angel. Damn it! Are you crazy? Why did you attack me? The cut blood angel looked at his companion in astonishment. However, the blood angel who was charmed by Lilith did not respond at all and continuously attacked his companions. The other blood angels noticed the situation here, but they did not understand what was going on because a large number of demons were surrounding them. They could not see where Roy and the others were, and they naturally did not discover that Demon King Lilith had appeared. Seeing the blood angels fighting among themselves, Lilith curved her mouth into a satisfied smile and waved her hand again, charming two more blood angels. Like this, she immediately controlled half of the blood angels, and they began fighting the other three blood angels. They could not resist Lilith's power at all. Roy could not help but narrow his eyes when he saw this. Of course, he had seen how the succubi of the abyss had used this temptation power, but compared to Lilith, it could be said that the charming power of those succubi, was simply. With the internal strife among the blood angels, the demon guards naturally stopped. They surrounded the blood angels and watched them fight each other. Precisely because of this, the three sober blood angels finally discovered Lilith's existence in the distance. Almost instantly, their hearts turned cold. Chapter 185 Questioning After entering the Black Stone Throne, Roy had planned to fight the blood angels head-on after the demon guards consumed them, but Lilith's appearance broke his original plan. There was no big shot who disdained to take action and just watch the drama from the side. After Lilith appeared, she directly attacked the Blood Angels. It was probably because this was the Demon King City, so Lilith naturally could not tolerate the angels acting wildly here. Moreover, as she had said earlier, the reincarnation pool required energy. If the Demon Guards died in large numbers, it would consume a lot of the reincarnation pool's energy. Of course, 
Roy was happy that the big shot took action. But he did not expect that Lilith would not kill the Blood Angels directly but instead charm them and watch them kill each other. Lilith was simply toying with them. The life of the Demon King must be very boring, Roy thought. The Blood Angels naturally understood that their companions were charmed by Lilith, so they tried their best to avoid their companions' attacks. They could not bear to fight back, and as they dodged, they shouted loudly at their companions, attempting to wake them up. But it was all futile. Under Lilith's powerful control, the Blood Angels had no chance of escaping. Before long, a Blood Angel finally fell under his companion's swords. Two charmed Blood Angels pierced his chest one after the other. When they killed him, the eyes of the two charmed Blood Angels were still red, completely lacking any mercy. Demon Woman. After seeing this scene, the leader of the Blood Angels roared angrily at Lilith, then decisively swung his sword and killed a charmed companion in front of him. The other Blood Angel who was still clear-headed followed suit and cooperated with the leading Blood Angel to kill the two remaining charmed Blood Angels. They had personally ended the lives of their companions. This blow was extremely huge to the Angels. In such a short time, only the two of the original six Blood Angels remained. But before they could recover from their grief, Lilith raised her hand again and easily controlled them. But this time, Lilith did not have them fight each other. Instead, she controlled them to cross their angelic swords and swipe them across each other's necks. Golden blood sprayed out more than a foot high. At the very last moment of their lives, the two blood angels finally escaped her control, but they slowly fell to the ground with confusion in their eyes. Done. Lilith clapped her hands lightly, looking as though it was as effortless as coming out to throw out a pile of trash. The six blood angels that could kill a demon lord were killed like puppets in Lilith's hands. Roy could not help but shiver after seeing this. Lilith's charm control ability was too bug-like. It seemed like he had to make some equipment to guard against this kind of control in the future. All along, because he was a frost demon and used frost power, Roy was the only one controlling others when facing multiple enemies. But now that he saw Lilith's power, even he felt a little afraid. The blood angels were dead, and six blood-red souls with a golden color in the center floated out. These souls that the blood oath had stimulated were supposed to dissipate like ordinary souls. But Lilith stretched out her hand, and the six souls flew in front of her. Roy did not know what kind of magic she used, but she quickly controlled the process of the souls dissipating and put away the six souls. The souls of blood angels are really rare. I don't know how different they are from the souls of ordinary angels, so I can research them. Lilith murmured to herself, but her words seemed to be meant for Roy and Julia. After the matter with the blood angels was over, she turned around and looked at Roy and Julia. Now, it's your turn follow me. Lilith's tone revealed an irrefutable meaning, causing Julia to look at Roy worriedly. She did not know what Lilith was thinking. The Mad Queen Lilith nickname was not for nothing. Lilith was notorious for being temperamental, and she never acted according to reason, which was why she had this nickname. Although Samael had indeed granted Julia permission to access the Black Stone space, it was now Lilith who made the decisions in the Demon King City. Who knew what her attitude toward this was? Therefore, it was not impossible for her to be angry and punish Julia and Roy. The two of them followed Lilith into the depths of the Demon King city. Although Roy's heart was thumping, he could not help but curiously look at the scenery along the way. Lilith led them around the city, and they finally came to a bedchamber. The reason why he said it was a bedchamber was that there was a huge bed in this hall. Although this bed was not as big as a fantastical 50,000 square meter house, it still occupied about half of the hall. In particular, the carvings of skulls and demons on this bed were even more eye-catching. What Roy and Julia did not know was that there was only one throne in this castle, and that was Samael's throne. Even Lilith did not dare to sit on it, so Lilith brought Roy and Julia to her bedchamber to discuss some matters. The light sound of the chains came as Lilith lay down on the big bed. She lay on her side seductively and looked at Roy and Julia. They could only obediently kneel on one knee in front of the bed and wait for Lilith to inquire. Lilith asked Julia, since you're Samael's personal guard, why are you here with this frost demon? Julia did not dare to hide it, so she talked about the battle between Samael and the destroyer. However, she remembered what Roy had reminded her before, so even though she told Lilith about Samael's situation, she did not beseech her to save him. Roy was observing Lilith's expression from the corner of his eyes without showing any trace. Sure enough, when she heard that Samael was defeated and sealed, Lilith did not show any surprise. She only said, so, it's like this. Okay, get up. It's not your fault. 
with your strength as a high rank demon, it's indeed difficult for you to intervene in the battle between demon kings. Julia replied respectfully and stood up. Then Lilith looked at Roy. The moment Lilith asked her question, Roy was shocked. I haven't seen a high rank demon frost demon for a long time. Are you demon Osiris? Your Majesty Lilith, how do you know my demon name? Roy asked carefully. Because not long before you came, a visitor came to this space. Lilith was lying on the bed with an arm holding her head and smiling. This visitor was a horseman of the apocalypse. Roy heaved a sigh of relief. Was it fury? However, Lilith's answer was unexpected. No, it was death. Roy was stunned. Death? Then, how do you? Because he learned your name from Fury and told me after coming here. Lilith explained. Roy was relieved. He quickly recalled to mind that in the original game plot, Death seemed to have come to the Black Stone and seen Lilith. However, why was Death so fast? But then he remembered that the flow of time in these alternate spaces was not the same as the flow of time in the main world. Some were faster, while others were slower. After the Charred Council imprisoned war, Death had been searching for ways to resurrect humanity in various alternate spaces in order to clear a war's name. Because of the differences in the flow of time, his progress might be much faster than Roy had expected. Has only Death come here? Roy asked, wondering where Fury was. However, Lilith did not answer and instead told Roy with great interest, you should have seen the massive corruption vortex in the sky above the Demon King City. In your words, this corruption power in other worlds is known as the Void, so I'm quite curious about your experience. Tell me the story you told Fury. Yes. Roy replied respectfully while his thoughts moved quickly. Clearly, Death has come here to see Lilith. I don't know what his purpose was, but he must have talked with Lilith about corruption power. Otherwise, Lilith would not have deliberately left Julia and me behind to talk after meeting the storyteller. Roy was thinking about why Lilith wanted to hear the story he made up again. What is her motive? Moreover, most importantly, Fury found death, so does he know from Fury about whether I'm pursuing the secrets of the Nephilim, and has he told Lilith my intentions? If possible, of course Roy wanted to obtain the secrets of the Nephilim from Lilith, the creator of the Nephilim, rather than from Fury, a second-generation Nephilim. But Roy was really uncertain about what kind of attitude Lilith would have after knowing his intentions. He was only a high-ranked demon and was too far away from the Demon King hierarchy. Therefore, when he made a deal with Fury, it was only settling for the second best solution. His mind turned quickly, but he did not delay and recounted the story he told Fury. Chapter 186 Red Sea Egg While Roy spoke, Lilith did not ask any questions and only listened quietly. After Roy finished narrating, she was silent for a long time before suddenly asking, Did you say that void power can not only corrupt Titan world souls but also the so-called gods? Is that right? Yes. Roy was stunned for a bit before nodding. In that case, it seems that His Majesty Samael's concerns are right. Lilith propped up her body. Not only him, but even Heaven has noticed. Huh? What do you mean? Lilith's earlier words did not match her latter words, and Roy did not understand for a moment. Lilith got down from the bed and walked back and forth around her bedchamber. The main world of this world is Earth, but I'm certain that this planet hasn't given birth to a Titan world soul. But as you've also seen, corruption, or void power has also eroded this world. In many alternate spaces, scenes like the Black Stone being devoured have appeared. Since void power doesn't have a Titan world soul to corrupt here, it might corrupt those gods. A thought popped into Roy's mind. You mean the Charred Council? Yes, the Charred Council. Lilith nodded approvingly. You're indeed very smart. I'm talking about the Charred Council. You should have been summoned here from the Abyss during the End War so you might not know the origin of the Charred Council. Lilith continued. In fact, after discovering this world, angels and demons have been fighting each other for this world because it is very suitable to develop into a new heaven territory or abyss territory. At that time, the Charred Council had yet to exist. This endless war has lasted for a long time, for millions of years. In this war, countless angels and demons have died in this world. Gradually, a group of angels and demons began to feel tired of this life of war because many of them had not been able to return to heaven or the abyss and had been staying in this world to fight unceasingly. Even angels and demons were about to go crazy with this kind of life. Therefore, they privately joined forces and established the Charred Council. They claimed that the Charred Council obtained the Oracle of the Creator and used it to formulate a code of laws, hoping to end the endless war between angels and demons. 
At that time, the members of the Chard Council only elected two seats, and an angel and a demon each occupied one. Moreover, the angel and demon were very powerful and not weaker than demon kings. You know that councils are very difficult to reach a consensus on many issues if there are multiple seats. Therefore, when the Chard Council was established, it had no deterrence to angels and demons, and it often fell into a chaos of opinions. So at that time, neither heaven nor hell paid attention to the Chard Council's orders and completely treated them as idiots and clowns. However, the turning point appeared when humanity was born in the main world. Lilith sank into her memories and said in deep thought, I don't know if the Chard Council really obtained the Creator's Oracle, but ever since it accepted the human with the most wisdom and power among the primitive humans as a member of the Council, the seats of the Council became three, and the power of the Chard Council rapidly grew. The combat strength of its army soared, and it began to fight the angels and demons on equal footing, making the angels and demons have no choice but to face this force head on. At the same time, it also tried its best to protect the still fragile humans declaring that humans were also an important part of the balance of the world. Out of curiosity, I started researching humans. Lilith said. I have to say that humans are indeed a very miraculous species. Precisely because of this research, I discovered that humans could actually fuse with the bloodlines of angel and demon at the same time. The Nephilim were born at that time. But an accident happened afterward. I discovered that the Nephilim I created were actually failures. They were tyrannical, violent, and bloodthirsty. Maybe it was because the angel and demon bloodlines in their bloodlines failed to reach a balance, and they were more inclined toward the demon side. The Nephilim did not have a large population, and they only reproduced for two generations before being recruited by the Chard Council. This is the origin of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I believe you've heard it. Roy and Julia nodded and did not interrupt Lilith. After obtaining the allegiance of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Chard Council became even more unstoppable. At that time, the Chard Council had already begun to proclaim itself as the spokesperson and manager of the Creator in this world, with authority like God's. They began forcefully intervening in the war between angels and demons and ordered us to stop fighting. All those who opposed them were buried under the iron hooves of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The truce agreement was finally reached. Although both angels and demons were unwilling, considering that the war had indeed gone on for too long, they ultimately agreed to the truce. Lilith said. This is the origin of the seven seals that are spread among the various ancient races. Roy nodded, finally understanding the entire history of the Chard Council. Lilith concluded, this truce lasted for thousands of years, giving humanity a chance to recuperate and develop into what it is today. Similarly, as time passed, the status of the Chard Council became higher and higher. It's possible to say that they are the gods of this world. Seeing Lilith's speech come to an end, Roy finally found an opportunity to interrupt and ask, so, you think that while void power is eroding this world, it's also incubating in these so-called gods of the Chard Council? Lilith nodded. Yes, no one understands more about incubation than demons. It's nothing more than continuously enlarging the darkness in the depths of intelligent life and pushing it toward a dangerous extreme. This is something that many demons can do. The difference is that demons might not be as powerful as the void lords you mentioned, and they can't bestow such power onto the corrupted. The Chard Council has been in a superior position for the past thousands of years. It has made demands of all the races, and no one can resist its will. Perhaps it's because of this burgeoning mentality that we've found that the Chard Council's methods have become more and more extreme in recent years. Although it says that it's maintaining the balance, it's more like it's maintaining its ruling position many times. Therefore, we have reason to suspect that it has been corrupted. Pardon my frankness, Your Majesty Lilith, but why did you tell us this? Roy asked thoughtfully. I heard from death that you made a deal with Fury in exchange for the secrets of the Nephilim. Is that right? Lilith looked straight at Roy. Sure enough, Roy's previous guess came true. Fury had indeed told death about him and the content of their deal. After coming to the Blackstone and meeting Lilith, perhaps death was also investigating the true situation of the power of corruption, so he told Lilith the whole thing. Of course, it could also be that Lilith had fished out these words from death's mouth. But no matter what, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, whether it was fury or death, had no obligation to keep secrets for him, an abyss demon. In fact, because it involved the secrets of the birth of the Nephilim, they were worried that this demon was up to something. Informing Lilith, the creator of the Nephilim, might even arouse her anger. Although it might have not been good to say that, Roy felt that they would certainly be happy to see demons biting each other like dogs. Roy understood the intentions hidden beneath the surface of the horsemen of the apocalypse. However, 
Judging from Lilith's tone and attitude, she did not seem to care much about him pursuing the secrets of the Nephilim. Hmm, maybe Lilith also sensed Death's true intention, so she did not fall for it. This was definitely a good thing for Roy. Therefore, Roy did not say anything, but his expression was equivalent to tacit agreement. Finally, Lilith said, Little guy, you don't need to be so nervous. Although I'm the creator of the Nephilim, in fact, to me, the Nephilim are just the failed products of an experiment, and it's not worth me making a fuss over it. You wanting to know the secrets of the Nephilim is nothing more than you seeking the means to promote to Demon Lord. I can tell you how to create Nephilim, but how do you plan to repay me? When Roy heard this, his mind raced. Strength? Authority? Money? Souls? Lilith probably doesn't lack these things. She was a demon king, and Roy was only a high-ranked demon. No matter how Roy looked at it, these things did not seem to be something Roy could give. Therefore, Roy sounded out, Your Majesty Lilith, perhaps I can only offer you my loyalty. In fact, Roy still had a hidden thought in his heart. He felt that there was something else he could give, his body. He believed that a succubus like Lilith was like those succubi in the abyss, feeling very hungry slash thirsty. Maybe I can. Sleep with her? It had to be said that Lilith's charm was too powerful. Even though she had restrained it now, Roy still could not help but have such thoughts. However, he suddenly remembered that Lilith was Samael's partner in this world. If I really sleep with her, wouldn't I be giving Samael a green hat? Fuck, that's courting death. If Samael knows, would he tear me apart? At the thought of this, Roy quickly suppressed his unrealistic idea. Fortunately, he kept his head lowered, and Lilith did not see his eyes and expression. Facing Roy's question, Lilith shook her head unexpectedly. I don't need your loyalty, but you might be able to help me do something. What is it? Roy asked. When the Chard Council secretly recruited the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, not only did it have them kill all their compatriots but also steal something from me. Lilith's expression flickered. The Red Sea Egg. It's a key item to create the Nephilim. After losing this Red Sea Egg, even I can no longer create Nephilim. After the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, no third generation of Nephilim has been born. What I want you to do is to find a way to snatch the Red Sea Egg from the Charred Council and bring it back to me. Then I will fulfill my promise and tell you how to fuse the bloodlines and souls of angels and demons. Wouldn't the Red Sea Egg be in the Charred Council? Roy asked in astonishment. You want me to go to the Charred Council space? That's the problem you have to consider. Lilith waved her hand at Roy. I only gave you a chance because you brought information about void power, but I have countless high-ranked demons under me. If you can't seize this opportunity, it's your problem. Now, you can leave this place. Seeing Lilith wave them away, Roy and Julia did not dare to say anything else, and they could only withdraw from Lilith's bedchamber. But after they left, Lilith revealed an intriguing smile. Chapter 187 Roy's Ambition after Julia used her fallen angelic sword to open the spatial gate of the Black Stone once again, Roy and Julia returned to the main world. Due to the different flow rates of time, despite Roy and Julia having stayed in the Black Stone for several hours, only an hour had passed in the main world. They flew out of the volcanic crater and into the air. When they returned, Julia said to Roy, What should we do regarding the mission Mother Lilith gave us? Lilith had asked Roy to go to the Charred Council to find the so called Red Sea Egg, but in fact, she had said this to Roy and Julia and handed them the mission. Although Roy and Julia did not show anything unusual, Lilith, as a succubus, could easily smell the mixed smell on them, so of course, she understood their relationship. Hearing Julia's question, Roy smiled helplessly. After becoming high-ranked demons, although it was a good thing for their strength to increase, it seemed that these demon lord and demon king big shots were beginning to like assigning missions to high-ranked demons. Of course, from another perspective, this was also proof that Roy's strength had entered the eyes of the big shots. In the human world, this was the appreciation of his boss. But the problem was that the big shots did not seem to like to consider whether Roy had the ability to complete these missions when they assigned them. The Lord of the Hollows was like this before, and so was Lilith now. They seemed to be measuring the difficulty of the missions based on their own strength. But as a result, when it came to Roy, these missions were clearly beyond the scope of his abilities. For example, it was like the knowledge that some teachers thought was very simple, but when they taught students and found that the students could not learn it no matter what, they would scold the students. Why are you so stupid? Don't you know how to solve such a simple question? Now, Roy was facing this kind of trouble. The Lord of the Hollows wanted him to deal with Demon Lord Abraxas, and now, 
Lilith wanted Roy to go to the Chard Council to steal some Red Sea Egg. These things were very difficult to accomplish, okay? Roy could still fool the Lord of the Hollows, this former demon member of the Council, but Lilith was troublesome. When Julia recounted the situation of Samael being sealed, Lilith's expression did not change, and she did not look surprised. This meant that Roy's guess was right. Lilith was probably one of the masterminds, and she and Samael were plotting a big game of chess together. In the beginning, it might have been the horsemen of the apocalypse who had entered the game and became pawns. But after Lilith gave Roy the mission, it meant that he had become one of the pawns on the board. However, this time was different from when he was in the Heroes of Might and Magic world. Without the restraint of the demon contract, Roy was not enslaved by Lilith, and it did not matter if she used him as a pun. After all, Lilith would reward him. This could be considered a transaction. The key was how Roy should plan to profit in this process. Roy could not guess what Lilith wanted to use him for, and it was also possible that Lilith had only given him this mission casually. It was naturally better for Roy to complete it, but even if he failed, it did not matter to Lilith. But there was no doubt that she would divert a portion of her attention to his actions. Roy could only think of ways to do this to the best of his abilities, and at least he should not delay too long. After thinking about it, Roy said to Julia, when Lilith first started, she was always talking about the Chard Council. She even told us that the Chard Council is likely to be corrupted by the corruption of this world, like the ancient gods corrupted by void power. Logically speaking, saying this to two high rank demons is of little use. Even if it was really corrupted, it's not something we can stop. So, what's her purpose for saying this? Um. Julia pondered for a while and said, I think she may be trying to spread this matter through us and let others know? Let others know? The horsemen of the apocalypse? Indeed, we know fury. And because we're helping her deal with the seven deadly sins, we should have a certain degree of credibility in her eyes. Roy nodded in agreement with Julia's words. The charred council has been corrupted. If Lilith personally told the horsemen of the apocalypse, they would definitely not believe her. The name Mad Queen Lilith has an impression in the eyes of the world. If a demon like her said it, others would first doubt her the moment they heard it. Not only fury but also death. Julia said. You know, death just went to the black stone before us. Lilith must have not said this to death. Otherwise, even if death doesn't believe it, he may have returned to the charred council to verify it. Roy nodded. Now that you mention it. I'll probably have to add the other two horsemen of the apocalypse. Don't forget that War is still imprisoned by the Chard Council at this time, and she wants us to go to the Chard Council space. As for the last horseman, Strife, although we don't know where he is now, Lilith probably thinks that we might also encounter him. Also, have you forgotten about Black Hammer Elfane we met earlier? The Makers might also be potential listeners. Julia said. The two of them added one after the other and slowly guessed Lilith's intentions. Disseminating remarks about the Chard Council being corrupted would certainly greatly attack its prestige and the pressure it could exert. This further confirmed Roy's guess that Samael and Lilith's ultimate goal targeted the Chard Council. Originally, Heaven was first to initiate this end war, but now that the war was being fought, Roy felt that Heaven was the true tragedy. It had completely fallen into the chess game arranged by the two Demon Kings. In terms of scheming and machinations, demons were indeed superior. In any case, Let's capture the last seven deadly sins first. Roy said. As for Lilith's mission, it's too risky. We have to plan carefully before acting. While flying, Julia was a little hesitant as she asked, Since Mother Lilith promised to tell you about the Nephilim, is it necessary to make a deal with Fury? Of course, it's necessary. Roy said solemnly. Because if it's impossible, I will give up on going to the Chard Council. Then, the deal with Fury will be the only way I can obtain the secrets of the Nephilim. Even if she's only a second-generation Nephilim, and the information I can obtain from her may be very limited, it won't make me return empty-handed. I understand. Julia nodded. However, from the information revealed by Mother Lilith, that Red Sea Egg is probably something very important. Let's not talk about whether we can obtain it or not, but even if we can obtain it, maybe we'll have to return it to Mother Lilith. Without the Red Sea Egg, how are you going to experiment? In addition, even if you can use the Red Sea Egg, how are you going to integrate the power of the Nephilim into yourself? Don't forget. It's said that Mother Lilith created the Nephilim from the mingled dust of angels and demons. You can't possibly let yourself die once before merging, right? I know what your doubt is. Lilith's experiment created the Nephilim and not a demon. You're worried that after I use this experiment on me, I'll become another person. Roy turned to look at Julia and smiled. Don't worry. 
I already have a preliminary plan for this. Even without the Red Sea egg, I can still experiment. Roy was not stupid. Of course, he could not destroy his body to carry out this experiment. In fact, because he was a cheater with a system, he had never thought of using Lilith's Red Sea egg when he first heard about it. To him, he trusted Daddy's system more. In fact, at the very beginning, Roy had wanted to stick his topath and go all the way to the end. The fact that his Frost Demon bloodline could grow to the high rank demon level showed that he had a rather powerful bloodline, and his Dark Cold magic power was also a unique variant magic power. It could be said that if he were to dig deeper into Frost power to the limit, he would have a place in the Abyss. But Roy now found that it was extremely difficult to reach the peak with a single power, and it was often very easy to be targeted. For example, the Rift Demon Volgrim. Despite not being good at fighting, he was still a high rank demon. If he really fought Roy, it was hard to say who would win, unless Roy's frost power was powerful enough that it could freeze Volgrim in 0.1 seconds without giving him any time to use his magic power. Otherwise, if Volgrim hid in a purgatory space, Roy would immediately be at a loss. It was impossible for him to freeze space too, right? How much frost power would he need? Moreover, there were magic worlds as well. Roy could create equipment that resisted elemental damage, but would his enemies not understand that? What if he encountered an enemy with ice resistance or frost immunity in the future? Now, after becoming a high rank demon, his condensed magic power grew even slower. In this case, making himself more versatile would be beneficial for him to deal with different battle situations in the future. This was why Roy was tirelessly seeking the secrets of the Nephilim because only the Nephilim, who had fused the angel and demon bloodlines, could understand how to use all elemental powers simultaneously. It could be said that it was actually a good thing for Roy to come to the Darksiders world because if he wanted to meet a race like the Nephilim in the future, he would have to go to the Diablo world. And Roy did not know where the entrance to that world was. Chapter 188 Gathered Due to the speed difference, the low-level angel soldiers who fell behind were not only unable to enter the Black Stone space with the Blood Angels, but they had also chased too far. So when Roy and Julia flew out of the volcano, they did not encounter this angel army. After losing their commander, the outcome of this angel army could be imagined. They would continue to wander around and fight against the demons they encountered, lose their troops, and finally be annihilated. Of course, despite the demons currently having the upper hand in the end war, this war was actually quite damaging to the demons as well. Numerous demons had also lost their lives here, their souls were completely purified by the angels, and they could no longer return to the abyss. Roy and Julia began searching for seven deadly sins again and about five days later, they found the last seven deadly sin. The target possessed by Wrath of the Seven Deadly Sins was actually a demon, and it was a berserk demon like the high-ranked demon Gasric that Roy had encountered before. But unlike Gasric, the weapon this berserk demon used was an enormous broadsword, and armor made of abyss demon iron covered his entire body. Under his helmet was a blazing demon head, indicating that he had the same powerful flame power. The type of war demon was generally like killing machines on the battlefield. They often served as the vanguard and broke through the enemy formations with immense strength. The bloodthirsty and warlike nature of demons was most prominent in this type of war demon. When Roy and Julia found this demon underground, he was fighting against the angel battle team and had the absolute advantage. Roy and Julia watched from the side for a while. They watched as he tore off the angel's wings, took big mouthfuls of the angel's bodies, swung his sword cut the angels into pieces together with their weapons, and spit flame bombs from his mouth to burn the angels into ashes. The angels attacked him in grief and indignation, but this anger made the demon Wrath very happy. Every time he killed an angel, he would devour the other's soul and then laugh maniacally. Soon, all the angels were dead. It's up to you. Seeing the angel team destroyed, Julia turned to smile at Roy. You're a frost demon, and you're best at dealing with these fire-type demons, right? Roy reached out to touch the demon horns on his head and smiled without a word. He spread his wings and flew down, landing on the opposite side of Wrath. Wrath was very tall. Roy's height of 3 meters was only about half his height, and his horizontal width was much larger than Roy's. He probably weighed several tons, but it was more accurate to say that he was burly rather than fat. Such a strong body could be said to be very intimidating, but after having observed from above for a while, Roy realized that the demon's movements were not agile. In particular, the demon wings gathered behind his back looked extremely large, but it did not seem to match his huge body. Roy even wondered if this demon could fly, and even if he could, how long could he fly? Overall, this demon should be the type that was good at ground battles. In addition, 
He was a fire-type demon, so Julia was right. Roy was the best at beating these kinds of demons. However, what Roy did not expect was that when he landed, and Wrath discovered him, he roared at Roy in an enraged voice, a demon. Did Samael send you? This question stunned Roy. Although he knew that there was very little connection between the seven deadly sins after they escaped, and he had already dealt with the other seven deadly sins, did this guy actually not receive any news at all? Not only did he not recognize that Roy was the hunter, but he even thought that he was sent by Samael. What was going on? But Roy suddenly understood. In various religious legends, didn't Samael represent the wrath of the seven deadly sins? Although the Samael in this world was said to be only an incarnation of the deadly sin demon king, even if he was a clone, he should have some connection with the power of wrath, right? With this sudden thought, Roy opened his mouth and said, that's right. Surrender obediently. Never. Wrath roared fiercely. A large number of flames spewed out of his mouth, as though saliva was splashing. He roared, I won't be controlled by anyone. The charred council can't, and neither can Samael. With that, he charged at Roy with an unparalleled momentum like a heavy tank. The ground trembled under his immense weight, and the rubble at the top of the cave shook and fell. Being controlled by Samael? What does that mean? Roy thought to himself, but he did not stop moving. He spread his wings and flew over the top of the demon's head. As a result, Wrath was unable to stop and slammed into the rock wall behind where Roy had been. Boom! Under the great impact, the rock wall seemed to have been exploded by a bomb, and the entire cave began to shake. Wrath dug himself out of the collapsed rock wall, but this guy seemed to have used a bit too much force just now, causing him to injure himself. After coming out, his anger became even more intense. He roared and spat out dozens of flame bombs at Roy. Roy raised his hand and condensed a thick ice wall to block the flame bombs. He spread open his right hand, and Frostmourne appeared in it. Then he suddenly stabbed it into the ground. Under the guidance of his magic power, a series of ice spikes extended forward along the ground and below the flame bombs, heading straight for Wrath. Ah! A loud scream came. An ice spike stabbed Wrath under his crotch. Although his enormous armor was extremely thick, it definitely could not completely cover some joints in order to facilitate movement. It was the same for under his crotch. Roy's ice spike egg explosion stabbed him hard. Although he was injured, Wrath was the same as the other seven deadly sins. Under the stimulation of the matching emotions, their strength would increase, and the source of the Wrath's power was anger. This caused him to become the type that became more furious the more injured he was, and the more furious he was, the stronger he became. It could be said that he was a super berserker. Boom! Wrath raised his free hand and punched the ground. A huge flame shock wave spread out and attacked Roy. With the stimulation of his anger, his magic power increased, and the flames he released were also much stronger. A faint light blue light appeared on Roy's body, and cryogenic fate activated. With a flap of his wings, two strong gusts of cold aura converged on his right and left to meet the flame shock wave and completely extinguish it. But at this moment, Wrath also rushed over, raised the blazing broadsword in his hand, and slashed down at Roy's head. Roy did not move and continued to flap his wings to release Coldora. The Coldora met this flaming blade. The flames on the blade instantly froze and extinguished, and the Coldora spread along the blade to Wrath. Under this strong Coldora, Wrath's hand joints quickly froze. The speed of his sword should have become faster and faster, but now it was doing the opposite and becoming slower and slower. Finally, when he was 20 centimeters away from Roy's head, he completely lost his momentum, and his sword could no longer fall. You need to cool down. Looking at Wrath frozen into a giant ice sculpture in front of him, Roy patted the non-existent dust on his hand and smiled. Unfortunately, Wrath could no longer hear anymore. The ultra-low temperature of minus 200 degrees Celsius froze his brain, causing his thinking to become slower and slower until his consciousness completely froze. Just as Julia said, frost demons like Roy had a massive advantage when facing demons who used flame power. Unless the other party was an elemental demon who specialized in using flames, flame demon, in which case he might still be able to fight Roy for a while. Otherwise, they would usually suffer severe suppression. This was survivorship bias. Roy could now count as outstanding among the frost demons. The tail behind him flicked and pierced forward. The tip of his blade tail slammed into the ice sculpture. The next second, the ice sculpture shattered, and Wrath's huge body turned into countless fragments along with the collapse of the ice. Taking out the talisman of sin, Roy stored Wrath's soul into it. This way, he had now caught all seven deadly sins. Hmm, 
Envy still only has a tenth of her soul inside. What was strange was that the talisman began to buzz slightly, as though the souls of the seven deadly sins were in some kind of resonance. Roy observed the talisman for a while and found that nothing else had happened, so after some thought, he put it away. Now that he had captured the seven deadly sins, the only thing left was to wait for Fury to come to find him and complete the deal. However, Roy was very suspicious that it might not be Fury who came to find him first, but the Watcher, right? In that case, he had to plan carefully. Therefore, Roy and Julia found a place to wait quietly. Chapter 189 Three Years Although Roy had decided to wait, he did not expect that he had waited for three full years. Yes, three years. Even though Roy knew that Fury might have gone to an alternate space with a different flow of time from the main world, this long wait still drove Roy slightly crazy. In his words, if he could have a descendant with Julia, then his child could have used magic in these three years. But what made Roy feel the most speechless was that Julia did not feel anything about the passage of these three years. Roy felt that it was very long, but Julia felt that it was only the blink of an eye. Every time Roy talked about time, she would look at Roy in surprise and say, it's only been three years. It's normal for Fury to not return in such a short time. Roy felt speechless every time this happened. Of course, he knew that three years was indeed very short for the long-lived races, and it might require hundreds of years to make them feel that time was long. Some demons could sleep for hundreds or even thousands of years until they were awakened by someone who did not have eyes. The legendary stories in the human world were all written in this way. In a sense, this description was not an exaggeration. After understanding this, Roy no longer worried about it. During these three years, Roy had not been idle. He brought Julia to find a place to stay, a relatively intact human building, and then enslaved a group of low-level demons nearby to collect souls for them. Although the humans in this main world were almost extinct now, it did not mean that there were no souls produced. After the nuclear weapons launched by humans exploded in various parts of the world, the nuclear winter effect brought about by them was slowly weakening over time, so some animals and plants were slowly waking up. Ironically, without the existence of humans, their greatest natural enemy, the other creatures on this planet reproduced even better. Even though the number of demons entering this world was large, it could not compare to the original human population on this planet. After the billions of humans were almost extinct, their demand for food in this world instantly reached its lowest point. Without the influence of human activity, the survival pressure on animals and plants lessened. Over the past three years, Roy had witnessed with his own eyes this world go from near extinction to flourishing once again. But the creatures that survived the nuclear winter had more or less undergone some mutations and evolutions. Their bodies had become larger and stranger, but even so, they were still creatures of this world. After a short period of adaptation, new food chains were taking shape. If Roy were a poet or an artist, he might have been moved by nature's self-regulation ability, but unfortunately, he was not. Although he was very shocked, he felt that it was a matter of course. When he was a human in his previous life, Roy did not feel much about it, but when he became a demon and looked at humans from another perspective, Roy did not know how to evaluate them. Human beings were very great. They could use thousands of years to transform nature step by step, eventually becoming the overlords of the food chain, and create a dazzling history and culture. But at the same time, humans were too insatiable. Like cancer cells, they continuously reproduced and destroyed the balance of nature. It was not that Roy did not stand on the side of humans. In fact, even humans knew that if this had continued, they would have destroyed themselves even without the end war. They seemed to have realized this as well. It was precisely because of this caution that there were all kinds of catastrophic disasters in human movies and novels. But because these novels and movies were made up by humans, almost all of the endings had humans finally winning and surviving. But in this world, it was not a novel or movie. The appearance of angels and demons directly defeated humans with a single blow. Their imagined resistance and eventual victory had not appeared. Without the presence of humans, the animals and plants on this planet became active again. The plants were still nothing special, but the mutated animals had now become the best choice for demons to hunt souls. It seemed that because of mutations caused by radiation, the spirits of these originally weak animals had become much stronger. Although they were still inferior to human souls, they were better than nothing for demons. However, due to the mutations, these animals, plants, and insects displayed greater combat strength than before. In fact, even when they faced low-ranked demons, these low-ranked demons would conversely become their prey. Not only that, 
but some animals had devoured the corpses of the dead angels and demons on the battlefield. As everyone knew, demon blood could infect other life forms. Similarly, angel blood had similar effects. So when these animals consumed the flesh and blood of demons and angels, new changes emerged. As time passed, demonized creatures resembling the ones in the abyss and some light-based creatures that could use weak holy light power gradually began to appear in this world. In just three years, this planet had become completely unrecognizable. If a newcomer who entered this world were to look at these strange creatures and those places that had become strange because of radiation contamination, they would definitely not think that this was Earth. Roy and Julia occupied a territory and ordered the low-level demons to hunt these mutated creatures every day. After the low-level demons brought back their souls, Roy set aside a portion of them for these low-level demons as rewards and used the rest to cultivate magic power. After becoming a high-ranked demon, Roy discovered that the efficiency of raising his magic power using ordinary souls to create magic energy growth potions had substantially reduced. After condensing his magic power, it now became very difficult to increase. Fortunately, Julia was by his side. Under her reminder, Roy changed the method of making magic energy growth potions. He first transmuted the animal spirits he collected with a Haradra cube, obtained fallen souls and noble souls, and then used these two types of high-quality souls to make magic energy growth potions. Roy used these two types of high-quality souls to create skills in the system, and he thought that these two types of souls could only be used to create skills, but with Julia's reminder, Roy realized that his thinking was wrong. Julia said that high-level demons preferred to devour high-quality souls. This reminded Roy that regardless of whether they were ordinary souls, high-quality souls, holy souls, or evil souls, to demons, they could devour all souls. In other words, there was no difference in the essence of souls. But in the system, the utilization of higher-quality souls was different. Ordinary souls could be used in the system to create various items and increase Roy's magic power. Although high-quality souls could not be used to create items, they could create skills and increase magic power. As for holy souls and evil souls, they could not be used to create items and skills, but they could create life and also increase magic power. But Roy had tried devouring an angel soul, and the increase was negligible, and it was also very disgusting. This was because the positive emotional power in the holy soul had condensed to the highest level, and it was the least beneficial to demons. In other words, according to theoretical calculations, the magic power growth effect contained in souls should be as follows, evil souls greater than fallen souls greater than noble souls greater than ordinary souls greater than holy souls. For angels, this order might be reversed. Evil souls could only be obtained by killing high-ranked demons and above. To Roy, this was a very difficult path because the higher the level, the fewer the number. Moreover, generally speaking, after becoming high-ranked demons, Killing each other would become rare, so it was extremely arduous to increase magic power by collecting a large number of evil souls. Of course, Roy could also think of a way to modify the Haradra cube so that it could transmute evil souls, but he estimated that this kind of transmutation required a lot of ordinary souls. Now, the most efficient way for Roy to increase his magic power was to use fallen souls to make magic energy growth potions. Therefore, after accumulating souls for a period of time, Roy changed the definitions of the magic energy growth potion so that he could use the fallen souls transmuted from the Haradra cube to make magic energy growth potions. Originally, the Haradra cube used 198 standard ordinary souls to create one fallen soul and one noble soul, which was equivalent to combining 99 standard souls into a high quality soul. However, the animal spirits of mutated creatures were not as good as standard human souls, so after testing, it took about 140 mutated animal spirits to transmute a high-quality soul. Roy kept the transmuted noble souls to create skills in the future or possibly for creating magic energy growth potions, and he used all the fallen souls to synthesize magic energy growth potions. The result of the experiment was gratifying. If Roy were to devour a fallen soul directly, his magic power would increase by about 0.6, but the produced magic energy growth potion could increase this value to about 0.8. The magic energy growth potion produced using 99 standard human souls could only increase his magic power by about 0.5. The efficiency difference was 0.3. Roy's current magic power value was 5000. If he wanted to double his magic power to 10,000, it meant that he needed more than 6000 fallen souls. When converted, it was about 600,000 ordinary souls. And this was under the effect of using magic energy growth potions.
If he were to devour and digest like other demons, it would take at least a million ordinary souls. Roy finally knew why high-ranked demons needed a long time to promote to demon lords. It was because collecting so many souls was absolutely impossible without enough time. Therefore, Roy was looking forward to the million souls that Fury had promised. He did not think much of it before, but now he suddenly realized how large the number of souls Fury could take out was. It would not be an exaggeration to say that she was a golden thigh one. Chapter 190 A Secret Visit During these three years, the Mad Queen Lilith did not express anything about Roy and Julia's inaction of not completing the mission. She did not send anyone to supervise them, nor did she show up, as though she had completely forgotten about the two of them. Instead, the Lord of the Hollows felt a little anxious. He had once appeared and asked Roy why he had not killed Abraxas. Facing the Lord of the Hollows, Roy appeared extremely respectful, but he did not mention it. He left and avoided the subject until the anxious Lord of the Hollows finally forced him to answer, so he simply said that he could not do it. After all, he was only a high-ranked demon. No, plus Julia, it was two of them. Even if Roy, a frost demon, showed stronger combat strength than ordinary high-ranked demons, it was still far beyond him when it came to assassinating a demon lord. No matter how the Lord of the Hollows tricked him and how tempting the reward was, Roy's mind was still very clear, and he would not fall for it. Roy said that unless the Lord of the Hollows fulfilled his promise in advance and allowed him to have the power to match a demon lord, he would definitely not provoke Abraxas now. Although Roy did not know what the issue between the Lord of the Hollows and Abraxas was, his attitude was very clear. Don't think of using me as a tool. I'm not a hot-blooded fool with no brains. Either you fulfill your promise and give me power in advance, or you wait until I have the ability to kill Abraxas before I go. I didn't say that I won't help you, but it's hard to tell when. Anyway, demons are long-lived, and waiting hundreds of years is nothing. Faced with this situation, the Lord of the Hollows was very helpless. He had left the abyss for too long, making this ancient demons thinking a little stiff. For those angels and demons who came to him to seek to free themselves, he had to first ask them before taking away their souls. With this kind of behavior, he had no way to deal with Roy's procrastination tactics, so he could only let out a long sigh and return to his hollow space. Julia was initially a little worried that Roy's uncooperative attitude would anger the Lord of the Hollows, but Roy reassured her because he could tell that this old demon would not do anything to him. After the end war began, it could be said that the three kingdoms had been stirred up. Under the complicated situation, all sorts of monsters and snakes had jumped out. The Lord of the Hollows must have had some special purpose to find him. As one of the former members of the Charred Council, even if he had begun to age and his magic power began to decline, shouldn't he still be able to defeat Abraxas? But he had not taken action and instead found him. Wasn't there some ulterior motive? Roy was even wondering if the Lord of the Hollows saw Julia following him and thought that he was Samael's subordinate, so he was thinking of ways to instigate him into killing the Destroyer's subordinate to deepen the enmity between Samael and the Destroyer. When Roy could not guess the other party's true motive, his best solution was to do nothing to prevent himself from falling into a difficult situation. Fortunately, after seeing Roy, the Lord of the Hollows probably realized that he was acting too anxious and aroused Roy's suspicion, so he did not appear in front of Roy for the next two years. In the following days, Roy and Julia stayed in their territory every day, and the thing that they did the most was have sex. Roy felt that Julia really wanted to have a child with him. It seemed that Roy seeking the secrets of the Nephilim had given her many inspirations and made her believe that even though the two of them were different races, there was still the possibility of giving birth to a descendant. Therefore, during this time, Julia's greatest passion was to find ways to squeeze Roy dry every day. Roy felt both happy and pained about this. He felt that the fallen angel was beginning to move closer to a succubus. There were more and more tricks, but his nutrition seemed to be unable to keep up. After three years of unremitting collection, Roy obtained more than 200,000 standard units of souls from low-level demons. Most of them were the animal spirits of mutated demonized creatures, mixed with a small number of human souls. Just as Roy thought that if this continued, he could collect more than a million animal spirits, the person he had been waiting for finally appeared. It was a dark night without any starlight. In fact, three years had passed, and the dust clouds covering Earth had not completely dissipated. At night, on this planet, there was still no moonlight visible. Similarly, there was no sun during the day, only a dim yellow light spot hanging in the sky. This weather was very convenient for demons to move about in. Roy and Julia's residence was a castle built by low-level demons. The castle was not large, and it was brightly lit at night because of burning torches hung on the walls. 
In the bedroom, there was a huge stone bed, and Julia had fallen deep asleep on it. Roy was hugging her by the side with his eyes closed, seemingly in a deep sleep. A torch burned, producing light explosions from time to time. The oil from the mutated demonized creature was used as fuel, and it was like this when it burned. The flame swayed and reflected on the surrounding walls, bringing flickering light and shadows. A black shadow quietly snuck into Roy and Julia's bedroom. The shadow carefully hid in the shadow of the fire and slowly approached the sleeping Roy and Julia. It was getting closer and closer. Under the shadow of the bed, the black shadow stood beside it. It slowly stretched out its hand to touch Roy. But at this moment, the black shadow suddenly stopped. A sharp, triangular tail tip appeared in front of it, exuding an intense cold aura. The three-segment blade on the tip of the tail slightly opened and closed like an eyeball staring intently at the black shadow, making it not dare to move rashly. A pair of dark red eyes with a pentagram pattern in each opened, eye-catching and bright in the darkness. Roy slowly sat up on the stone bed, placed his elbows on his knees, and looked jokingly at the black shadow cowering from his tail by the bedside. Watcher. No, I should call you Envy. You're finally back. What about Fury, who's under your watch? Roy said softly. Behind him, Julia sat up vigilantly and reached out to grab her fallen angelic sword lying beside the bed while staring at the black shadow unhappily. That's right. Despite the light in the entire bedroom being very dim, Roy's dark vision could see everything clearly. Who else could it be but the Watcher beside his bed? The mistress is asleep. I came here secretly. The Watcher whispered. Humph, came secretly? Julia snorted coldly. Then, did you also need to come to our bed secretly? Or do you want to do something by our bed? Don't misunderstand. I don't want to be an assassin, nor do I want to be a third party. The Watcher chuckled but she still did not dare to move. I'm just here to confirm. Demon Osiris, what are your intentions? Oh? Do I have any intentions? Roy asked casually, but his tail was still pointing at the Watcher. The Watcher spread her hands. This is meaningless. You realized my identity back then, but you didn't expose me. From then on, I knew that Demon Osiris definitely had other motives. Now that I've snuck out and stood in front of you again, just say it. Perhaps we might be able to become friends. Roy did not follow up on her words, but instead asked, are you here to ensure that no one will know? Not at all. The Watcher said, the mistress trusts me a lot. After all, I've been running around with her during this time, and I've been trying my best to conceal it for her from the Charred Council. Moreover, I'm a Watcher, and I've also gained the trust of the Charred Council. Is that so? That's really good. Roy nodded and took out the Talisman of Sin from the system space. Ah! Upon seeing the Talisman of Sin, the Watcher suddenly became excited and reached out to take it. But Roy suddenly took back the Talisman and looked at her jokingly. The Watcher realized that she had lost her cool, so she pretended to cough and said, It seems like a lot of time has passed in the human world since the Mistress and I left. You've already caught the seven deadly sins. I'm only missing you now. Roy smiled as he looked at the Talisman of Sin while tossing and turning it. Say, do you think I should kill you? absorb you into the talisman, and then return it to fury, or? Roy dragged his tone and looked at the Watcher meaningfully. Of course, it's for me. The Watcher hurriedly said. As long as I can gather all seven deadly sins, I will be able to obtain unparalleled power. At that time, I can give you whatever you want. Don't be so anxious. Roy said. First, I have to know what you plan to do after obtaining this power. Is there even a need to say it? The Watcher said angrily. Of course, it's to destroy the Charred Council. Those despicable and shameless degenerates imprisoned me for tens of thousands of years. When I escaped with my siblings, we all swore that they would pay the price one day. So, you want to go back and kill the Charred Council? Roy confirmed. That's right. The Watcher nodded. Don't worry about me dealing with you. In fact, I'm very grateful to you for gathering all seven deadly sins. After all, I wouldn't have been able to bear taking away the powers of my siblings with my own hands. If you're still worried, I can sign a contract with you. Very good. In that case, we can reach our first consensus. Roy finally retracted his tail and smiled. I can give you the talisman of sin, but in exchange, I want you to help me open a spatial passage to the Charred Council. You escaped from there, so I believe it's not difficult for you, right? Chapter 191 Undead Army Hearing Roy's request, the Watcher could not help but be stunned for a while. She looked Roy up and down before saying in disbelief, You want me to help you open a spatial channel to the Charred Council? 
You. Do you know what you want to do? The Watcher was envy in disguise. Through using the unique possession ability of the seven deadly sins to occupy the original Watcher's body, she was able to hide from the Charred Council. The reason why she had put in so much effort to pretend and hide was to take revenge for being imprisoned. You had to know that such an incomparably long prison life often led people to the extremes of madness. In a certain world, there was a blind man named Illidan that was almost on the verge of madness after being imprisoned for 10,000 years. And the seven deadly sins had been imprisoned for even longer, so it was conceivable how deep their hatred for the Charred Council was. However, most of the other seven deadly sins buried this hatred in their hearts because they knew that their strength was not enough to fight the Charred Council. Only Envy, this seven deadly sin who was at the edge of madness, had taken actions to take revenge. She knew that if she relied on herself alone, she had absolutely no hope of revenge. So from the beginning, she had made up her mind to take the powers of her siblings, the powers of the other seven deadly sins, in order to gather all the powers of the seven deadly sins to take revenge on the Charred Council. Before this, Envy was naturally lacking confidence. Now, like the other seven deadly sins, she roughly had the strength of a high-ranked demon, and she was even inferior to Julia. After all, the long period of imprisonment had drained a lot of their strength, so it was impossible for her to retaliate against the Charred Council. She also admitted that Roy was stronger than her, but only by a bit. He could not achieve the crushing suppression of a demon lord. No matter what, Roy was still a high-ranked demon, but a high-ranked demon actually wanted to enter the Charred Council space? It was a widely recognized forbidden area, and all illegal intrusions would be dealt with severely by the Charred Council. What was this demon thinking to be so audacious? Roy's pair of demon eyes glowed faintly in the darkness. Roy did not respond to Envy's surprise and only said, just say if you agree or disagree. Sure. If you want to die, I won't stop you. Envy nodded. I am possessing the body of a Watcher, and the Watchers are creatures created by the Charred Council. This body naturally has the key to entering the alternate space of the Charred Council. At that time, you only need to follow me, and you can enter the Charred Council space. With that, Envy stretched out her hand toward Roy. Now that we've reached a deal, can you give me the Talisman of Sin? But unexpectedly, Roy shook his head. No, I can't give it to you now. Why? Do you want to go back on your word? Envy asked with gritted teeth. No. Since I said it, I will give you the talisman of sin, but now is not the time. Roy said. Don't forget that I have an agreement with the horseman Fury. I have to hand this talisman of sin to her first. Damn it. Envy floated around in the air and said angrily, If you give her the talisman, how can I get it back? I specially snuck out to find you and this is the answer you give me? Don't worry. Roy said calmly. If I hand the talisman to Fury, it means that my transaction with her has been completed. As long as I get what she promised, the rest has nothing to do with me. It's not my problem who ends up with the talisman of sin, right? Hearing this, the three pairs of eyes on Envy's head immediately sparkled, emitting a faint light. She said to Roy in a very meaningful tone, You mean you want me to snatch the talisman of sin from Fury? Don't make it sound like I'm instigating you. Roy pointed his finger at Envy. Didn't you have this idea from the beginning? Otherwise, why didn't you pretend to be someone else but instead pretend to a watcher? From the beginning, didn't you hide beside Fury for this final moment? You knew that when the seven deadly sins escaped, the Charred Council would definitely send a horseman of the apocalypse to hunt you down. After all, it was the four horsemen who caught you before, so only the horsemen can capture all of you. The other seven deadly sins were wary of you. So the only chance for you to gather all the souls of the seven deadly sins is when the horseman finishes all the captures. Am I right? The strange pairs of eyes on Envy's head flickered faster and faster. Clearly, Roy's words exposed her original plan. She was unwilling to admit it, and Roy did not want to force her to admit it, so he continued, I'll hand over the talisman to Fury first. This point can't be changed, and I have to do it. But it's not like you don't have a chance. Moreover, cooperating with me is beneficial for you. Give me three days to prepare. Three days later, bring Fury to my castle. After completing the deal, she'll probably rush back to report. At that time, I'll think of a way to create an opportunity for you to seize the talisman. I only want you to promise me that you'll come back after getting the talisman and bring me in. Aren't you worried that I won't fulfill my promise and directly go seek revenge on the Charred Council after getting the talisman? Envy asked while floating in place after circling twice. I believe you aren't stupid. With my people entering with you and helping you distract the council, won't your chances of completing your revenge be much higher? Roy said with a grin. 
Hearing this, Envy sighed, and her shoulders drooped. She spread her hands and said, All right. I knew that making a deal with a devil is terrible business because devils are too good at bewitching people. Roy could not be bothered to correct what Envy called him. So, has a deal been reached? Yes. Envy nodded. Okay, you go back first. I still need to sleep. Roy turned over and laid back on the bed. Envy did not say anything and just floated away from the window. A while later, after Envy left, Julia pushed Roy, who was pretending to be asleep. Are you really planning to enter the Chard Council's world? That's right, but I won't go in so foolishly. Roy straightened up and sat by the bed. Didn't Lilith say it? Fury has been investigating the situation of corruption power and has also come into contact with death. She should know that the horsemen of the apocalypse are being used as pawns by the Chard Council. Envy has always been by Fury's side as a watcher, representing the Chard Council. So once the watcher revolts at the last moment, Fury's trust in the Chard Council will instantly plummet. Even if she doesn't immediately rebel against the Chard Council, she'll have lost the talisman of sin and won't be able to complete the mission. If the Council punishes her, then she might suffer the same fate as war. Like this, the Chard Council won't be able to make use of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, its biggest card. If Envy really can cause havoc in the Chard Council, at that time, it'll be our best chance to find the Red Sea Egg. Understood. Julia nodded. However, if we enter together with Envy, we'll probably directly face the three counselors of the Chard Council. Moreover, besides the Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Council also has a large army. This can't be ignored. So we need to confuse their eyes. Roy smiled and clapped his hands. A moment later, more than a dozen black figures suddenly appeared in the darkness. These black figures were wearing long robes and bowed to Roy. Assemble the army. Roy did not say anything else. With this order, the black figures nodded slightly and then left. As the breeze blew, not only did the torches in the corridor shake, but it also blew the corners of the black figures' robes. With sharp eyes, you could see. Bones covered under the black robes. That's right. Over the past three years, Roy had used his demon blood to awaken thirteen liches. During these three years, Roy had been thinking about how to complete the mission Lilith had given him. This much time was enough for him to plan everything, including making an undead army. At the very beginning, Roy wanted to summon Cassandra from the pirates of the Caribbean world. Roy had Cassandra's soul, and he only needed to use this soul to summon her. But after thinking about it, Roy chose not to do so. It had not been long since he left that world, and Roy did not know how her strength had evolved, so there was no need to waste a large amount of magic power to summon her. Therefore, he used the local materials and his demon blood to create 13 liches in this world. In fact, these 13 liches were different from Cassandra. Frost demon blood was essential during the lich transformation ritual, but frost demon blood alone was not enough. Cassandra's situation was special. She had sacrificed her soul to Roy as she was about to die, so Roy used her own soul to create an intelligent lich like Cassandra. In comparison, these 13 liches were defective. They did not have souls and did not have intelligence. Why did this happen? That was because all the liches Roy created this time were made with corpses that had been dead for a long time. The souls of these corpses had long dissipated or been plundered, so even if they received frost demon blood and moved again, they did not have much intelligence left. Moreover, the longer they had been dead, the worse the effect after awakening. In the past three years, Roy had given out a lot of demon blood and created many liches, but only these thirteen were truly relatively strong. Through long-term observation, Roy found that it was impossible for a lich like this to evolve like Cassandra. They could not even absorb life force and could only rely on the thin magic power in Roy's demon blood to exist. They did not even have phylacteries, and once their bodies were destroyed, they would be finished. They could not even be called true liches. Fortunately, Roy had not had much hope for them. As long as they had some magic power, it was enough. Below the thirteen liches, there were some weaker liches, about a hundred of them in total. These hundred liches could use their undead magic to create low-level undead like skeleton soldiers or zombies, and Roy could use them to assemble an army of tens of thousands of undead quickly. At that time, the first to follow Envy into the Charred Council space would be this undead army. Chapter 192 Fury Returns In addition to this undead army, Roy now had about a thousand low-level demons under his command. There were around 800 low-rank demons and 200 middle-rank demons. These demons were all gathered near Roy's territory and obeyed his orders. Roy used them very smoothly. When the time came, 
he would let them join the undead army and attack the charred council together. They should be of some use. Attacking the charred council might sound dangerous, but it was actually still possible for Roy to succeed. Of course, the premise was that he could enter the charred council space. Roy had the low-level demons collect souls for him, and they would occasionally bring back some strange things. Roy could not tell what these things were for, so he handed them over to the demon merchant, Volgrim, to exchange for a lot of souls. Volgrim was a rare rift demon, so his understanding of space naturally did not need mentioning. When he came to look for Roy to make deals, he often chatted with Roy for a long time, so during the conversations, Roy learned a lot about alternate spaces. Besides this world's main world, the human world, there were a large number of alternate space bubbles. And in these alternate spaces, there were often some suitable living environments, which gave birth to different races. The history of these races appeared much earlier than humans, they were known as the ancient races and were the natives of this world. Angels and demons were actually outsiders. In the beginning, demons discovered this world through a gate of the abyss, and once demons appeared, they brought war and slaughter. These ancient races naturally resisted, and then angels followed. After all, wherever demons appeared, angels would appear. Thus, the early history of this world was actually a tangled war between the three parties of angels, demons, and the natives. The forces of the natives could not contend against the angels and demons, so they quickly declined in the war. In order to avoid the threat of extinction, they sealed off the alternate spaces they lived in and encrypted them with the power of magic. Without knowing the method, it would be very difficult to enter. Unfortunately, although this encryption won a respite for the natives, many races eventually perished after self-sealing themselves. Unable to connect to the main world, their population and resources were greatly limited, so in that long time, hundreds of native races died out, and there were only a few races left. According to Volgrim, the Charred Council was in such an encrypted alternate space, and it was probably the most complicated and difficult one to crack. It was precisely this indecipherable alternate space that protected the Charred Council from the beginning. Otherwise, the angels and demons would have long joined forces to destroy the Charred Council for its interference in the war between angels and demons. Why would they have given it a chance to grow? The history of the Charred Council was also very old. This was not wrong. But in fact, in the beginning, it had no way of dealing with the angels and demons. It was not until the Mad Queen Lilith created the Nephilim, and the Council saw the huge war potential of the Nephilim race and incorporated them for its use, did it finally suppress the angels and demons. However, the potential of the Nephilim was simply too strong. Although the Charred Council wanted to make use of them, it was also worried that they would break free from its control and bite the Council. Therefore, it led the four horsemen of the Apocalypse astray and had them kill all their compatriots as proof of allegiance. Of course, it had only succeeded because Death and the other horsemen of the Apocalypse were relatively unique. Just like Lilith had said, their other compatriots were more inclined toward the nature of demons, bloodthirsty and cruel. Death and the others were more inclined toward angels and their compassion. The Charred Council had used this ideological conflict to successfully divide the Nephilim race. After obtaining the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Charred Council had become a force stronger than the angels and demons. Moreover, it used force to make the angels and demons submit and establish a ceasefire agreement. The encryption of the alternate space was so complex that even a demon king like Samael could not crack it. This kind of thing was not solvable with force, so even though the angels and demons gritted their teeth in hatred for the Charred Council, they could not do anything to it. And the members of the Charred Council just hid in the alternate space and safely remotely controlled from behind the scenes to maintain the so-called balance. In this long time, no one had been able to enter the Charred Council space without its permission. For tens of thousands of years, this safe mindset had probably become deeply ingrained in it. However, it would have never thought that one of the seven deadly sins would have such a scheme. When escaping from the prison, instead of rushing to escape from this space, she had instead chosen to possess a watcher created by the council. Being careless was the greatest mistake the charred council made. After thinking about it over the past three years, Roy realized that this was the only chance he could use. Initially, when he discovered that the watcher was Envy, he only wanted to give her a push. Didn't Samael and Lilith plan to make the horsemen of the apocalypse and the charred council turn against each other? Since he had encountered her, he would just give her a hand. Therefore, he did not put her into the talisman when exposing the true identity of the Watcher but instead let her stay by Fury's side, not doing anything. He originally wanted to see how Fury would react when Envy betrayed her at the last moment. But he did not expect to encounter the Mad Queen Lilith after going to the Blackstone throne, and she even gave him a mission to recover the Red Sea Egg. 
As a result, the deadly sin envy that he had left alone immediately rose in utilization value. Vulgram had told Roy that the watchers created by the council could freely enter and leave the charred council space. This was a very valuable piece of information. There were more than a few watchers, but they were all tools used by the charred council to monitor the entire world. In order to facilitate them being able to report at any time, it gave the watchers the right to enter and leave at will. Envy had specially chosen a watcher to possess for the convenience of being able to go back and take revenge on the charred council. Envy was well hidden, and the charred council had not discovered her, so it had arranged for her to monitor fury. This showed that the charred council did not completely trust the four horsemen of the apocalypse and had always been guarding against them. But this was a good thing. To Roy, this was the key to entering the charred council space. Imagine. It had not been invaded for tens of thousands of years, and the charred council was probably already long used to it. How careless and unguarded would it be? Once Roy led the undead army and the demon army into it, how chaotic would it become? Of course, Roy was not underestimating the charred council. The undead army and low-level demons were just cannon fodder to him. Once the charred council reacted, the cannon fodder would be quickly killed, but it was enough as long as they could create chaos and give Roy time to fish in troubled waters. This was Roy's thinking. Although there were risks, there were also opportunities. On the second day after Envy left, Roy gathered the undead army and low-level demons. Envy followed the agreement and brought Fury, who had returned to the main world, to find Roy on the third day. Roy and Julia welcomed Fury in their castle, but Roy found that she was different from when he had first met her. Fury seemed to be much stronger. Roy did not know where Fury went after leaving behind the mission and what kind of things she had encountered, but she had obviously investigated the matter of corruption. When she came to the castle, Fury's face was solemn. She came riding on a very tall and strong horse. It was a warhorse covered in blue light patterns, and the mane on its neck, its tail, and its four hooves were all burning with black and blue lightning like flames. It was Fury's mount rampage. Demon Osiris, you're not dead yet? This really surprises me. Although Fury's expression was solemn, her mouth was as vicious as ever. The moment she saw him, she jumped off her horse, raised her chin, and placed her hands on her hips. I thought I could save those one million souls and take the talisman of sin from your corpse. At this moment, Envy still had her watcher appearance and was following closely behind Fury. It seemed that this fellow was still flattering Fury quite well, and Fury had never doubted her. Sorry to disappoint you. Roy took out the talisman of sin and played with it. All the souls of the seven deadly sins are in here. I've done my duty, so where are my one million souls? Fury did not say anything and just stared at Roy. Julia realized what Fury was thinking at the moment and could not help but hold her sword hilt. The Watcher was also anxious. She was also afraid that Fury would go back on her word and not fulfill her promise. After all, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse had never had a good impression of demons, so she could not help but whisper to her, Mistress. Only Roy stared at Fury without panicking and with a smile on his face. But with his appearance, his smile did not look very friendly. After a while, Fury finally moved. She took out a scroll from somewhere and threw it to Roy. This is a soul contract. Fury said. There are a million souls sealed in it, which I've spent thousands of years collecting. But after such a long time, I don't know what the souls inside are like. Do you want to check? Roy pinched the soul contract and looked at it. He did not say anything and threw the talisman of sin to Fury. No need. I can still trust the credibility of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In that case, the deal is complete. With these words, the illusory image of the demon contract appeared in front of Roy and Fury and slowly burned away, indicating that the demon contract was fulfilled. Chapter 193 Summon the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse Soul contracts were magic contracts specially used to store souls. They were very simple. Most demons that could use magic power could use them. But in fact, in the Abyss, soul contracts were rare because many demons did not have the habit of storing souls. The souls sealed in Fury's soul contract should be from her killing enemies and then sealing them inside over many years. Although the Nephilim could also use souls, their demand was not as high as that of demons, so they could store them forever. After putting away the soul contract, Roy laughed and asked Fury, I guess you've verified the authenticity of the so-called corruption power, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have so easily concluded the deal with me. Am I right? That's right. Fury admitted readily. Corruption power and the void power you mentioned are indeed very similar and very dangerous. What I want to ask is, is there really no way to eliminate this power? No, 
Or rather, I don't know. Roy spread his hands. I'm just a high rank demon. Do you think I'm capable of solving this? Okay. Fury said unwillingly. Then tell me, where is the Warcraft world? If possible, I want to go to that world personally to find a way to fight against corruption power. Huh? When he heard this, Roy's heart skipped a beat, but he calmly said, Stop joking. Can you horsemen go to other worlds? It was no wonder that Roy raised this question. As far as he knew, it seemed like only the two races of angels and demons could travel through the infinite worlds at will. Oh, wait, there were also the elementals in the elemental world. When traveling to other worlds, the first thing that needed satisfying to be summoned was being angels, demons, or elementals. These three races were famous existences in the infinite worlds. Precisely because of this fame, the natives of those worlds usually chose them when using summoning magic to seek help. But people like the four horsemen of the apocalypse were not good because their names were only spread in their own worlds. They were not very famous in other worlds, so it was generally impossible for anyone to summon them. To put it bluntly, angels, demons, and elementals were simply famous. If no one summoned the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they would have to pay a much higher price to travel between worlds. The repulsive force of the world did not need mentioning. Just the ability to tear open cross-world spatial channels was not something that he necessarily had. The most important thing was that if you did not know the coordinates of the world that you wanted to go to, even if you had the ability to tear open cross-world spatial channels, you might be lost in an alternate dimension world and be wiped out by spatial storms, such that not even a trace would be left. When Demon Lord Rogeros had asked Roy to hunt down the illusion Demon Caesar, he had first located the coordinates of the world that Caesar had escaped to and then used magic power to open a spatial channel. Otherwise, even the powerful Demon Lord would not have been able to create the spatial channel. Due to these circumstances, Fury actually mentioning that she wanted to go to the Warcraft world naturally surprised Roy. To be honest, Roy guessed that there might indeed be a Warcraft world, but he had not been there so far. What he said before was simply bragging. He did not know the coordinates of the Warcraft world, and of course, he could not let Fury go to that world. Unless. As expected, Fury said the next moment, Of course, I can't go now. But isn't there still you? According to what you said, the Warcraft world is powerful, and a demon like you will definitely have thoughts about that world. Moreover, that world is in a state of war. I don't believe that you wouldn't leave anything in that world after you returned. You definitely have some other way to return to that world, right? Roy was silent. He really did not know how to answer this question because he remembered the beacon he had left in the Heroes of Might and Magic world. In fact, not only him, but many demons would also try their best to leave some information or objects in the worlds they had been. This way, at least the natives of those worlds would know that demons like them existed, or they would especially leave behind their demon names to leave a deep impression on the natives. They might even write some legendary novels about their names. This way, the natives who wanted to seek help from the power of demons might summon them again one day. Fury clearly misunderstood Roy's silence and thought that Roy was tacitly agreeing, so she said, I don't have high requirements. If you can return to the Warcraft world, think of a way to summon me. In exchange, I can help you kill a powerful enemy, but you have to ensure that I can stay in that world for more than a month. It's meaningless if you're alone. Roy shook his head. The forces in that world are too strong. Even a demon king might not be able to win against them. Even if you horsemen reach the peak of your strength, you're at best stronger than demon lords, right? I advise you not to waste your efforts. If one doesn't work, how about four? Fury immediately said. This matter concerns the survival of this world, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse may need to move together. Then it's no problem. Roy immediately replied and nodded. But in the same way, your brothers will also have to help me like you. Do you agree? Sure. Fury nodded decisively. I can agree on their behalf to such a small matter. Hearing this, although Roy's expression did not change, he was ecstatic. When he heard Fury's request, he suddenly realized that this might be an opportunity to swindle the four horsemen of the apocalypse. As expected, after some discussion, Roy immediately had one opportunity to summon the horsemen as thugs, all four horsemen of the apocalypse. This was a powerful force that could probably even overcome Demon King Samael. Even though he could only summon them in the Warcraft world, it was worth it. He immediately set up a demon contract with Fury while the iron was hot. After the demon contract was established, Fury took out four things engraved with symbols. This symbol was the symbol on Fury's forehead. She threw it to Roy. This is the horseman token of the four of us. When you're summoning, 
put them in the summoning formation, and then we can respond to the summons. No problem. Roy nodded. Okay, I'm leaving. Fury got on her horse and prepared to leave. Roy hurriedly said, Wait, did you forget something? Fury slapped her forehead, took out a crystal-like thing from her pocket, and threw it to Roy. This is an image crystal. It records a scene of when a Nephilim was born many years ago. Whatever information you can obtain from it depends on you. This is all I know about the secrets of the Nephilim. My promise is fulfilled. With that, Fury clamped her horse's abdomen. Her mount, Rampage, immediately stomped on the ground and quickly left with Fury, leaving the unprepared Envy shouting, Mistress, wait for me. However, Fury did not stop nor slow down at all. Envy could only turn to Roy and say, After I get the talisman of sin, I'll come and find you. Before Roy could nod, Envy flew and chased after her. Roy held the image crystal and could not help but curse in a low voice. Damn it, this woman. They had agreed that Fury would tell Roy about the secrets of the Nephilim, but Roy did not expect that she would just throw him a crystal without any other explanation, and it was over. Cheer up. Julia said. Fury is a Nephilim herself, so how can she really tell you all the secrets of the Nephilim? Wouldn't that mean exposing her weaknesses to you? She's not that stupid. It's already very good for her to throw you an image crystal. Of course, Roy understood this. In fact, Roy had thought of this possibility from the beginning, but he really did not want to deal with the Mad Queen Lilith, so he could only think of a solution from Fury. Due to his unpleasant past with Zeron, Roy was trying his best to avoid being together with stronger demons. Without these stronger demons as mothers-in-law, Roy could do whatever he wanted. How comfortable was that? Although he had encountered Lilith in the Black Stone throne in the end, he had not taken the initiative to raise the matter about the Nephilim, but Lilith herself had mentioned it. This way, Roy was not in such a passive position. Between demons, you taking the initiative to make a request was totally different from the other party taking the initiative to give it to you. Lilith had first proposed it, and the mission she gave Roy was to find the Red Sea Egg. There were still opportunities for trickery during this mission. But if Roy had taken the initiative to ask, Lilith might have had him go to the White City to assassinate the leaders of the Angels. In that case, the mission would have been even more difficult and far more dangerous. Fury threw something and ran away, making Roy very unhappy. But because Lilith's mission was there, he did not stay annoyed for too long. From the looks of it, Roy was still confident that he could complete the mission regarding the Red Sea Egg. So even if he could not obtain much useful information from Fury, he could make up for it from Lilith. Fortunately, Roy did not actually lose out. Not only did he reach a deal with the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse to borrow the power of all Four Horsemen, but because he had not exposed Envy's identity, he would also give Fury a huge blow. He would treat it as revenge in advance. Next, he would wait until Envy obtained the Talisman of Sin and came to find him. Chapter 194 Prisoner Roy and Julia did not wait too long. Envy came as promised. But when she appeared this time, her appearance had changed drastically. She was no longer in her Watcher disguise and instead looked like an ugly green-skinned, multi-armed monster. She had six arms, and they held different weapons, such as a broadsword, a gun, a staff, longsword, and so on. If Roy looked closely, he would find that these weapons were the weapons of the other seven deadly sins that Roy had killed. Her appearance had changed, and similar, Envy's power had changed tremendously. At least when she appeared in front of Roy and Julia, the magic power pressure emanating from her made Roy and Julia feel very uncomfortable. Since she looked like this, it was obvious that she had tricked Fury. Otherwise, how could she have taken back the talisman of sin from Fury? With all the powers of the seven deadly sins, has this fellow really reached the strength of a demon lord? Roy thought. When she saw Roy again, Envy laughed maniacally. She raised her gun-wielding arm, pointed the gun at Roy, and said hatefully damn demon, do you still remember how you treated me? What are you doing? Julia immediately drew her sword out of its sheath. Black flames burned all over her body, and she stared at Envy, unwilling to be outdone. But at this moment, Roy gently pushed her away, indicating that she should not be nervous. Then he looked at Envy with a teasing smile. Your strength suddenly increased, so you want to get back at me? How could Roy not understand this arrogant mentality of a petty person? He had expected this to happen from the beginning. Put away your damn smile. Envy continued to point her gun at Roy and shouted at him, When you pinched my head like you were pinching a dog, did you ever think that this day would come? Demon, I'm back now, and my strength can easily pinch you to death. Then shoot. 
Roy did not panic at all. Fire the bullet, and then we'll fight. Let's have a good battle. With Roy's words, creaking sounds came from nearby the castle. These sounds strung together like millions of biting rats, and then a large number of skeletons and zombies appeared. They held their worn-out weapons, and their hollow eyes stared at Envy. Seeing so many undead appear, Envy was a little surprised, but then she laughed. Do you think these rotten bones can stop me from killing you? No, but they can help me block you. As long as they can stop you for a few seconds, I'll have a way where both sides suffer losses. Roy placed his hand on Julia's shoulder. Even if you're rather powerful now, don't underestimate me. As long as I can severely injure you, I can watch you return to the Charred Council to go to your death. Although he said this, and his face did not reveal any flaws, Roy had already made up his mind. If Envy really dared to fall out with him and fight, then he would take Julia and leave here first with the teleport skill. As for saying that both sides would suffer losses, that was basically a lie. Roy was not stupid enough to fight a lord-level figure head-on. However, Roy's words stabbed Envy's sore spot. The reason why she had deliberately disguised herself as a watcher and hid beside Fury was that she wanted to seize the powers of the other seven deadly sins and then return to the Charred Council to take revenge. If she really fought with Roy, and both of them were injured, then the matter of revenge would be delayed for a long time. Thinking of this, Envy suppressed her anger and planned to let Roy off first. Anyway, this guy was only a high-ranked demon. When she finished her revenge, she could turn around and kill him at any time. Furthermore, this guy had made so many undead, so it seemed like he really wanted to go to the Charred Council to cause havoc. This was beneficial to her own revenge plan. With these thoughts, Envy lowered her gun and raised her chin. Okay, I'll let you go this time. After entering the Charred Council, you'd better stay as far away from me as possible. Otherwise, pray that I won't kill you while fighting. Roy grinned but did not say anything. He only stretched out his hand and gestured an invitation. Both sides were guarding against each other, but because each of them had more important matters to attend to, they still followed the original plan, and Envy opened the spatial channel to the Charred Council. Although Envy's body no longer looked like the Watcher, she had not actually changed her target of possession. This body was still the original body of the Watcher. But after her strength increased, Envy had reshaped this body to become more suitable for combat. She stood on the spot, and her magic power surged. Her hands glowed and stretched out in front of her. Then, as though she had caught something in the air, her hands suddenly pulled. With a slight buzz, a pitch black fissure appeared out of thin air and then Envy's hands gradually pulled open and enlarged it, finally forming a circular space gate. The Charred Council space has been modified. You don't need to go to a specific place to enter this space, and you only need the key to enter directly. The Council originally wanted to make it convenient for it to send troops and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, but now it's convenient for us. After Envy opened the spatial channel and took two steps back, she said coldly to Roy, You can enter now. Let your rotten bones go in first to explore the way. Roy did not waste any time. With a wave of his hand, the undead summoned by the liches rushed into the spatial channel first. When the undead army entered halfway, Roy signaled that it was time for Envy to go in. Envy snorted coldly. She did not say anything and entered the space gate. Roy did not follow in but commanded the undead and low-level demons to continue entering. Julia took advantage of this moment and whispered to Roy, You don't know how big the Charred Council's alternate space is, nor do you know where the Red Sea Egg is. After you enter, you might need a long time to find it, so be careful. Roy nodded. He could have asked Envy about the situation before going in, but seeing how this fellow was acting like a villain now, Roy did not bother to ask. Moreover, he had not planned to let Envy know what he was looking for when he went in. This fellow's mind was too complex, and she might mess up his plans, so he could not let her know. Julia would not follow Roy in. She would stay outside and wait for Roy. Roy did not know when the spatial channel would close, so he had left a way out. He left teleportation coordinates on Julia, just like he had on Fat Tiger. If anything went wrong, Roy could teleport back to Julia's side with the teleport skill. This way, without needing spatial channel, Roy could leave the alternate space and avoid the worst-case scenario of being caught in a trap. Roy was the last to enter. After going in, the liches and low-level demons had already spread out according to Roy's instructions to cause chaos in the Charred Council space, attracting the attention of the other party. After passing through the dark space gate, what Roy saw was a world full of flames. He did not expect that the Charred Council space would be so similar to the Abyss. The air here was full of the smell of smoke and sulfur, making Roy feel refreshed. 
but Troy was the last to enter, Envy, the undead, and the low-level demons were no longer near the space gate. Roy could not see them in his surroundings, but he could vaguely hear all kinds of explosions and roars in the distance. The Charred Council was indeed in chaos at this moment. The sudden betrayal of Envy, this mole, was completely unexpected for the Council. So many undead and demons were rushing into this space, spreading out and causing destruction everywhere, making the Council feel overwhelmed. But its reaction was not too slow, and it quickly sent the Council army to suppress them. However, with these undead and demons attracting attention, not only was it convenient for Roy to move, but even Envy was not obstructed in the slightest. From the beginning, she headed straight for the burial mound where the three counselors were. Yes, who knew what mysticism the three counselors of the Charred Council wanted to play, and they had created three fiery statues for themselves as their representatives. Even when communicating with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, they used these statues. It was unknown where their true bodies were hiding. Roy knew that it would not take long for Envy to fight the counselors, but he did not know how long Envy could fight for, so he had to speed up. Go. Roy waved his hand in the air, and instantly, a large group of demon eyes flapped their wings and flew in all directions, like little bats. During the flight, they gradually became invisible. Without too much information about the charred council space, Roy could only rely on himself to find the Red Sea Egg. After the demon eyes dispersed, Roy found a direction and flew forward. However, before he could go far, a scene appeared from a demon eye. After being stunned for a moment, Roy braked in the air and flew to another side. Not long after, Roy arrived in a canyon. There was a huge magma river flowing in this canyon, and at the middle of a mountain, Roy saw the scene from the demon eye. It was. A figure whose hands were hung up. At this moment, he was kneeling on the ground, motionless. A dark red hood covered his drooping head, and Roy could not see his face clearly, but the ferocious heavy armor with skulls on it that he was wearing showed his identity. War of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? He's actually imprisoned here by the Charred Council? Roy thought quickly. He folded his wings and landed on the platform where War was imprisoned. Chapter 195 Plant? Creature? Boom! When Roy landed on the ground and shook it slightly, War raised his head and looked at Roy. Under the shadow under the hood, the rune on War's forehead glowed faintly. When War saw that it was a powerful high-ranked demon in front of him, he could not help but narrow his eyes slightly and burst with a murderous aura. Demon? Why are you here? War asked in a low voice full of vigilance. Roy was also sizing up War. As the horseman of the apocalypse who represented War, he was a natural warrior. His body should have been brimming with an indomitable aura and unparalleled sharpness, but Roy could not see these things from him now. This was quite fantastical. When Roy first came to this world, he did everything possible to stay away from the descending War, fearing that he would lose his life in the hands of this powerful warrior if he were not careful. But now that they really met, War no longer had that domineering aura of killing. Roy knew that this was because the Charred Council had taken away War's power, and War was currently in a state of confusion. In the beginning, he had sensed the summons and responded to it to go to the human world. War had always thought that it was because the Seven Seals had been broken, but who knew that it was a grave mistake. After returning, he had not only lost his power but was also imprisoned here, and the Council had declared that it would punish him for his mistake. War knew that he was being framed. The starting of the end war between the angels and demons was a giant scheme, and he vaguely felt that someone in the shadows was targeting the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When his sister Fury received a mission from the council to capture the seven deadly sins in the human world, War had reminded her to be careful when she went. However, he did not know if Fury had returned, but a demon suddenly appeared in the charred council space. Roy squatted down and faced the kneeling War. He smiled. Let me introduce myself. My name is Osiris an abyss demon. Pleased to meet you, horsemen. War looked straight at Roy. I'm not pleased at all. Demon Osiris, are you here to kill me? Oh, no, please don't misunderstand. Roy shook his head. I just came to find something and happened to find you in prison here, so I came to take a look. I don't have any thoughts of being an assassin. Looking for something? What are you looking for here? War asked curiously. A high-ranked demon like you can be considered powerful but for the council, it can execute you at any time. What can make you take such a great risk to come here? The Red Sea Egg. Roy did not stand on ceremony and directly said it. It's indeed very risky, so I plan to leave as soon as I get it. Sir Horseman, maybe you can give me some direction? When War heard the name Red Sea Egg, his eyes narrowed, and he shook his head. 
I don't know this thing. You being like this is meaningless, Roy said. You're a warrior, not a liar, so you're not good at lying at all. From your expression just now, I realize that you definitely know where this thing is. So what? Do you think I'll tell you? War could not help sneering. War obviously knew what the Red Sea Egg was. It was the most important item that the Mad Queen Lilith had used when she created the Nephilim. When he heard this name, War immediately realized that the demon in front of him might have been sent by Lilith. Roy was not annoyed. He took out the image Crystal Fury gave him and input magic power to activate it. The next second, the crystal emitted a dazzling light and projected a light screen. In the light screen was a strange scene. There was a flower bud that looked like a huge egg. This huge egg was blood red, and twisted blood vessels and countless wrinkles covered its surface. It looked extremely ugly. The egg was on the ground, and numerous thick roots extended from the bottom and spread into the ground. In the scene, this huge flesh egg moved rhythmically like a heart. Not long after, this rhythm became faster and faster. Then, starting from the top, the egg split apart, looking like a flower blooming with several petals slowly opening. This scene felt slightly familiar to Roy. It looked just like the eggs in the Alien movie. When the tougher outer layer opened, a white semi-translucent sphere appeared. In the sphere, wrapped in a thin membrane, there was the shadow of a body curled up. Finally, the thin membrane of the sphere slowly cracked open. Along with a large amount of mucus and red amniotic fluid, the shadow inside was brought out. It was a female human whose body was already fully developed. As this human slowly opened her eyes, the image in the light screen came to a stop. WH where did you get this image crystal? War shouted at Roy in shock. Roy smiled slightly, unsurprised. In fact, Roy had seen this scene last night. Of course, he knew that the huge flesh egg in this scene was probably the red sea egg he was looking for, and this entire scene was actually the scene of the birth of a Nephilim. In particular, the female human who came out of the egg might be Fury herself. If he did not remember wrongly, Fury was a second generation Nephilim. This image crystal was probably the recording that Fury's siblings had taken to commemorate her birth, and they finally gave it to her to keep. Fury did not want to tell Roy too much about the Nephilim, so she could only throw this image crystal to Roy. As for what Roy could see from it, he had to rely on himself. War's shock came from this. He did not expect this demon, who broke in suddenly, to have this. Where did I get it? From your sister, Fury. Roy laughed. But you don't have to worry. She gave it to me on her own accord because I made a deal with her. I helped her hunt down the seven deadly sins, and she told me some things about the Nephilim. War first heaved a sigh of relief inwardly, but then he realized something was wrong and hurriedly asked. She didn't hunt down the seven deadly sins? Where is she now? Don't worry, Sir Horseman. Roy shook his finger. In comparison, I feel that you should be more concerned about your own situation. Even if I tell you about Fury's situation, can you go and find her in your current imprisoned state? War was speechless. He could not help but look at his hanging arms. Yes, I can't even protect myself now. Do you want me to release you? Roy asked while pulling the chains. No. If you release me, my charge of betrayal will become real. War shook his head. Roy smiled. As expected of War, the horseman who is known for being the most loyal to honor and dignity. Knowing that you might be framed, you're still willing to accept the punishment of imprisonment. Get lost. War suddenly flew into a rage and roared at Roy, I don't need a demon like you to humiliate me in front of me. However, Roy's expression turned serious. Have you thought about it? The person who framed you might not be a demon or an angel, but the council itself. Nonsense. How is that possible? War was stunned for a moment before roaring at Roy, I'm a horseman of the council. Why did the council frame me? Pooh. Roy spat to the side. The icy saliva hit the hot ground and immediately made a sizzling sound before slowly melting. Roy then asked, why is it impossible for the council to frame you? Roy stretched out his finger and poked War's chest. Think about it carefully. With your personality, and on your body, what do you have that can be made use of? War was stunned. He lowered his head and pondered, not speaking for a long time. After a while, War raised his head and asked Roy, Why are you telling me this? Because I made another deal with Fury, and I obtained a chance to summon the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I don't want you to be tied up here when I need to summon you in the future. Roy stretched lazily. Of course, it would be even better if you're willing to tell me where the Red Sea Egg is. War stared at Roy for a long time, and Roy looked at him calmly. Finally, War lowered his head again and whispered, Southeast, 
the ruins. Thank you. Roy nodded, stood up, spread his wings, and flew away without hesitation. War raised his head to look at Roy's departing figure and could not help but narrow his eyes. Roy followed War's guidance and quickly flew southeast. Showing the image crystal to War was just a way to win his trust. What Roy told War afterward was to plant a seed in his heart. With the seven seals not completely destroyed, the matter of War being summoned was indeed full of doubts. While War was imprisoned, it was impossible not to think about this, but he did not think about the council that he was loyal to. It felt hard to see what was right under your nose, but Roy's appearance woke him up. Although Roy could guess what Samael and Lilith were scheming, and what the charred council had done in the middle, he could not make it too clear because he could not explain how a high-ranked demon like him obtained this information. So he could only go over it simply. After making the deal with Fury, the four horsemen of the apocalypse were no longer a threat to him but potential allies. After all, Death and Fury of the four horsemen were investigating the truth of corruption power and they needed the help of Roy, a demon who knew about void power. Since they were potential allies, Roy naturally had to help War. He had to point him in the right direction so that he could discover the truth about him being framed earlier, and in turn, War would then trust him more. This way, when Roy truly needed to summon the four horsemen of the apocalypse in the future, perhaps they would be happier when responding to the summons. Right? Roy flew quickly, and it did not take long before he found the ruins War mentioned. Instead of ruins, it was more like an ancient battlefield. Roy could see countless bones. These bones were scattered over dozens of square kilometers on the ground. At first glance, he felt endless shock. With these bones were numerous damaged and rusted armor, swords, and war equipment. This place was actually a battlefield left over after a battle between angels and demons. In the center of the battlefield in the distance, Roy saw what he was looking for, the Red Sea Egg. Compared to the red sea egg he saw on the image crystal, the one Roy found looked quite small. The flesh on the surface of the egg looked dry and shriveled, and the roots rooted in the ground were much more withered. Roy understood a little about why it was said that Lilith used the mingled dust of angels and demons to make the Nephilim. Isn't this the case right now? Is this huge flesh egg with plant characteristics grown by absorbing the nutrients from angel and demon corpses that seeped into the ground through the roots? Perhaps this is the key to fusing angel and demon bloodlines? While thinking, Roy landed in front of the Red Sea Egg. But what was strange was that as soon as Roy approached, he could feel the same magic power aura as Lilith's on this huge egg damn it, this thing isn't really Lilith's placenta, right? Roy thought with a strange expression. Red Sea Egg, Red Sea Egg. Isn't Lilith known as the Red Sea Queen in some legends? Chapter 196 Failed Products and Guards Roy did not rashly touch the Red Sea Egg and merely observed it from nearby. This was the Red Sea Egg, an important item for the creation of Nephilim. Since the Charred Council had the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse kill their compatriots with their own hands when it recruited the Four Horsemen, it meant that it was wary of the Nephilim. However, the Council had not stored the Red Sea Egg on its own but placed it on an ancient battlefield instead. What did this mean? It meant that the Charred Council seemed to want to use the Red Sea Egg to do something. Thinking of this, Roy could not help but curse silently. This charred council was really acting one way in public and another in private. It seemed to be maintaining the balance under the banner of the Creator but secretly had unclear ambitions. Although he had found his mission item, Roy did not relax. Instead, he became more vigilant. The council must have placed the Red Sea Egg here to attempt something, but now, the egg looked withered. It was probably because the council's experiments had failed. It could not control the Red Sea Egg and could not achieve what it wanted. However, after its failure, not only did it not seal the egg, but it left it here. Was the council too careless, or did it think that no one could take the Red Sea egg from here? If it was the former, then it was fine. But if it was the latter, then there might be guards dedicated to protecting the Red Sea egg. Roy looked at the endless corpses and bones around him. Even though he had seen many corpses, the ancient battlefield in front of him still made him feel a slight chill down his spine. He felt that if there were any guards here, they might be hiding under these bones and corpses, or maybe even be these corpses. Although Roy's demon blood could create liches, it was actually due to the characteristics of his bloodline. It was not true necromancy. If the angels and demon corpses on this battlefield really became undead and stood up, Roy would immediately fall into the sea of an undead army and be unable to escape. Therefore, the question was, how should he take away this Red Sea Egg? Roy knew that Envy killing her way into the council and his undead army and low-level demons used for distraction might be able to buy him time, 
but this time would not be too long. He had to make a decision as soon as possible. Regardless, since Roy wanted to take the Red Sea egg, he might alarm the guards, but he did not have any means to dig the Red Sea egg quietly, so he could only use force. The Red Sea egg was huge. Even though it looked a little withered now, it was still as tall as a three-story building. Roy could not hug it with both hands, so he could only make a large number of chains through the system and weave them into a net. Then, starting from the bottom of the Red Sea egg, he bound it in the chains firmly. After all of this was prepared, Roy spread his wings and flew into the sky. He came to the top of the Red Sea egg, grabbed the chain that looked like a bag, and began to exert his strength to pull out the Red Sea egg. Although Roy's strength was not high, after becoming a high rank, his strength had exceeded 150. When he began to exert force, the Red Sea egg below made creaking sounds, and the soil, which was burying the roots and had not moved for a long time, was immediately churned up. Roy pulled the Red Sea egg up a distance, but then, no matter how hard he tried, the egg did not move much. Roy knew that it would be troublesome now. He did not know how long the Red Sea egg had been left in this ancient battlefield, but since it had plant characteristics, it would spare no effort to find ways to absorb nutrients. If the nutrients nearby were sucked dry, the roots would spread farther away. Roy suspected that the roots of the Red Sea egg had probably covered the entire ancient battlefield. Fuck, it's a radius of a few kilometers. How much strength is needed to pull out such a large network of roots? The trouble did not stop here. After this big carrot was pulled out some distance, the Red Sea egg, which had entered a dormant state due to the depletion of nutrients, gradually woke up. It seemed to sense that it was being pulled out of the ground, so it began to shake and resist, increasing the resistance on Roy's hands. This damn thing. Roy clenched his teeth and continued to exert force. The muscles on his arms bulged as he competed with the Red Sea egg. But after a while, Roy found that it was impossible to do this, so he gritted his teeth, let go with one hand, and summoned Frostmourne from the system's space. With a violent swing, an arc-shaped ice blade slashed at the rhizome of the Red Sea Egg. Roy did not want to do this at first because he knew that it could hurt the Red Sea Egg, even though cutting off the roots would help him pull it out. If the egg died because of this, what would he do if Lilith refused to accept it? Furthermore, Roy might also use this Red Sea Egg. Therefore, he had to think of a way to ensure its survival. The roots of the Red Sea Egg were unexpectedly tough. This sharp ice blade only cut halfway into the root that it hit. After being injured, the root sprayed out a large amount of purple liquid, which looked like demon blood, from the wound. At the same time, the Red Sea Egg struggled even more crazily. This thing was not conscious at all, it was only survival instinct. The damage to its roots was equivalent to threatening its life, so it began to think of ways to fight back. Its bud began to bulge, and a high-frequency sound that ordinary people could not hear instantly spread throughout the ancient battlefield. The next moment, rumbling sounds came from the ground in the distance. The soil stirred, and pale skeleton arms stretched out from the ground. These arms supported themselves on the ground and dragged their bodies out of the ground. Roy's guess was right. There were indeed guards placed here, but it was not what Roy thought. It was not an undead army of countless angels and demons but hundreds of strangely shaped skeletons. These strange skeletons were very large, and each of them was at least 5 to 6 meters tall. But the strange thing was that some of these tall skeletons had four legs, some had four arms, and some had two skulls. There were also demon horns on some skulls and densely packed, sharp long fangs. Roy did not know what these skeletons looked like when they were alive, but judging from their appearances, they were probably some strange creatures. However, there was something in common. Behind these skeletons were a pair of bare wing bones. These wing bones were not symmetrical, and Roy could easily distinguish them. One side was the wing bones of demon wings, and the other was the wing bones of angel wings. Very easy to recognize. Needless to say, Roy immediately understood what these skeletons were. It was very likely they were half-demon half-angel creatures created by the Charred Council after leaving the Red Sea Egg in the ancient battlefield. However, looking at the strange appearances of these skeletons, Roy realized that they were probably just failed products. The Council could not create beings like the Nephilim. After all, it was not Lilith, and it probably knew little about how to use the Red Sea Egg. When the Council discovered that the function of the Red Sea Egg was not as useful as it had imagined, it just abandoned the egg and the failures here. However, these failed creatures born from the Red Sea Egg eventually became guards of the egg because, to them, the Red Sea Egg was their mother. When their mother encountered danger, they would help their mother solve the threat. After climbing out of the ground, 
these strange skeletons picked up the damaged and rusted weapons on the battlefield and rushed toward the Red Sea Egg. Roy initially thought that even though they looked strange, a group of bones should not pose much of a threat. But what Roy did not expect was that a longsword flying at him from afar was moving so fast that it broke the sound barrier, making an explosive whistling sound. When it flew past Roy's face, it actually created sparks on his cold winter armor's helmet. Fuck. These skeletons are so strong? Roy was surprised, but he understood what was going on. Damn it. Regardless of whether they're failed products or not, these skeletons are all creatures born from fusing the bloodlines of angels and demons. How is it possible to treat them like ordinary human skeleton soldiers? It was not only just their strength. When they were about to approach, some skeletons even flew toward Roy. The bare wing bones on their backs did not look like they could fly, but they were flying because these skeletons had powerful magic power auras. They were magical undead creatures similar to skeleton mages. Some skeletons stopped on the ground, and their magic power rumbled. Some spat huge pillars of fire at Roy from in the air, while others shot dark corrosive arrows at Roy. And what was even more ridiculous was that some skeletons actually condensed golden swords of holy light that came piercing down at Roy's head. Did you dare to believe that skeletons could use holy light? These skeletons could not be judged by common sense at all. Roy was in a dilemma and beginning to become flustered. He had no choice but to give up competing with the Red Sea Egg for now and free up his hands to focus on dealing with these strange undead skeletons. Chapter 197 One of the Counselors These strange undead skeletons, let's call them strange undead for now. There were quite a number of strange undead, and when the first batch of undead climbed out of the ground and attacked Roy, there were still skeletons climbing out from farther and farther behind. However, after exchanging blows, Roy quickly discovered that these strange undead were not all strong. Their strengths were uneven, and the stronger ones could reach the level of high-ranked demons, but the weaker ones were only about the same as low-ranked demons. This difference in strength seemed to reflect mainly in the age of their bones. The bones that looked fresh were stronger, while the decayed and older ones were weaker. This caused Roy to realize that the magic power of these strange undead seemed to come from their bones. This made Roy feel very puzzled. In his impression, a creature with magic power should derive it from their flesh and blood body. Just like Roy, his current source of magic power was his demon heart, so he had always thought that flesh and blood were the vessels that carried magic power. But why could these undead skeletons with only bones preserve their original magic power in their bones? Is it because these undead were special when they were alive, or is this a characteristic originating from the Red Sea Egg? Roy used Ice Block, placing himself in the extremely thick ice shield, and allowed these numerous undead to attack him because he found that only the undead with the strength of high-ranked demons and undead who knew how to use the power of Holy Light could cause him some damage. The other undead were not much of a threat, despite there being a lot of them. Many of them were old, and even if Roy did not make a move, they might break their legs during the exercise. Under the protection of Ice Block, Roy only needed to maintain his magic power output, which allowed him to observe the situation of these undead. With this observation, Roy immediately discovered the situation of the magic power of these undead gradually declining as they continuously used magic to attack him. Now, Roy finally understood. It seemed like the magic power of these undead could only be regarded as some kind of magic power deposit phenomenon. In other words, they might have had relatively powerful magic power when they were alive, but after their deaths, this magic power was only stored in their corpses and was one-time use. After losing their flesh and blood bodies, the magic power of the undead could not be replenished, and it would be gone once completely used. Up. Roy initially thought that these fellows guarding the Red Sea Egg would be stronger, so he had made a more cautious plan. But after seeing this situation, Roy finally felt relieved and immediately began to fight back. Black Frost began to sweep through, and all the undead attacking Roy immediately froze. They fell from the air, breaking into bone fragments when they hit the ground and the range of Roy's cold aura was expanding with his magic power output. He planned to end this quickly, getting rid of these undead as soon as possible before leaving with the Red Sea Egg. After all, anything could happen if he took too long. Let us rewind the time a little. Just as Roy was trying to pull out the Red Sea Egg, hundreds of kilometers away, a battle was taking place where the Charred Council's three councillor statues were. Envy came back, and her goal was very clear. Once she entered this space, she went straight for the statues. After coming here, she immediately launched an attack on the statues of the counselors. All kinds of attacks bombarded the statues, causing them to fly all over, and at the same time, her violent laughter of revenge filled this area. 
Come out, you rotten people who only know how to hide in tombstones. Envy held a long sword in one hand and slashed a sword beam at a statue. The gun in another hand kept firing bullets at another statue. She knew very well that these three statues were actually substitutes for the counselors of the Charred Council. These magically constructed statues connected to the true bodies of the counselors, allowing them to communicate with each other and observe images. And the true bodies of the counselors were buried under these statues, where they truly lived, which was why Envy called them tombstones. In fact, during the tens of thousands of years of being imprisoned, Envy had not actually seen the true bodies of the three counselors. She only knew that they were in the endless lava under these statues, but she could not determine their exact location, so she could only attack these statues first in order to force the counselors out. Facing Envy's curses and attacks, the counselors responded to her with several extremely large exploding fireballs. However, when the fireballs came, Envy dodged them agilely and continued to attack them. Come out! You guys who only know how to hide and watch others secretly. Don't think I don't know what you're up to. Envy roared as she attacked. Not only did you deceive everyone in the name of the Creator, but you also wanted to steal the authority of the Creator and become gods. Do you think you can hide your ambitions from everyone? Shut up! The statue on the left angrily launched another fireball at Envy while roaring, with the mere strength of a demon lord, do you think you can do whatever you want here? So what? Even if I'm not strong enough, do you dare to appear? Envy laughed. Now, numerous enemies have poured into the Charred Council. As long as I restrain you here, they can destroy this world. You call those inferior undead and demons enemies? How absurd! The Council's army will soon destroy them, and you will be the same. The statue in the middle said angrily. But as soon as he finished speaking, he suddenly seemed to realize something. A moment later, the statue in the middle suddenly roared, Damn it! Someone actually wants to take the Red Sea Egg away. Who is it? The statue on the right said in a gloomy tone, There's no need to ask. It must be Envy colluding with that slut Lilith to steal the Red Sea Egg. Stop them! We must stop them! The statue on the left roared. Envy had not reacted at first, but after finally figuring it out, she could not help but burst out laughing. She thought that the one who touched the Red Sea Egg was definitely Demon Osiris, who had entered with her. His goal here was probably the Red Sea Egg, but... The counselors of the Charred Council seemed to think that it was Lilith. Therefore, Envy did not expose him at all. She only attacked the statues with all her might, pretending to want to restrain them. The three counselors were very angry at this moment. They could not go because of this audacious fellow Envy, but they could not lose the Red Sea Egg either. In particular, it could not fall into Lilith's hands again. We have to stop it. But who is going to go? The statue on the left emitted a silent ripple and communicated with the other two. Should we have war go? He's the only horseman here now. Said the statue on the right. No, if we have him go, we'll have to return his power to him. This will ruin our original plan. Objected the statue in the middle. Forget it. Since that won't work, I'll go. Said the statue on the left. The other two statues remained silent, seeming to have tacitly agreed. The ground suddenly began to shake. The magma below the statues began to surge continuously, and the ground on the platform where Envy was standing was trembling. She stared at the magma lake below in panic, feeling shocked in her heart. Although her original goal was to force the counselors out and see who these people hiding behind the scenes were, she still felt extremely terrified when a counselor was really about to appear. Although she was now at the demon lord level, she knew very well that this bit of power was not enough against the counselors. They could suppress heaven and hell at the same time and could also make the four horsemen of the apocalypse work for them. The hidden power of the charred council was not something she could withstand. As the magma surged, a winged at first appeared and then slowly rose. Finally, a six-winged angel wrapped in wings appeared. With a whoosh, the angel spread his huge wings and showed his body in front of Envy. WH what? Envy's voice trembled. She pointed at the six-winged angel and screamed in horror, You! You're an incarnation of Raphael? Chapter 198 Incarnation Envy never imagined that the first counselor of the Charred Council to reveal his true body would be Raphael, one of the Archangels. Of course, this person in front of her should be an incarnation of Raphael. She could tell from his strength. After all, according to legend, if the true body of Raphael appeared, then he should be Holy Flames, a seraph with six wings like light. Although Envy saw that his wings were golden, the feather patterns on them were clearly visible. He should only be at the level of a throne or cherub. 
The reason why she could tell at a glance that the other party was an incarnation of Raphael was because of the patterns on the other party's golden battle robe. According to legend, Raphael was the guardian of the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden, so the patterns on his battle robe were emerald-colored tree-shaped patterns. But like when Roy encountered Gabriel, Raphael's appearance was unclear, and his head was hidden in the hood of his battle robe. When Raphael's incarnation emerged from the magma, he floated in the air and looked at Envy below. With a wave of his hand, an incomparably strong golden light flew out. Although Envy reacted quickly enough and immediately dodged, one of her arms was still severed by this holy light. Envy screamed as she held her armless shoulder. She knelt on the ground, looked at Raphael in the sky, and then at the other two statues that were still burning with flames. Damn it! The charred council adheres to the Trinity and is organized according to the method of human, God, and demon. Since Raphael is representing God, then who are representing demon and human? Envy's mind quickly thought. At this moment, the statue on the right said, hurry up and go. This clown won't last long. You don't need to worry about her. Indeed, Envy had charged into the charred council space and caused an uproar, truly catching the charred council off guard. But Envy being able to attack so presumptuously just now was actually because the councillors had not truly appeared. These statues representing them could transmit some magic power, but it was very limited, so it was naturally impossible to suppress Envy just by relying on the statues. Now that Raphael, one of the councillors, suddenly appeared, Envy was in serious trouble. Hearing this, Raphael turned around without a word and flew toward where the Red Sea Egg was. But just as Raphael turned around and flew away, Envy's sharp eyes that were always on him caught sight of some black mist permeating at the roots of Raphael's wings. Seeing this, Envy could not help but be stunned. This black mist was very similar to the scene when angels were falling and transforming. But when Envy thought about it carefully, she found that it did not seem like it. The black mist exuded a taste of madness, and it appeared to be different from pure dark power. Envy could not help but recall Roy's words about void power and immediately thought, could Raphael have been corrupted by void power? Thinking of this, Envy could not help but look at the other two statues. Since Raphael has been corrupted, what about the other two counselors? While Envy was still thinking, a spatial fluctuation suddenly came from behind her, and Fury's figure emerged. Bastard! How dare you deceive me! Fury saw Envy the moment she came in and immediately cursed. You damned fellow, how dare you knock me out and snatch my thing? Fury was really furious at this moment. On the way, the watcher who Envy pretended to be was respectful to her and served her very well, making Fury never doubt Envy. But who would have thought that Envy would actually betray Fury at the last moment and suddenly attack her from behind, knocking her out and snatching the talisman of sin? After Fury woke up, she realized that she had been deceived. So she hurried back to the charred council space to find Envy. Before Envy could respond to Fury's anger, they heard a voice from the statue behind them. Good timing, Fury. Take down this insolent fellow immediately. But the counselor did not expect the ill-tempered Fury would directly vent her anger on it. She roared, shut up. Weren't you the ones that sent this guy to my side? Also, during this period of time, when I was investigating corruption power, I was frequently obstructed. Don't say that this has nothing to do with you. Finally, Fury could not help but point at the statues with the whip in her hand. What are you hiding? This isn't something you should be asking. The statue on the right was also angry. You're just a horseman obeying the council. Who gave you the courage to speak to us like this? Ha ha ha. Hearing this, Envy could not help but laugh again while covering her severed arm. See, horseman? These guys are just using you Nephilim, treating you four horsemen as dogs. You are only pawns of the council. You know nothing about their ambitions. Damn it. Shut up. Fury truly flew into a rage out of humiliation. She held her whip and rushed at Envy. I'll kill you first, you treacherous villain who attacks behind the back. In the blink of an eye, Envy started fighting with Fury. In the ruins of the ancient battlefield, Roy had spent some time and almost finished with these strange undead. After punching the last frozen undead into countless fragments, the battlefield finally quieted down. Although the Red Sea Egg was still beating and emitting invisible sound waves, no other undead responded to the summoning and crawled out from the ground. Roy finally had a chance to catch his breath. In fact, he had consumed a lot of magic power in the battle, but after killing these undead, he did not receive any souls in return. It could not be helped. These undead had died many years ago, and there was nothing on them. Even any wisps of souls had long dissipated. This was why many demons hated undead so much and were unwilling to fight them. 
They had no harvest after paying. It was tantamount to wasting energy in vain. Roy finally scattered this grievance on the Red Sea egg. He took out Frostmourne and ruthlessly cut the roots of the Red Sea egg. Even though the severed roots were waving and spraying purple blood, as though they were screaming and struggling, Roy remained unmoved. He gritted his teeth and continued slashing hard. The Red Sea egg probably had hundreds of roots. As Roy cut them off one by one, the egg looked more and more dispirited. In fact, Roy was a little worried, afraid that the Red Sea egg would die after he cut off all the roots. But after thinking about it, it was likely impossible. Otherwise, how did the Charred Council transplant the Red Sea egg into this space? Roy estimated that after losing its roots, the Red Sea egg would fall into a dormant state. Since this thing had plant characteristics, it might even turn into a seed, and it would recover after being transplanted and taking root. In fact, in the beginning, Roy had tried to put the Red Sea egg into the system space and take it away directly, but then he found that it did not work at all. The root system of this thing was too large, and it probably exceeded the storage size of the system. Since he could not store it, Roy could only use the stupid method of cutting off the roots to take it away. The severed roots on the ground had already begun to wither, turning into strips of unknown black matter. He had immediately entered after Envy opened the spatial channel. But with this delay, Roy guessed that the spatial channel might have already closed. If he wanted to leave later, he could only teleport directly to the teleportation coordinates set on Julia. Although this space had been encrypted, Roy's teleport skill had one advantage he could ignore this encryption because he was teleporting out of this encrypted space. Finally, under Roy's efforts, all the flesh roots were cut off. After losing the last root, the Red Sea egg seemed to realize something. The rhythmic beating instantly stopped, and it gradually began to shrink. This was not an illusion. The Red Sea egg was indeed shrinking, and it seemed to be turning back into a seed. While Roy was waiting for it to shrink, Roy suddenly felt something and looked into the distance. In his radiation perception, the radiation coming from that direction was suddenly becoming much stronger, making Roy realize that some powerful enemy was probably approaching. The council is aware of the situation here, so it sent someone to stop it? Then who is it? War of the Four Horsemen? Roy's expression was solemn. No matter what, the radiation coming from the front looked very powerful, so he had to take away the Red Sea Egg as soon as possible. He placed his hand on the egg and tried to put it into the system space again, but he found that it still did not work. He looked at the state of the egg and found that it was only around 5 meters tall, so Roy simply grabbed the outer skin of the Red Sea Egg tightly and planned to use the teleport skill directly to teleport out with it out. However, just as he was about to activate Teleportal, a strong beam of light came at him. Chapter 199 Roy Killed In Roy's radiation perception, this sudden beam of light was terrifying. It burst with powerful radiation fluctuations and frequencies, full of destructive power. The speed of the light beam was so fast that it was too late for Roy to teleport away. He could only subconsciously activate Ice Block again, condensing a thick layer of ice around his body as protection. Boom! When the ice finished condensing, the light beam hit the ground not far away from Roy. Instantly, the formidable holy light power contained and it erupted. Roy and the Red Sea Egg, which had lost its roots, were blown away in a flash, blasted thousands of meters away by the shock wave. The physical impact was secondary. The power of holy light in it was the most fatal. While melting Roy's ice crystal defense, it also penetrated the ice and landed directly on Roy's body. Roy roared in pain, feeling as though his entire body was melting. This was under the effect of the Cold Winter Armor's damage reduction. Without the Cold Winter Armor blocking a portion of the damage, Roy did not doubt that he would have been burned to ashes the moment he came into contact with this powerful holy light. Under the dual effects of the huge impact and pain, even demons would faint, but Roy endured it and maintained his consciousness. He knew that once he passed out, it would be over. The enemy he had not seen would kill him when he was unconscious. Cough. Cough. Roy drilled out from the soil as green smoke emitted from his body. He felt excruciating pain, so he quickly removed the cold winter armor and checked his body. It melted. It really melted. Roy saw that the skin all over his body was sticking to his muscles in a gooey state and dripping bit by bit. In the system interface, Roy saw the appearance of the severely injured state for the first time. Roy could not let the completely rotten skin continue to remain, so he gritted his teeth, used his palm to wrap around his other arm and gently swiped it downward. The next moment, the extremely fragile skin goo was brushed down like snot. The muscles in his arm were now interweaving red and black. The holy light impact not only melted his skin, 
but even his body cells received varying degrees of damage. Although it was really weird to say, Roy truly pushed off all the skin on his body. At this moment, he looked abnormally terrifying, and flesh, blood, and tendons covered his entire body. Fortunately, after removing the skin, his powerful recovery began to take effect, and the skin on his body began to grow at a slow rate. Roy looked back and found that only charred wing bones remained of the wings on his back. It was the first time that Roy had been beaten so miserably. The holy light attack was stronger than the army magic that the six blood angels had used together. This made Roy realize that the charred council had probably sent him a strong and terrifying opponent. Roy looked up and saw a six winged angel with golden wings slowly landing in front of him. When Roy saw the six wings, his heart skipped a beat. He did not know why, but he suddenly thought of the scene when Gabriel appeared in Van Helsing World. Although the six winged angel was not as radiant as Gabriel at that time, it still gave Roy the same feeling. W. Who are you? Roy could not help asking, his voice hoarse. My name is Raphael. Raphael replied, but then he looked around and asked, Strange. Why are you only a high rank demon? Where is Lilith? In fact, in the beginning, Raphael was too far away and did not see Roy clearly. He only saw Roy's demon wings and thought that it was Lilith, so in order to stop her, he used 80% of his power to attack from afar. Naturally, he used this power with Lilith as an imaginary enemy. But he did not expect that when he approached, he could not find Lilith. Instead, a high rank demon covered in blood was here. Ra Raphael? Archangel Raphael? Roy gasped in shock. Humanity had the names of many famous angels of heaven, but not many demons truly knew the names of the other side. Only archangels like Gabriel and Michael were well known to the entire demon world. The same logic applied to angels. Only a few demon kings were widely passed on. And this Raphael in front of him was one of the seven archangels and a name widely known among the demons, so how could Roy not know? Roy's heart went cold. When he was still a low-rank demon, Gabriel's appearance had already cast a serious psychological shadow on Roy. Now, another one appeared? The alarm in Roy's heart kept ringing frantically, reminding him to run quickly. And Roy did exactly that. After reacting, he asked Raphael, Why are you here? While secretly activating the teleport skill. But what Roy did not expect was that Raphael noticed the spatial fluctuations when he tried to activate teleport. Thus, Raphael did not answer Roy's question. He stretched out his hand, clenched his gloved fingers, and instantly sealed the space around Roy. When Roy heard the skill activation failed system prompt, he did not know what expression to make. Damn it, what should I do? Roy's brain was spinning quickly. In fact, he had already guessed that Raphael was probably one of the counselors of the Charred Council. However, he did not expect that the council would send a counselor to stop him from stealing the Red Sea Egg. They had clearly abandoned this thing here, so why was an abandoned item still making them go so far? Fuck, I still fell for Lilith's trick. This mission is far more dangerous than I expected. Let me ask you again. Where's Lilith? Raphael asked coldly. Roy's desire to survive surged out wildly, and his brain turned quickly before he laughed sinisterly. He was thinking about using his ultimate move the art of speech escape, to see if he could fool Raphael. But before he could say anything, Raphael suddenly said coldly, No, Lilith didn't come. Demon, you are just a pawn of hers. With that, Raphael opened his hand, and an angelic sword burning with blazing flames appeared in it. Without giving Roy any chance at all, Raphael slashed horizontally with his angelic sword. It was so fast that only a flash was visible, and Raphael cut Roy in half at the waist. Roy's expression froze as he felt his body separate. Fuck. Really killed? Although Roy had guessed that he might really be killed by an angel one day, he did not expect this day would come so abruptly, and it was even Archangel Raphael who did it. Even though the current Raphael was only one of his incarnations, his strength far surpassed Roy's because his incarnation in this world was on the same level as a demon king like Samael. Roy's two halves collapsed and sprayed out purple and green demon blood. He felt his blood flowing out and his life disappearing. Can I go back? Can my soul escape back? These were the only thoughts in Roy's mind at this time. Even if I can't return to the Abyss, I can still return to the Abyss outpost. But will Raphael give me this opportunity? The answer naturally was that it was impossible. Although Roy was not a threat to Raphael, how could he let go of the opportunity to eliminate a high rank demon completely? Therefore, Raphael only waited silently by the side waiting for Roy's body to die thoroughly and his soul to be exposed. 
he planned to purify this demon soul without mercy at that time. Of course, Roy had noticed his intentions, so he was frantically searching for a solution in the system. He opened the system interface, planned to create a talisman, and then give it the definition of invincible. However, as his consciousness gradually blurred, Roy did not even have the strength to draw. Just as Roy felt that he was really going to die this time, a tremor suddenly came from beneath him. The next second, a big, hideous, petal-shaped mouth appeared from under the ground. After rushing out of the ground, it directly devoured Roy's two halves. This big petal-like mouth was actually the red sea egg that was blown away earlier. The toughness of this red sea egg could be said to be beyond imagination. Even Raphael's powerful attack had not damaged it at all. Raphael looked at the red sea egg that suddenly emerged in astonishment. But his astonishment only lasted for a moment before he understood. He saw that the roots of the red sea egg had been cut off, and he knew that the egg was returning to the seed state. But after Raphael cut Roy in half, the red sea egg smelled the scent of flesh and soul, so it could not wait to drill out and absorb nutrients. This works too. Using this demon's body and soul as nourishment, the red sea egg might be able to be replanted. Raphael muttered to himself while looking at the red sea egg. When he saw the red sea egg wriggling and a few roots drilling into the ground, he had no interest in waiting any longer. In his opinion, this demon was certainly dead, and his soul and flesh would be absorbed by the red sea egg. Since Lilith had not appeared, he did not need to waste any more time here. He spread his wings and flew back the way he came. However, what he did not know was that after he left, something unexpected happened in the Red Sea Egg. Chapter 200 Legacy of the Creator What was the Red Sea Egg? This question had never been answered. Although it was once thought to be the Mad Queen Lilith's embryo for breeding special species, no one knew whether Lilith had created the Red Sea Egg. The only certainty was that Lilith held the Red Sea Egg when it first appeared. Ever since angels and demons discovered this world and started fighting in it, both sides had suffered heavy losses due to the war. In order to deal with this prolonged war, heaven developed and created artificial angels, and these artificial angels had effectively made up for the lack of troops on heaven's side. After the artificial angels appeared, the demons naturally had to think of ways to expand the army. Therefore, the Mad Queen Lilith took over this matter. After some time, the Nephilim were born in her hands. As soon as the Nephilim appeared, they immediately became the third largest race after angels and demons. In fact, it was not wrong to think of them as first-generation humans. In the beginning, the Nephilim stood on the demon side because of their mother, Lilith. Their bloodthirsty and warlike nature was exactly the same as that of demons, and they relied on their powerful strength to help the demons make the angels suffer defeat after defeat. However, as time passed, the Nephilim found that not only were they stronger than angels but also the demons who created them. Gradually, the Nephilim began to have thoughts of leaving the demons' control. Due to there being very few Nephilim, the race was actually very united, and they quickly reached an agreement. In a war, the Nephilim rebelled collectively. They killed all the demons in the barrier troops, snatched the Red Sea Egg, and escaped to a separate alternate space, intending to live and multiply there. But this move made them stand opposite the angels and demons at the same time. Angels valued their bloodlines more than demons, and they hated hybrid bloodlines of angel and demon like the Nephilim. And demons had very complicated feelings for the Nephilim. There was worship for the strong in strength, anger about the tainted demon bloodline, and hatred for the betrayal. Thus, in the end, the Nephilim became a race cursed by angels and demons. The demons wanted to regain the Red Sea Egg more than once, and the angels wanted to destroy the Red Sea Egg. But as an important tool for the birth of the Nephilim, the Red Sea Egg was always heavily guarded by them. Of course, it was extremely dangerous to place the key to the survival of the race on an object, so the Nephilim were also seeking a new way of reproducing, and they did indeed find one later. This was why there were two distinctions between the first and second generations of the Nephilim. The first generation of Nephilim was born from the Red Sea Egg without exception, and they were also the strongest. The second generation of Nephilim was mostly born through natural means, and they were weaker than the first generation. Due to the appearance of special creations like the Nephilim, thousands of races knew Lilith's name and had always regarded her as the mother of the Nephilim. With the passage of time, the Charred Council recruited the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Of course, the Charred Council also realized that it was absolutely impossible to recruit the entire race of Nephilim. Apart from the uncontrollable nature of the Nephilim, they were also worried that recruiting the entire race would attract the combined attack of the angels and demons. In fact, 
There was probably a lot of hidden information about the four horsemen of the apocalypse slaughtering their own people and becoming subordinates of the council. In any case, only the four horsemen of the apocalypse remained of the Nephilim race in the end, so the council naturally took the Red Sea egg that gave birth to the Nephilim. The Charred Council also had their own ambitions. The strength of the four horsemen of the apocalypse alone was insufficient, so they also wanted a powerful army to suppress the angels and demons. And the Red Sea egg naturally became the best way for them to create that army. However, reality proved that if you did not know how to operate the Red Sea egg, it was impossible to create a powerful and balanced race that could reproduce, such as Lilith had. The Charred Council's experiments with the Red Sea egg lasted for more than a thousand years, but all of them failed without exception. The creatures created were either deformed, had no intelligence, or were special individuals that did not possess the ability to reproduce. This made the Council realize that Lilith might have used some unknown special method when she created the Nephilim, and this method was something that they could not find out at all. Among the four horsemen of the apocalypse, only Death, the only surviving first-generation Nephilim, knew little, but he absolutely could not tell the Council. Therefore, afterward, the Charred Council regretted having the Nephilim killed too quickly, and their patience gradually disappeared. Finally, they thought of a way throw the Red Sea egg onto the remains of a battlefield of angels and demons, let it produce naturally, and see if it was possible to encounter good luck. Of course, this kind of gambling had no good results. Logically speaking, after such a long time, the Charred Council should have long since not paid attention to the Red Sea Egg. Roy's success rate of stealing the Red Sea Egg should have been very high, but why did the Charred Council make such a big fuss and have a counselor directly take action after discovering something abnormal with the egg? Even when Envy had hit their statues, they still did not show up. This was actually because after obtaining the Red Sea Egg, the Charred Council had spared no effort in collecting information about it. And from this information, they discovered an incredible truth. This truth was that Mad Queen Lilith might only be the first owner of the Red Sea Egg but not the creator. The time when the Red Sea Egg first appeared could almost be traced back to when the Abyss had just appeared. What did this mean? It meant that the Red Sea Egg was very likely a legacy of the creator. It was a legendary relic of the creator. The Charred Council started under the name of the creator, so how could they not take this seriously? After thinking about the characteristics of the Red Sea Egg, the Charred Council even suspected that the Red Sea Egg was probably what the Creator had used to create the angel and demon races. Although this suspicion did not have concrete evidence, it also made the Charred Council attach great importance to it. They placed the Red Sea Egg on the battlefield because they could not use the egg, but this did not mean that the Council wanted to lose it. This was the real reason why Raphael's incarnation had immediately rushed to the scene to stop Roy's theft. Since Roy had cut off all the roots, the Red Sea Egg could not obtain nutrients through the roots, so it had already been shrinking into a seed and preparing to become dormant. However, when Roy was slashed in half by Raphael, and demon blood sprayed onto the ground, the Red Sea Egg immediately sensed it. Instinctively, the Red Sea Egg was unwilling to enter a state of dormancy. It had plant characteristics, so it would produce stress responses to changes in the environment. On this battlefield, it had not absorbed any fresh flesh and blood nutrients for a long time, so its main body rushed out to devour Roy's body the moment he fell to the ground, intending to absorb nutrients to remove its dormant state and take root again. Under normal circumstances, the Red Sea Egg would absorb nutrients with its roots. But now that the roots were cut off, it could only eat in another way, which was to devour like a man-eating flower. Raphael was aware of this situation and thought that Roy was dead, so he left. But what he did not know was that after the Red Sea Egg swallowed Roy into the butt and planned to digest Roy's body to replenish its nutrients. Just as the inside of the Red Sea Egg was gradually secreting its digestive juice, it felt an inexplicable aura coming from Roy's body. Instantly, the digestive juice of the Red Sea Egg stopped secreting, and the secreted acid quickly disappeared and turned into a new, warm liquid. Thus, Roy's body was soaking in this warm liquid and unexpectedly underwent accelerated recovery and regeneration. His skin melted by the holy light rapidly grew at a speed visible to the naked eye, gradually covering Roy's tendons and bones. However, because Roy's body was cut into two by Raphael, after being swallowed by the Red Sea Egg, the two halves of his body did not gather together, so the wound where he was severed could not join together. As a result, a strange phenomenon quickly appeared. As time went on, new lower limbs gradually grew from the waist of Roy's upper body, and the lower half of his body gradually grew a new upper half. In other words, two identical demon Roys were gradually taking shape. Such changes could not be seen from the outside, 
but as the liquid secreted, the red sea egg was becoming weaker and weaker, as though secreting this powerful healing liquid was rapidly consuming its remaining energy. And perhaps this treatment process would end completely. As the red sea egg was shrinking smaller and smaller, Roy, who was in a coma, suddenly produced a ball of light in his bomb. It was. A soul. When Roy lost consciousness, the system used a soul that Roy had stored in its space to save the situation. Not only could the Red Sea Egg absorb flesh and blood as nutrients, but it could also absorb soul energy as nutrients. After all, the creatures it created required souls. Where did these souls come from? Weren't they absorbed by the Red Sea Egg? The moment the soul appeared, it quickly turned into light spots and disappeared, absorbed by the inner wall of the Red Sea Egg, which immediately revived it. Then continuous soul balls were released from Roy's palm and then absorbed one by one by the Red Sea Egg. Not only did the egg stop shrinking, but it gradually became energetic, and the healing liquid inside secreted more and more, 